I was adopted by an American couple, but I was born in Mexico. I never really felt a connection to either side, though. We never celebrated or participated in any of my Mexican heritage, nor did I feel welcomed into the American ideals. I grew up in a small, conservative town in Kentucky, and was basically an outcast because I was essentially a foreigner to them. I was kind of a loner, no friends, cordial relationship with my parents. But I was content. I had a home, food, and comforts here and there. Yet, I had so many questions about my family history that I knew couldn't be answered, as my parents didn't really have much information to offer. I was found abandoned on the footsteps of some church in Jalisco. But there was this yearning to find my biological family, or at least some semblance of my family history. So, for my birthday, I asked for one of those kits. I can still remember our conversation. Sweetie, are you sure about this? My mother asked. Yeah, we just don't want you coming in with unrealistic expectations. My father interjected. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I remember replying. No matter what, though, you guys are my parents. And my actual family. I don't have any expectations, honestly. If I think my biological family is not what I was looking for, I'll just move on. I need this. Please. I pleaded. God, I was so dumb. Eventually, my little spiel got into their heads, and further encouragement from my therapist solidified my parents' agreement. I got the kit itself sometime during February. It was nothing special. The instructions just said to spit into the vial and ship it out, and I would get my results in a couple of weeks. I remember the wait for my results. I tried to hide my excitements, but every night I would imagine this scenario where I would end up related to someone really cool and famous or something like that. Every night I would check my email in the hopes that it would come in early. Then, one morning, I awoke to see the message. Congratulations. Your reports are ready for viewing. If you have any questions, call us at the number provided. I quickly logged on the website to see my profile. There was a global map with the highlighted countries where you had possible ancestry. In my case, every country was highlighted. I had such a small ancestry from every possible location on the map, but there was a chunk with 20% that was left untraced. As interesting as that part was, I was more interested in the relatives section. I've heard of people finding up to hundreds of different relatives, even if they were far removed. But upon clicking the relative's selection, all I got was the message, No relatives available. You can imagine my disappointment. I spent the entire day pretty disheartened, and my family tried to cheer me up that day. But it felt like there was a piece of me that questioned if I was going to be truly alone in this world. I'm not disparaging my parents or anything, but at the time, I believed that blood meant something. That Saturday, I finally decided to put all that aside and go out to dinner with my parents. We went to a cute little diner and just sat there talking about the next steps. Sweetie, I got into contact with a private investigator. His name is Jason, and I forgot his last name, but... It was something Russian, my mother insisted. How do you forget his last name already? My father interjected. Is that the point, Richard? My mother replied. Wait, you guys would really do that? Isn't that kind of expensive? I asked. Nick, sweetie, don't worry about the cost. I just want you to stay focused on your grades, and we'll make sure to find your parents or any relatives. I already gave all the information to the P.I., and he said he would get into contact with us soon. Wait, how do we know he didn't take the money and run? My father questioned. Because he didn't charge us, just yet. Besides, I looked through his reviews and asked around, and he got glowing recommendations. I felt like a spy meeting him. My mother giggled as she held up a glass of wine and sipped it. 
The rest of the nights went by smoothly, and we called it a night once my mom was a little tipsy. As we passed red light after red light, I couldn't help but notice this black SUV trail us on the way back. Ordinarily, it wouldn't have caught my eye, but once we made our fifth turn, it did raise my eyebrow. But right as we pulled into our driveway, it drove past our house. We lived on the outskirts of town, and our road was another way in and out of the town, so I chalked it up to a mere coincidence. Although our part of the town was more secluded, it wasn't all that uncommon for cars to pass by. That morning, after we went about our usual Sunday and went to Mass, as usual, the priest ranted about another problem plaguing our world, and it would have been another usual Mass service, but I noticed that we received new people into our congregation. A very old, shriveled-up man in an elegant tan suit sat right next to a pretty blonde in a gorgeous sundress at the very last pew. They made the rest of us seem like we were beggars dressed in rags. The man had a strange tattoo on his neck, which wouldn't have been visible, but the collar of his shirt was slightly open, exposing it even more. At the end of the Mass, my parents wanted to go up and introduce ourselves, but when we turned around, they were gone. That's kind of weird, my dad pointed out. Maybe they're just shy. If we see them next week, we could invite them over for dinner or something, my mother insisted, before going off to speak to the other members of the congregation. We were there for a while, and eventually I got bored, so I went to go wait in the car. As I sat in my dad's car, I couldn't help but notice that same couple sitting in the same black SUV that trailed us the night before. Or, at least, I thought it was the same car. Right as I was about to take a closer look, my car door swung open. Sweetie, could you hold this bag? I went to the shop across the street and got a bag of bagels, and they're quite warm. My mother said hastily while giving me the brown paper bag. I turned around to take another look, but they were already pulling out and going down the street. That night, I stayed up pretty late doing some last-minute project when I remembered that I was supposed to take out the trash bin out to the curb. The garbage truck was going to pass by in the morning, and so I put on my shoes and quickly went outside to put it out. Our house was surrounded by trees with a single road coming up to our driveway. As obstructive as the trees were, I could still get a glimpse of the main road and the faint outline of that same black SUV. It was just parked facing us. As I began to get closer, its headlights turned on and they drove off. I wanted to tell my parents, but it was three in the morning, and I didn't feel like waking them for something I had no evidence of. Besides, I didn't think they would have been able to do anything. God, I wish I had. The next day, I went to school and went about my day. By third period, I was in the middle of a test when there was a knock on the classroom door. The principal stood there, with a dean talking on his walkie-talkie. He motioned for the teacher to step outside with him, and the dean came in, hushing us to be silent. Focus on your exams, he said quietly, looking down at his shoes while avoiding contact with anyone. Nicholas Johnson? The teacher asked loudly. I could feel every eye on me as I looked over at both of them. Could you come out here for a second? She asked in a weird tone. I started to get up, feeling awkward that everyone had suddenly remembered my existence. Oh, and bring your stuff with you. She quickly added. I stepped outside with my things and started to follow the principal and the teacher herself, our footsteps echoing through the quietness of the hallway. We stepped inside of the cold office where a brunette woman in a black blazer was sitting. They motioned for her to take a seat while they all sat down. There's no easy way for us to say this, but there was a house fire at your home this morning, the woman spoke. Unfortunately, there were no survivors. Both your parents have passed away. I'm sorry. And with that sentence, I felt the world stop.
It was as if everything had gone silent before coming down and crushing me. I am truly sorry, the woman said, while everyone else in the room stood quiet. Is there anyone we could call? I shook my head. Uh, my uncle Bernard is the only one, but we haven't seen him in years. I don't know his number either. I didn't add that I also didn't really want to see him, considering the last time we saw him, he was off on a drug binge. He was a former veteran that resorted to unsavory medications. The woman nodded before handing me a tissue. Here, wipe your tears away and we'll figure this out, okay? I just nodded and took the tissue. I didn't even realize my eyes were teary. So, what do I do now? Where am I going to stay? I asked. Because you still haven't turned 18, you will be placed in a group home temporarily. That's actually where I will be taking you as of today. Once we get there, we will discuss all the details and get into contact with your parents' attorney. Is that okay? No, it absolutely wasn't okay that my parents were dead and now my house was burned down, but I merely nodded. She discussed a few more details, and the teacher, along with the principal, escorted me out and into her Prius. After a couple of hours, we ended up in an ugly, gray facility. It seemed more like a prison, to be honest. There were big, steel gates blocking the front road. This seems a little extra for a group home, I said, looking around to see if there was anything around. It looked like it was even more secluded than our town. Come to think of it, our town was small, but it wasn't that small where we had to drive hours away for a group home. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe, and your parents' attorney will probably be inside, she reassured me. Wait, did my parents even have an attorney? I asked. A court-appointed social worker will be arriving soon, she said, pulling up to the gate, which automatically opened. It was as if they were already waiting for us. Once we stepped inside, I realized the place looked strange. It actually did look like a prison. There was a front desk and several men in security uniforms walking around. A woman emerged from a nearby door, holding some kind of hospital gown out for me to take. Here, you will change into these in that room over there. There will be a basket where you can put your personal possessions into and come out when you're ready, she said in a hurry. I went into the room to change. It was rather small, no bigger than one of a store's dressing room, and there was a small metal bin where I put my clothes and my bag. I put my phone into the side of my boxer briefs, though. There was no way I was going to put it in the bin. The gown was baggy enough to hide it. I'm no social worker, but there was something too strange about this. I stepped out of the dressing room, and before I knew it, the guards came out to the sides, grabbing onto my arms. I tried to fight them off, but the woman pulled a syringe and stuck it in my neck. After that, I blacked out. I woke up in a tiny, empty space, like a psych ward. I was in a straight jacket, and the room was all padded up. Where the hell was I? And what the hell was going on? I tried to wiggle and feel my phone but I realized that it must have been taken by them. Hey, let me go. I don't know who the hell you are, but I have rights. Let me out of here. I yelled out, trying to bang on the door. Hey, can you shut up? A muffled voice yelled out. Who's there? I yelled out. I'm next door, so you can't see me, but there's a vent on the ceiling that carries your voice. They spoke. It sounded like a male, but I wasn't too sure. Why are we here? I asked. Oh. Oh? I asked. Are you new? N new? N new to what? What's your name? He asked. Uh, uh, Nick. Uh, Nicholas Johnson. Oh, that's a new name. Never heard of a Nick. What kind of person has never heard of Nick? That's the most basic name there is. 
My official name is Test Subject 1830, but you can call me Jack. Test Subject? What do you mean, Test Subject? What is this? This is a collective facility. I'm not too sure about all the details, but they track and gather anyone with uh, special DNA. Special? Yeah, uh, so you know how there were different types of human species, uh, like Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and that last one, which uh, I never learned the name of, uh, something like Denovan, uh, small humans? Barely. Didn't they go extinct, like, thousands of years ago? Nah, uh, sort of. They disappeared, but there's still traces of them in our DNA. Well, depends on the population. Anyway, uh, there was another species of human known as the Anunnaki. Uh, they weren't anything special, and uh, they went extinct as well. Okay, so what does that have to do with me? Well, so the standard DNA is made up of four sugars. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. These combinations make up our genes. But the Anunnaki had another sugar molecule, or something like that, called ambromine. Ambromine? Yeah, it's undetectable unless you know what to look for. The general public doesn't even know about it. Only the Collective has information about it, and they keep it very tight-lipped. So, how do you know about it? I've lived here all my life. Well, most of it. I think I was born somewhere in the Philippines. I barely have any memory of that place, though. Every time they harvest from me, I forget more and more. What do you mean, harvest? Harvest? They need to extract some of our bone marrow and utilize the cells or something like that. I'm not sure. Harold always gets fuzzy with the explanations. Sometimes I feel like he tries to confuse me. Or maybe he's confused himself. Harold? Yeah, Dr. Rigo. He's the guy in charge of the extractions. I've known him since I was little. How old are you? Not sure. Uh, I asked Harold once, and he said something between the age of 18 to 20. So, when do we get out? Or when does this end? Uh, it doesn't. What do you mean? But before he could finish his sentence, my door swung open, and a couple of security guards burst in. Once again, I tried to fight back, but they stuck me with whatever it was that was knocking me out. When I woke up, this time I was lying in a hospital bed with several residents. Whatever it was they were giving me was making me weaker and weaker. I looked around and saw that I wasn't alone. There was a giant light on top of me, like those of a dentist's office. The room was dark, but I could make out a large glass mirror with several people standing behind it. One of them was that same pretty blonde woman who I saw at the mass service. There were several others standing around with her, including the man who came to the service with her, only he was now several years younger. At first, I thought he was related, but when I squinted my eyes, I saw he had that same tattoo. I'm still not sure how that was possible. They all seemed flawless, like they carried this eternal glow to them. Pretty weird thoughts, but even though I was tied down, I still had eyes. It wasn't necessarily a nice type of attractive, but rather artificial, like that of a porcelain doll. Every feature was completely smooth, and they all had a neutral yet sinister expression. Their faces looked wrong somehow. It was as if something had combined the world's most beautiful people and pasted them onto a mannequin. I felt the bed tilt forward to the point where I was straight up, facing the glass window. I heard footsteps come near me, and I heard the movement of surgical tools. Don't panic. It'll only be a second. You're just going to feel a tiny pinch, whispered a husky voice. Please don't, I begged. I tried to push against the restraints, but I couldn't even move a finger. I'm assuming you're probably trying to move. I can see it on the heart monitor. But don't worry, the nerve blocker will prevent you from hurting yourself. And once again, I passed out and woke up in a completely sterile room. I laid in another hospital bed, surrounded by other hospital beds, but I could only hear the beep of my ventilator. 
I looked around and saw a wrapped-up body lying on the bed across the room. I got up slowly, and my back started feeling like it was on fire, but I pushed through with every step. Once I reached the bed, I saw a clipboard on top of the table next to it. Subject, 1830. Status, deceased. Cause of death, aplastic anemia. Oh, Jack. I wanted to pull back the cover to see what he looked like. This man who spent all his life locked away, being harvested for some unknown reason. They didn't even have the decency to give him a name. Subject 1830. I really wanted to pull the cover. I swear I did. But I just didn't have it in me. I started to hear voices coming from the door at the end of the room, and I quickly went back to my bed. I closed my eyes, but moved my head to face the door. And with a beep, the doors automatically opened. Sir, we have to finish the extraction for Subject 1830, and prepare the crematory. A woman's voice spoke. I could hear the clacking of the typing of a laptop. What a waste. It's such a shame. He had the highest concentration of ambromine, and he was the longest lasting as well. The others never fared as well as he did. How long did he last? His file says he lasted over 18 years in this facility. The woman replied. He used to be obsessed with that beanstalk story. Let's hope the new one doesn't take long to acclimate to his environment. We can't have the mental stress affecting his health. Our superiors are overestimating the production of ambromine. Those imbeciles keep signing contracts with superficial cosmetic companies and don't bother researching alternatives. I tried to look over to see, but I was afraid to make a sudden move. So, I merely opened my eyes a tiny squint, looking over to see a red-headed, overweight man standing next to a skinny, short nurse. That must be Dr. Rigo. The same one Jack said was the head of extractions. I tried to keep my eyes closed, and right as Dr. Rigo walked over to me, alarms started blaring through the building. Great. Follow the emergency protocols. Dr. Rigo pulled out a syringe from behind his back, and the nurse tried to rush forward, but I panicked, and I grabbed a panhandle and hit him in the face, causing him to drop the syringe. He stumbled back and grabbed his head, while the nurse lunged forward to grab the syringe. But I shoved her before she could grab it and jammed it into the doctor's chest. The nurse went to the side and kept pushing a button near the side of the bed, as if she was calling for more staff. But the alarms were too loud for anyone to hear anything, so I punched her in the head, and I fell forward. My vision was turning dark, and I could see the doors open, and two men rushed in. I thought one of them looked familiar when I heard my name being called out. Nick. Hey, buddy. I'm right here, said one of the men. I wanted to say something back, but my eyelids felt way too heavy for me to even see, much less speak. I woke up in the back of some sort of vehicle with a bunch of other men around me. Seven, to be exact. I was beyond freaked out, but when I reached over, I realized that I knew some of them from photos of Uncle Bernard and his army buddies. Sleeping beauty's awake, replied the man sitting on my left. I think his name was Zane Mullins. His blonde hair and sad blue eyes made him stand out in the picture with my uncle. He was the only one I really recognized. I looked over at the passenger seat to see my uncle Bernard leaning over to me. You all right, kid? He asked, his voice carrying through the air like a soft thread. With those four simple words, I broke down, sobbing. I tried to open my mouth to say something, but I couldn't stop shaking and was gasping with every breath, just crying. I didn't understand anything that just happened. I felt a hand pat at my shoulder in an attempt to comfort me. Let it out, kid. You did fine, Bernard's voice said in a slight whisper. After a couple of hours, we finally arrived at a rundown motel in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't even sure what state we were in anymore, but I knew we were nowhere near Kentucky. 
They gave me some actual clothes to change out of the hospital gown, which was practically exposing all of me. The room itself was nothing special, but it was packed with diagrams, maps, and weapons lying all over the bed and the spare table. What is all this? I asked. This was us planning to get you out of that place. What was that place? We don't really know, my uncle asked, while glancing over at Zane. So, what do you know? Zane moved an already open file that was on the table and shuffled some photos before passing it over to me. Unrecognizable black charred debris laid in a large pile. It was my house, or whatever was left of it. Are my parents really dead? I asked, hoping to hear that maybe, like me, they were safe in a motel somewhere. My uncle nodded, sadly. I talked to one of the firemen that responded to the scene. He said that he found the remains of both your parents. The coroner said they were both dead before the fire. Can't we go to the cops? No. The fireman and the coroner were both found dead a couple days later, Zane spoke up. The only reason I heard about the fire was because some private investigator named Jason Kosofsky reached out to me with pertaining information regarding your whereabouts. He stumbled upon something strange, and when he didn't hear back from your parents, he put two and two together, and somehow found me. What do you mean, something strange? I asked. All the men pulled up a chair and took a seat at the table while my uncle motioned me to sit across. The P.I. worked as a former detective before he retired, somewhere in New York City. In one of his cases, a kid was kidnapped in broad daylight. The neighbors reported that there were black vans and men in suits patrolling the neighborhood a couple of days before the disappearance. He obtained footage of the kidnapping, and when he tried to bring it forward to his superiors, he was shut down, and the footage was erased. The kid's family was later found dead due to carbon monoxide poisoning. He thinks something spooked his superiors so much that they covered it up. He paused before glancing over at Zane, then over at me. A week before the kid disappeared, he took a DNA test. He was also adopted. I felt a twinge of sadness and anger, but mostly guilt. Did I get my parents killed? Was I the cause of this? We don't want you to start blaming yourself. It's natural to feel curious about where you came from. Sane spoke up. I guess he could read the expression on my face. Yeah, it's not your fault. Another one of his friends, whose name I haven't learned yet, spoke up. My uncle gave me a weak smile before looking back at the papers in front of us. So, where do I come in? I asked quietly. After the P.I. heard about the fire, he quickly combed over all the surveillance footage from nearby locations and found these. He pulled out a couple of photos, and upon closer inspection, it was the same old man and woman in the sundress that was at the mass service, and at my extraction, or harvesting, whatever it was. I looked over at my uncle, allowing him to continue. He gave them over to another guy that ran them through some fancy computer software, but he didn't find just their identities, but a whole bunch. What do you mean? Like various different identities and aliases that span through different time periods. It doesn't make sense, but somehow they might be older than they look. We all thought it was maybe some weird resemblance or related, but when we looked closer to their identities... We realized it was all fake. Nothing to them. Just cardboard cutouts of what a person's supposed to be. Their current identities are Francine and Thomas Winston. On paper, they seem well-rounded, a bunch of fancy education and charities, but when we verified them, nothing came up. I know it didn't make sense to them, but I wanted to wait a bit before I told them my side of the story. Somehow... They just came to be and used their money to form a biotech startup. Zane shook his head before gulping down a glass of water. Nothing about this makes sense. 
I think I can put another piece to the puzzle. I started off before elaborating with the rest of my story. The men sat there in silence, just looking at the floor but listening to every word I was saying. By the end, we sat there in silence, dwelling on the overload of information we all had learned. If what he's saying is true, they're probably using that DNA to track down individuals with whatever this thing is and using it to rejuvenate themselves. My uncle said, I don't understand any of it. Science doesn't make any sense here. Another one of the men spoke up. Regardless of the science, one thing is for sure. They have enough money and power to hunt us down eventually. You saw their facility. It was bad enough we lost a couple of men during our rescue mission, but that was nothing. The hard part is staying off the grid, until we can figure out our next steps. They lost men. How many people have already died because of me? I simply wanted to take a DNA test and explore my background. I spent the rest of the night thinking and thinking. My uncle and his friends are better off without me. Hell, my uncle was sober, and I'm not sure if Zane and he are a thing, but I can't bear being responsible for their deaths as well. I couldn't vent to them because they did so much for me, and somehow I stumbled upon this forum. I just wanted to vent here. I'm not sure what to do. I guess I just wanted someone to hear my story before we go off the grid. Maybe I should just hand myself over. This is the story of an American who wrote these lines shortly before his death. He gave them to his daughter, and she posted them on some occult websites. This is where I found them. The happenings of this report probably took place in the year 1976. I drove my truck for more than 40 years through the Rocky Mountains, delivering goods, making my money. Never had there been any troubles on my journeys, other than one or two breakdowns, but the story that I want to get off my chest at this moment, at the eve of my life, happened exactly as I am about to write it down, about 30 years ago, I swear. When my mind will soon find its final peace, I will at least not be able to hear the laughter of the people who read this. It is probably best to start from the very beginning. My life as a trucker might have been a lonely one from time to time, but I could always count on my colleagues. In silent moments, their voices gave me company in my isolated driver cab over the radio. Never would I have even remotely been able to dream up the unsettling situation I would experience. It was the summer of 1976. The month, however, I am not sure about any more. Maybe June. The journey had led me and my loyal truck over Olive Ridge, at the rims of the National Park, and I gazed upon a crystal clear lake that sparkled down below the road at the foot of a grassy hill. I still remember the cloudless sapphire sky filling me with a feeling of comfort and carefreeness, the rhythmic sound of my truck's engine that had been my sole constant companion for the past years felt soothing, almost hypnotic. The leather seats that had over time adapted itself to the shape of my back gave me comfort and peace. Perhaps it gave me too much peace, for I noticed the man jumping onto the road in front of me almost too late. My reflexes allowed me to hit the brake just in time, stopping the truck so that the old vehicle came to a screeching halt only a few steps away from the madman. I must have gotten out of the driver's cab and started marching towards him, because nowadays I only remember standing right in front of the man, ready to rip him a new one. When I stood there, I suddenly noticed something metallic. That lunatic had a gun. Angrily, I stopped all movement and took a closer look at the man. The guy had to be in his late thirties, had blonde, disheveled hair, a crazy look in his eyes, and torn clothes. You, over there, stay still, exactly where you are, he demanded with a croaky voice. I made my peace with God, assuming the lunatic would shoot me, just to get a hold of my truck. Silently, I cursed myself for my stupidity, why hadn't I stayed inside the cab, where it would have been a little safer? After all, 
Everybody knew that people at the roadside never meant good news. Calm down, men. I must have tried to talk to the madman. You... you're not him, I thought. The guy stuttered, perplexed. What's your name? What do you want from me? If you want to kill me, just do it already. I tried to distract him. My name... I... My name is Stanley. Or Stan. I had a breakdown. Must have gone too fast. Too hectic. He introduced himself, pointing behind his back with his free hand. Only now, I noticed the old jeep having been run against one of those many trees at the hillside. Apparently, by a confused Stan. That calmed me down a bit. Perhaps he was content with hitching a ride. Where to? I therefore asked. Just onward. Just onward. Stanley whispered and looked up and down the road, apparently searching for someone. Suddenly, he took down his weapon and started crying, shaking. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just not myself anymore. Please, take me with you. Please, I beg you. I'll give you all my money, everything I have, everything you want. Please, I beg of you, if I were to stay. Confused, I took a closer look at the poor sod and started thinking about knocking him out cold. However, the strange, deep fear in Stanley's eyes made me hesitate. Additionally, some extra money was always a nice thing, especially in my line of work. Are you on the run from the cops? I wanted to know, skeptically. Helping a wanted man was not my cup of tea, after all. Stanley only let out a sad snort. The police? No. I'd have been happy to meet a sheriff or a deputy around here. Maybe they could help me. No, don't worry. But I need to leave. Now. He shouted, agitatedly, whilst flailing around the gun. All right, all right, get in, get in. I hastily said. It'd be easier to knock him out as an emergency measure when he was sitting right next to me. That is why I let him climb onto the passenger seat. With a grumpy mumble, I took my place behind the wheel. Please, I'm sorry, but my life is at stake here. Stanley stuttered apologetically after some minutes of unpleasant silence. Hmm, I said. What's your name? He wanted to know, probably to calm the situation down a bit. Bert, I said. Well, Bert, I'm so sorry for my behavior, but I'm just terrified. He might get me. Stanley explained and looked down at the ground, terrified. He, he, don't be so vague. I barked at him. You would never believe me, Stanley said. I've heard my share of crazy stuff. One of my colleagues tells me of his Bigfoot sightings at least once a week. Your story can't be more unbearable. I informed him, nodding my head towards the radio. My tale is so crazy. Even I wouldn't believe it, had I not just lived through it. Stanley admitted with a gulp. Then hurry up. And tell me, I said, silently getting a bit excited. I'd always liked a good story, and that way this poor guy wouldn't accidentally shoot me in the head. So be it. It all started three days ago. Everything. Three days ago, when my life was still normal and boring. I never would have guessed saying this one day, but I miss my bleak job as a desk worker at my little box. Well, it was about midday, and I took a walk during my break time as I did every day. You know, I've met many people that think of Salt Lake City's skyline as something that closes you in. But for me... It has always been home, a place of safety. I lived my whole life there, and never having known anything else. Poor guy, I remarked. How could one ignore the call of this huge world? 
at the call to adventure. I know myself that I am just a simple man from the city, one amongst a million others. My life was great until that moment. I walked unhurriedly through downtown, enjoying my break. It had been a hard day, many things to calculate, many things to organize. I strolled through the streets, seeing all the other people minding their own business, passing by each other. Then, it happened. A car crash, right next to me on the main street. An old van hit a school bus. Did the driver maybe have a stroke? Anyway, you might understand the shock I was in. The bang, the smoke. And I don't know why, but moments later, the bus was ablaze. Horrible. All those people, all those children, just... Stanley stopped and looked into the void, trembling. Everyone would be shocked. That still doesn't explain your behavior, I remarked, but I couldn't wait for him to go on. No, no, of course not. If it had only been that, the shock would have been easier to cope with. Everything burning, ablaze... The children, the people around, confused and horrified. Madness and misery, horror and anguish, and, and then I spotted him. He was standing on the other side of the street and observing the gruesome happenings, completely unmoved by the screams and the smell of burning flesh and melting metal. This man, he stood there just stood there, expressionless, letting his gaze trail over the parts of the bus that were disappearing in flames. His dark gray pinstripe suit did not have a single mote of ash on it, and his shoes shimmered dark in the light of the midday sun, sinister and alien. His skin was pale and strangely coarse, his white hand gripping an old suitcase. That thing looked hideously out of place and out of time, a bit like him. Why was he just standing there? Was he admiring the chaos? Was he in shock as well? It felt more and more strange, him just standing there. I could not get a look at his face due to the smoke, and today I wished it had stayed that way. I, I can't describe this grimace. I just can't. My throat won't let the words out. And when I looked at the man, I suddenly felt his icy gaze resting on me from those eyes. I don't know why I fled, but I only came to my senses back at my office, back in my box. That's all? A face? A man? Perhaps he fought in a war and got disfigured. Surely you can't just... I tried to argue. Stanley, however, was quick to silence me. His face was not damaged. No. It was something different. It was... I just can't. After I'd calmed down a bit and had some tea, my thoughts kept wandering back to that accident. Why had the bus exploded? It had just gotten hit. Had anyone survived? <laughs> Suddenly, I felt a chill run down my spine. Images of the unspeakable grimace appeared before my inner eye. Images of that disturbing man who had stood there so coldly, who had icily gazed at the disaster. And then, his gaze shifted to me. His look had found me. I still felt his stare. Despite having left the place of the accident behind, I could still feel him looking at me. Despite the peace that I had found there in my box, despite the peace that the tea had given, the gaze was still there. It still rested on me, as if the man was still looking at me, watching me, dissecting me with his eyes. Why did I still feel it? That look. You were traumatized. An accident like that can really throw you off. But that's still... I began again. But Stanley cut me off. No. The bad thing is... I stood up, wanting to look out the window and look at the mountains in the distance. My eyes fell on the streets, almost accidentally. 
And there he stood, there on the sidewalk, and he looked up at me. What did he want there? What did he want from me? Stanley ran his hands through his hair, completely distraught. How was I supposed to get out of this building? Surely I couldn't go through the main entrance and not past him. My mind was racing. It was late, so the side entrance was probably already locked. But I had to try. I had to escape from him, from that despicable man. So I hurried down the stairs, down all those concrete steps. I couldn't take the elevator, after all. What if he was waiting right in front of it? I would have been trapped. I ran down the stairs, down and down. I was lucky the side door was unlocked, and so I squeezed through, into the alley behind the building. I must have been drenched in sweats, but I didn't care. After a quick breather, I made my way home. It was five blocks to my little apartment. Carefully, I approached the end of the alley, fearing that he might be lurking there. I was lucky he wasn't, and I started to head home. Man, this is insane. Why were you so scared? Maybe he was traumatized too and just wanted to... I grumbled, but was cut off again. No, no, he was not normal. He was... When I was on the street, a few feet away from the entrance of the alley, already feeling safe, that's when I saw him. He was leaning out of the alley behind me, looking at me and giving me that abysmal grin. But how had he gotten there? I don't know. I... I ran home. Wow, that sounds a little freaky. But why didn't you call the police? I... I don't know. I was so confused. Maybe I should have, but maybe he would have noticed the cops, too. Would have chased them, too, if they had confronted him. I don't know. But I don't think they could have done anything against him. He seemed so different. So otherworldly. Hmm. I would have tried anyway. That might have been better. But somehow I was afraid of harming others. Says the guy who pulled a gun on me. I laughed bitterly. Stanley blushed. You have to believe me. I just had to make sure to keep going. I don't want him to catch up to me. I would never have hurt you. He then stammered. Catch up? Do you think he's still stalking you? I know he is. It was the next day, the day after the accident, and the dead people. I already hadn't slept well that night and had some terrible dreams and kept seeing that man's eyes in my mind. Thus, I woke up drenched in sweat. Nonetheless, the feeling that he was looking at me loomed over me. I got dressed and headed for the bathroom. As I approached the door, I felt queasy. I was afraid that he was standing there, waiting there for me to... Wow, you really got a smack on the head. Why would he... He was there. Uh, what? I looked at him in disbelief. His sunken eyes were full of panic, and his dirty hair made him look very sick. But his voice seemed to speak the truth. I approached the door, felt his presence, his eyes, his gaze. Slowly, I advanced towards it. Finally, I tore open the door. He was standing there, in front of the mirror, in the middle of the bathroom, motionless. But I knew he would not remain frozen. I rushed out of the room, driven by terror and instinct, ran into the underground garage, to my car, and guess what? There he was. He wiped his forehead, ready to burst into tears again. And then? I asked, not believing what I heard. I did not feel well. Stanley apparently had lost his mind due to the accident, probably had gotten a concussion. Who knew what he was capable of doing at the moment? What do you think? I ran away, out of the building, onto the street, and he was standing there as well. How did he get there? How? I had to flee. Flee from this 
thing away into safety. I stole a car and drove, drove away, just away. I had been going the whole night long, and again and again I saw him in the rearview mirror, driving a dark car, following me, chasing me. Every time I managed to shake him off, I must have momentarily nodded off due to the exhaustion that hit the tree. Then you found me, and I had to take that chance. I had to. I had to go on. What if he had caught up to me? I looked at the shaking Stanley in disbelief. Seriously? Yes, of course. Do you think I'm kidding around? Fortunately, I had the gun inside my car. He whispered. I said nothing and looked at the tank meter. We would not get far with the diesel we had left. On the next occasion, I steered my truck down a side road towards one of the many service stations located in the mountains. What the hell are you doing? Stanley stuttered, having turned even more pale. We can't stop. He'll catch up to us. Yeah, well, if the tanks completely run dry in a few miles, we'll be even more screwed. And stop with this man. You're under shock and stress. I shouted at him. We had reached the station, and I got out of the truck to refill the tank. Just as I was about to take the fueling hose, a horrid scream pierced the air, shaking me to my core. It was Stanley's voice. The poor man had finally gone crazy, and with terror, I heard the roaring of my old truck's engine. Seconds after, the vehicle was speeding past me, leaving me behind in a cloud of dust. The guy had screwed me over telling tall tales, or he'd been madder than I'd thought in the beginning. It didn't matter, for I had neither the promised money nor the truck. I cursed again. How could I have been so stupid? Why had I let him into my truck in the first place, with this laughable story? Why did I... Moments later, I heard the sound of another car zooming past me, and my heart almost stopped. Behind the wheel of the black hearse sat a being so hideous that I could not even have dreamt it up in my worst nightmares. A man, pale as a corpse, wearing a dark gray pinstripe suit and a big black top hat. His inhuman face burned itself into my brain, despite me having seen it only for a few moments. The eyes seemed big, lidless, and slit-shaped. His wide, grinning mouth opening ran from one ear to the other. That smile looked like a part of hell itself. Staring, the creature sped past me in its car, not having noticed me. And I will forever thank the Lord that it didn't. It sped past me, after my truck, and disappeared into the distance. I'm not sure whether I had hallucinated all of the said encounter, whether the story of poor, mad Stanley had shaken me more than I admit. However, I cannot believe that such a hellish smile had been produced by just my own imagination. My old truck was found on the same day. Someone had run it against a rock wall. Yet the driver was never found. Only the bullet holes deeply piercing the passenger seat. In many communities, urban legends are a rite of passage. Most of us had grown up with some form of tall tale, whether it was something as ridiculous as growing watermelon in your stomach because you ate its seeds, or downright terrifying like being taken by a demonic woman because you said her name three times in a mirror. Though they may not all have much in common on the surface, their significance goes beyond the tales themselves. Urban legends provide children with their first real test of critical thinking. Even if every kid in your class is adamant that some miraculous claim is valid, you're never too sure. In your own growing curiosity, you ask questions, do research, and piece together information from your own understanding of the world. To us adults, it may seem insignificant to determine that a watermelon actually won't grow in your stomach, or that Slenderman didn't actually steal the kid who's been out sick. 
but in reality, it's the process of logical thinking and finding the truth with verifiable evidence that becomes so valuable later on in life. And it's for those exact reasons that the tale of the earwig strikes a deep-seated dread into every person living in my town. The earwig is a creature born of collective fear, as the story goes. A human-sized bug that waits in the darkness, fixing its body into the tiniest corner so that it can observe you from afar. Long antennae sense the slightest movement. Quick legs and a flexible body allow it to squeeze into every nook and cranny to evade your eye. Unsure of your surroundings, you search, but to no avail. Only when you think you've checked every corner possible do you reluctantly accept that you're alone. Little do you know that the moment you've let your guard down is the moment it glides silently towards you to inject a paralyzing neurotoxin into your neck. The debilitating pain is unbearable, and you thrash around in a desperate attempt to fight back, but a tough exoskeleton protects it from anything you could hope would hurt it. As your body begins to tire, and as your muscles start to seize, fleshy tentacles emerge from an undulating thorax and shoot a sticky material to hold you in place. At the same time, a flexible proboscis pierces your abdomen. It excretes a substance to turn your insides into a soup, and happily slurps it up. Once it's had its fill... A second appendage quickly injects thousands of maggots into what will now serve as a petrified cocoon. Horrifying behavior aside, the story for the earwig isn't simply one of a formidable predator. It's one of a creature who, by some unknown means, has conquered the very concept of uncertainty itself. What happens when a being finds a way to always potentially exist? Not just when you finally decide to open your eyes and turn around, but under your bed, in your closet, in every dark place you never thought to check, until you know for a fact that something is or isn't there. The answer to what fills that space is unknown, and in that uncertainty, the earwig finds a home. The more people think about the possibility of its existence, the more it has a chance to find its way into our reality. At first, the kids couldn't possibly understand the ramifications of the tale. For them, it was just a stupid thing they'd say to scare each other. Don't think about the earwig, or it'll already be too late, they'd say. When one was mad at a classmate or a teacher, they'd shout the name three times or draw them a picture of it to make sure that the targets of their ire kept the beast in mind. Others would play the long game, finding a victim and making mention of the earwig to them every single day. For most, it was supposed to be harmless kid fun, a dumb myth like any other. As they grew older, they'd forget and laugh when their friends brought it up as adults. But one day, the laughs stopped when a girl was found dead in her room. Her body had seemingly petrified overnight, and what looked like maggots were crawling in and out of her nose. Nobody could figure out what had led to her death. Had she simply stopped breathing? An abnormal medical condition, perhaps? There were no signs of foul play, just a few marks that looked like she had been stuck by a hypodermic needle. But there was no break-in, and the parents surely didn't harm her. So what had led to that tragedy? Sad and confused, the town's children did their best to cope with the event. At first, there was a genuine mourning for the young girl, but in a short amount of time, they attached her death to the only thing that made sense in their underdeveloped minds. Soon, the earwig had become synonymous with taking the young girl's life. In the minds of the children, she was its first official kill. Almost as if the universe wanted to confirm their suspicions, soon after, another person was found dead. This time, a grown man. A teacher who, in all fairness, was hated by much of his class. Like the girl, his body was found petrified with maggots crawling out of every orifice. Needle marks were found on his neck, 
and some unidentifiable mucus-like substance stuck him to his bed. But unlike the girl, he had a more direct connection to the creature. Drawings of what appeared to be an imposing bug filled his mailbox. Papers he was grading had earwig written all over it with more crude pictures of a similar-looking beast drawn on the back. While the local police couldn't take this as any more than coincidence, and while none of the kids involved faced punishment, it certainly raised the eyebrows of the townsfolk. All the while, word of the earwig was going from urban legend to something that people truly began to fear. As time went on, more deaths came in the exact same manner. Never an overwhelming amount, but a concerning number nonetheless. While some seemed completely unrelated to the creature, most undeniably had some sort of connection to it. It ultimately reached the point where even the most hardcore skeptics wouldn't dare say its name, for fear of bringing a plague upon someone else's home or, worse, their own. A young boy played out in his front yard on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Two neighborhood kids the same age were walking by and stopped to talk with him for a second. A quick exchange of pocket cash was made. The young boy disappeared into his house and then soon re-emerged with a piece of chalk. He casually walked over to the sidewalk and began to draw something as the two boys stood over him and giggled. He didn't even finish half the word before his father came rushing out of the house like it was on fire. The man scooped his son up with one arm while punt-kicking the fallen piece of chalk across the street. Mr. Ned, as the kids called him, was one of the calmest individuals in town. A delightfully happy religious man who never raised his voice was now beat red. He screamed at the two neighborhood boys to get the hell away from his house before turning his attention to his son and yelling, You will never do that again. Do you understand me? He had been shouting with so much force that others couldn't help but peek out their windows to see what the commotion was. One woman even stepped outside to inquire about what was going on. Mr. Ned met her confused gaze with a snarl. With nearly the same level of force he had spoken to his son with, he screamed at her to go inside before marching back into his home with a vice grip on his son's arm. From that day forward... The young boy wasn't allowed out of his house for anything except school until he was ready to leave for college. Supposedly, the two boys who had thought it would be funny to pay the kid to draw the creature's name in public met an even harsher punishment at home. Quickly, word of the earwig wasn't that of legend to the townspeople. They were fact. Just as the sun rose in the sky, so too did the earwig descend in the dark. For them, talk of anything even resembling the creature was taboo, and any slip-up was met with zero tolerance and swift retribution. There were even instances of police coming to arrest people that heard was spreading the creature's name. False charges were quickly applied, and people were more than willing to lie in court to shut someone up for good. Though it may seem like a mighty overreaction from the outside, it's important to remember what fear does to people, especially when that fear had been justified by years of evidence. When your life and the lives of your loved ones are put in danger because of mere thoughts, it would seem appropriate that people go to extreme measures to prevent those thoughts from ever forming. And when the earwig was off of the minds of the people, life was good. The hope was that, like all things not acknowledged, the legend would fade into irrelevance, and eventually non-existence. But scared whispers and an irrefutable feeling of constantly walking on eggshells kept the thoughts alive. And by extension, the earwig still ate. Every now and again, another death would surface. The townsfolk would play it off as natural causes or a particularly gruesome homicide. But deep down, they knew the truth. As a kid, my friends and I were bolder with the legend. Though we didn't dare speak of the earwig to the degree previous generations had, we played with the concept enough that we put ourselves in real danger of retaliation. Strange as it was, it felt like we were carrying on a tradition. 
For us, the idea of playing with something so sinister felt fun. In our minds, we were invincible. It felt like we could touch the edge of death, but our youth and hubris would always pull us back onto the safe ground. As we got older, the frequency of the story faded until, eventually, we had gone years without speaking of it. I was seventeen and in my last year of high school when it ultimately came up again. My friends and I were hanging out before school when we were approached by a kid named Dean Mendez. Dean always had a passion for the macabre and would tell anyone who'd listen about the creepy things he found on the internet. Usually he'd be excited to tell people about the various things he'd find, but that day he seemed spooked. His eyes were puffy and red, and his hair was a tangled mess. I saw him walk towards us, and as he got close, I went to say hello, but he approached me first. I need to speak with you, alone, Dean said, placing his hand on my shoulder a little too tightly. My immediate impulse was to tell him to let go and take a few steps back, as I was hit with an odor that no doubt resulted from skipping the shower for the past few days. But despite my initial reservations, I also got the strong sense that Dean needed help. Whatever led him to this condition was obviously pretty severe, and if he needed to talk to me about something that would help him, then so be it. I checked the time and saw I still had quite a bit before my first period class, so I told my friends I'd catch up with them later, and walked off with Dean. As we walked, I tried to ask him what was up, but he insisted that we get away from where the other people could hear, because he was scared they'd judge him. At that point, I'm a little concerned about my own safety. Still, I felt comfortable escaping a confrontation by evaluating the difference in our size and playing with the Swiss army knife I keep in my front pocket for self-defense. Once he felt we were far enough from prying ears, he stopped and started to cry. I messed up real bad, man. I messed up really, really bad, he said, with his face buried in his hands. I tried to tell him that whatever it was, he'd be okay, and that I was here for him regardless. You don't understand, he told me. I went too far. I went way too far. It took a minute before I could get him to calm down, and only when he stopped crying could I get him to actually explain himself. What happened? I asked. There was a pause. Dean looked around a moment before taking a step towards me and wrapping his hands around my shoulders again. I summoned the earwig, he stated. I was so curious about the legends, if they were true. For the past month, I committed myself to make sure that it was real. I, I had to see it. I needed proof. That's what curious people do, right? They investigate things, see if they can find the craziness in our world. And I found it, but I didn't know what it'd be like this. For a moment, I was confused. But then my mind suddenly flashed back to all the childhood stories and made connections between the strange deaths and weird behavior around the name. But as far as I remembered, the earwig always killed its victims, left them nothing but a corpse filled with its children, and yet Dean looked perfectly healthy. I asked him how it was possible. If he had indeed summoned the earwig, then how was he still alive? And why was he talking to me about it? He shrugged. All Dean knew was that it wanted him to speak to a few of the people he knew in exchange for his life. Remind them that it was still here. It gave him a list of people, and he'd been struggling with what it would mean to follow its instructions since that day. But ultimately, Dean had to choose life. I wanted to be angry for what he'd done to me. I wanted to scream and tell him to get far away and never look in my direction again. But I knew it wouldn't help. I could see the fear in his eyes, and his physical condition showed a kid who clearly didn't want to be doing what he was doing. He had no choice. For half the day, I existed in a strange stupor. All I could think about was how I'd get myself out. 
It wasn't until a conversation I had with my friends about how they were stressed about school did I realize I couldn't contribute to the intrusive thoughts. I needed to take my mind elsewhere. It was hell to try. I did everything possible to distract myself over the coming days. But no matter what I did, the intrusive thoughts found their way in. Drugs, music, conversations, picking up new interests, laser focusing on my other stressors. Nothing mattered. Even my then-girlfriend got annoyed by how much I wanted to hear about what was on her mind instead of speaking on my own thoughts. The worst part was that I couldn't reach out to others to explain and call for help without dragging them in. Every day felt like a challenge to keep my mind preoccupied, and I dreaded the moments night hit. Taking sleeping pills early in the evening became routine, as I couldn't risk being alone with my thoughts in the dark for any period of time. To my horror, my parents had told me they were going on a surprise honeymoon vacation and would be gone for the weekend. When I explained how much I didn't want them to leave, they were shocked. A teenage boy gets the house all to himself for a week, and he's not stoked. Unfathomable. Finally, it was just me and the dark. It all came to a head the same Friday when I couldn't get to sleep. The sleeping pills weren't working like I had hoped, and I was tossing and turning with the same questions replaying in my mind. Why him? Why me? What does it want? The questions swirled in my brain. I couldn't help but visualize the thing perched on my ceiling, watching me as I struggled. Every sound in the dark was magnified. Was it coming from me? Was it something else? Was it real at all? A tingling sensation shot down my spine, and I shot up in a cold sweat, staring into the void before me, waiting for the creature to lunge forward in the darkness. Minutes passed as I sat there, paralyzed in fear. The darkness in my room perfectly reflected the uncertainty of my mind. It felt as though I could put my hand out, and the odds of feeling something were equal to the odds of feeling nothing. I couldn't take it. I sprang up from my bed and made a mad dash for light, flickering it on and seeing. Nothing. Just my room as I had left it. I breathed a massive sigh of relief and went to sit on my bed, content to stay up all night until the sun came up. I reached for my phone, and the screen read 1 a.m. I'd have to stay up quite a while, but it was worth it. I figured I'd need some coffee, and slowly began to make my way to the kitchen. Walking down the hall, I turned on the lights to the living room and sitting on the wall between it and the kitchen was a massive black bug. My body felt like it was made of stone. I dared not move as its long antennae searched the air, sensing for the slightest vibrations. I tried thinking of an exit plan, but there weren't any good options. The two I immediately settled on were running back to my room or making a dash for the front door. I figured that at least with the second option, I wouldn't be trapped with the thing bearing down on me. A single turn of my foot sent its antennae into a frenzy. In the blink of an eye, the thing was skittering down the wall and across the floor towards me. I moved towards the front door, hoping I could reach it in time, but it cut me off and shot a sticky substance at my feet. I jumped back as it hit the ground and turned on a dime towards my room, but only got a couple feet before I could feel something solid on my back. I was yanked backwards, and from the moment I hit the ground, it became impossible to stand back up. Just like that, I was caught. The earwig slowly approached me, crawling over me as if it were pacing, trying to decide what to do. Eventually, it settled on standing in front of me, clasping its mandibles together in front of my face. An eel-like tongue slithered out and licked me. But then it gave me some space. Instead of doing what it had done to so many others, it reared up onto its rear legs and revealed a hole with what looked like teeth surrounding it. 
a mucus-covered lumpy mass emerged slowly from the hole until it stuck out a few inches. From its mass, two small slits peeled away to reveal milky, white eyes. Even though the eyes looked blind, they searched around the room before finally landing on me. Once they had locked onto my location, an awful, wet, tearing sound followed. And just a few inches under the eyes, a mouth had now formed, with long, rotten teeth protruding from puffy gums. To my shock, the face embedded in this abominable creature was capable of speech. No need for fear today. You will not die today. Not by me. It hissed in a deep, buzzy voice. I require your assistance. In return, I will no longer hunt you or your family. This is a fair deal. All I could manage to stammer out was a weak... What? The creature took a couple steps forward, and the face extended out slightly to come closer to mine. Life in exchange for a service. Easily understood. Easily fulfilled. What do you want from me? I continued to stammer while fighting back tears. I just want to go back to bed. Please. The corners of its non-existent lips slightly curled into what I think was supposed to be its version of a smile. The face slightly retracted into the hole before coming out again and speaking. You must plant my seed. I will give you time to figure out how. But eventually, you must find a way to bring my tail to the masses so that they know my name forever. I remember thinking it was like a virus, a virus whose host is thoughts itself. And with the number of hosts in our town dwindling, it was using me as a way of branching out. Doing what it wanted would put so many people in danger, but even so, with this satanic spawn bearing over me, the only thing I could say was, yes, It'll be done. Seemingly satisfied, the creature's face began to retract back inside the hole, but a part of me wouldn't let it go. I shouted for it to stop, and to my surprise, it did. Why? I blurted out. Why do this? If you're intelligent, you must understand what kind of pain you cause us. Why not coexist? My question seemed to baffle the creature. For a moment, the corners of its mouth drooped lower, and its eyes excreted pus from the corners before returning to a neutral expression. Why does the spider eat the fly? Why does the lion hunt the antelope? Why do the humans slaughter the pigs, the fish, each other? It's in their nature. It flashed its pseudo-smile again. Aren't our lives more important than nature? I cried out. When we kill, it's only to preserve ourselves. What you do to us is beyond that. It paused again, and spit towards me before speaking. How selfish to think self-preservation is only for you. I feed to sustain myself. You shift ecosystems and make entire species go extinct to sustain vanity. Surely you understand the pain you cause, as well as I. The creature began to wrap its body around me. Dozens of sharp legs poked into my skin. The difference is, this time, you're the one being hunted. You should be thankful. I haven't yet decided to eat much more than my fill. I could feel the tingle of a stinger softly being pressed against my neck. I squeezed my eyes shut, preparing for a painful injection, but as soon as it had come, it was gone. I reluctantly opened my eyes, and luckily, I was completely alone when I did. Not only that... 
but I had gained my freedom of movement back. Still, I didn't feel free, and I most certainly didn't feel safe. The only thing I felt comfortable doing at that moment was contemplating. For the first time in a long time, I knew I wouldn't be in danger because of my thoughts. But that fear for myself was replaced with a concern for others. Little did I know that that contemplation would take years. Not knowing what the ethical decision was, how long I had to make it, or why I had to be the one to make it has been hard. Some days I'd be so sure I was about to do the right thing, and others... I couldn't be more uncertain. It wasn't until I started writing more seriously that I finally found my answer. I don't consider myself a particularly good writer or storyteller, but at the very least, I think learning how to communicate an idea is a skill you can build on over time. As I've grown as a writer, so too has my ability to communicate a message. Thinking back to my high school days, there was rarely a time when I wasn't thinking up stories. Either showing them to my friends and family, or posting them anonymously online. Not only that, but I had always dreamed of getting out of the town I was in. Branching out, so to speak. I think that's what the earwigs saw. Someone who could communicate an idea to an audience outside of the idea's birth. And in the end... I did choose to communicate the story of the earwake. My safety and the safety of those I care about are far too important to risk by not doing it. And for those who will inevitably be impacted, I am so sorry. If there was any other way to do this, I would. But before I am judged for my actions, I at least want a chance to be understood. This decision hasn't come easy. But ultimately, I believe the earwig always knew what I would do. I think it chose people it knew would always choose to cling to life. In that way, its spread was, uh, is, inevitable. But the degree to which it spreads doesn't have to be. In making my choice, I figured if I could communicate its message, why can't I communicate mine as well? Who's to say that I don't warn you now? Who's to say that I don't tell you to do everything you can to ignore the earwig? So I am. Ignore the intrusive thoughts. Find distractions. Find other interests. Find reasons to convince yourself it's nothing more than legend. Because if its existence is never a possibility, then neither are the consequences. And maybe, together... We can keep a tall tale, just that. A tale. I'd always sit outside, a briefcase of bricks at my feet. When Keith would walk out, I'd always smile, basking in his warm attention. Good evening, Miss Pauline, he'd say. Good evening, officer, I'd reply. He'd chuckle. Now, Miss Pauline, you know I'm not an officer. I'm just a security guard. I'd chuckle back. And you know I don't like being called Miss. It's just Pauline. He'd always gallantly carry my briefcase for me, and I'd hook my arm around his as he walked me to my apartment building. We'd talk, and he'd always come up with me to the 15th floor and drop the briefcase off just inside my door but he'd never enter my apartment. Come in for tea? That's very kind of you, but I must be getting home to my fiancé. He'd smile. I'll see you tomorrow, Miss Pauline. Good night, officer. I'd always set the timer for 15 minutes before I washed up, microwaved a pizza, and made some chamomile tea. I'd settle down on my little purple couch in my dark bedroom, a plate on my lap, a mug in my hand, and a video camera propped up between me and the window, zoomed in on a building three blocks away. It took a lot of research to snag my apartment, but it was worth it. 
I'd always watch as Keith entered his 15th floor studio. I'd watch his fiancée roll out of bed and begin yelling at him. I'd watch him nod, trying to avoid riling her up further. Sometimes she'd slap him, and he'd always take it, never defending himself. I'd always curse her, my blood boiling. He didn't deserve her. He deserved me. I just didn't know how to make him see. I'd watch him cook, serve her, clean up, and eat, and I'd wished I was there to help him relax, to massage his tense shoulders, to bring him a cold one, to draw him a warm bath, to ease his stress the way only I could. I'd sigh after they'd turn off the lights, and I'd put away my dishes, wash up, and go to bed. I'd always have my breakfast behind the camera, watching as Keith raced to his fiancée's demands before he left her lounging in bed and ran out the door. I'd go to work thinking about him, my days on autopilot as I served coffee to men who didn't have an ounce of the class and chivalry Keith did. I'd rush home after my shift, changing into a business casual outfit before dragging my briefcase of bricks and running back out. I'd always sit on the bench outside the building where Keith works, and when he'd walk out, I'd smile, basking in his warm attention. One day, when I felt our relationship had reached a certain stage, I decided it was time to openly express our feelings. Good morning, Miss Pauline. Good evening, officer. Now, Miss Pauline, he chuckled, you know I'm not an officer. I'm just a security guard. You've got more bravery and honor in your little finger than any officer I know. And you definitely look better in a uniform than those tubs waddling around with guns and donuts. He raised an eyebrow in flustered surprise. Uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, now, uh, Miss Pauline, that's no way to talk about our men in blue. I mean nothing against them. I stood up and adjusted his collar. I just feel you deserve the title of officer, just as much as they do. An adorable blush tinted his nose and cheeks. I appreciate it, Miss Pauline. You're very kind to me. And you're always kind to me. It's very hard to find decent, respectful men like you around here. He looked down with a bashful smile. Uh, now, uh, Miss Pauline... Please... Just call me Pauline. I can't. I've been raised to always respect a lady. Do you call your fiancé, miss? His smile vanished as his cheeks became ashen. Yes. Do you love her? Oh, uh, no. Uh, no, uh, Miss Pauline, uh, begging your pardon, but I don't think that's a very appropriate question. He bent down to pick up my briefcase. I can't believe they expect you to carry all this work home every day. It's all part of the job. I hooked my arm around his as we walked to my apartment building. I'm so lucky to have a strong gentleman like you keep me safe on these dark nights. I just want you to know I really appreciate everything you do. It's my pleasure, he said, his smile returning. I'm glad I could personally make sure you get home all right. I'd love to have a man like you at home as well. I have no doubt in my mind you'll find one. Do you think I'd make a good wife? Uh, oh, uh, yes. I think you'd make a lucky man very happy. Are you a lucky man? His smile wavered. Uh, yes, I'm only a security guard with nothing much to my name, but I found myself a lady who tolerates all that. That shouldn't be tolerated. That should be respected. You've got a stable income, you work protecting people, you even help others off hours, like me. You're very caring and considerate. You deserve someone who sees all that, Keith. He turns to me, his beautiful eyes glinting. You called me Keith. I leaned my head against his shoulder. 
I feel we've talked enough to do without titles. We've become quite close. I enjoy these walks with you. Don't you? Oh, uh, very much so. I'd like to see them become more. We made it to my apartment. I want you to stay for tea. That's very kind of you, but I must be getting home to my fiancé. Just a few minutes, please, Keith. He seems to enjoy his name on my tongue. Okay, uh, a few minutes. He walked inside for the very first time. You have a beautiful place, Miss Pauline, he said, placing my briefcase on the floor. You like the color green, too. It's my favorite, I replied from the kitchen. Have a seat. I'll be right there. I walked out a few minutes later with a tray. Earl Grey and homemade lemon shortbread. Wow, he said, blinking in amazement. That's my favorite tea, and I love lemon shortbread. Oh, really? I giggled as I placed the tray before him. Earl Grey is my favorite, too, and I just love baking. We have a lot in common. He reached out and took a bite. These are delicious. Have as many as you like, I said, beaming as I sat beside him. He picked up a cup and saucer and studied them. These look just like my ma's set. Oh, really? I found them in a cute little shop and just had to have them. He smiled. You've got wonderful taste. My ma was known for her beautiful china. Does your fiancé have the same taste? I wished I hadn't said that, as weariness darkened his expression. Uh, I should get going. My fiancé is waiting for me. Oh, uh, at least finish your tea. He took a quick sip and put the cup and saucer down. Thank you, Miss Pauline. You've been very gracious. You didn't drink anything. With a tight smile, he took another sip, spilling some on his shirt. Oh, great. Don't worry. I slid closer and dabbed the stain with tissue. Take off your shirt. I can wash it for you real quick. No, that's all right. I can do it at home, he said, and he stood up and stumbled away. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be ungrateful, but my fiancé gets worried when I come home late. Oh, uh, okay. Then won't you take some lemon shortbread with you? He eyed them for a second before he nodded. Yes, please. I wrapped them for him in a handkerchief. I can make more tomorrow. Please don't trouble yourself, Miss Pauline. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Have a good night. I sighed as I closed the door. I'd have to try harder tomorrow to break his fiancé's grip on him. After cleaning up, I made my way to my couch in my dark bedroom and settled in. Keith walked through his studio door and his fiancé bounced out of bed and ran over, flailing and yelling. I couldn't hear her, but judging from Keith's expression, she was grating and shrill. She paused, jabbing a finger at the tea stain before dusting shortbread crumbs off his shirt. He tried talking, but she slapped him and shoved him against the wall, her hands roaming his pockets until she found my empty handkerchief. Perhaps tonight was going to be in my favor after all. She'd think he was cheating, break off the engagement, and he'd come running into my arms. I sat up watching with eager focus, my breath held in anticipation for the moment Keith became mine. She began screaming, not yelling, screaming, loud enough for me to hear her three blocks away. Keith attempted to console her. He even got down on his knees, which broke my heart. He didn't deserve her. He deserved me. She hit him. She punched him. She scratched him. She was a vicious banshee, and all he could do was take it, crying and begging. 
I wanted to push her out of the window and hug him, run my fingers through his hair, and tell him everything was going to be alright. Soon. She picked up a lamp, and I covered my mouth with my hands. Maybe I should call the police. She could kill him. I reached for the phone, but I stopped when she threw the lamp across the room, its shards skittering. She paused, her shoulders heaving as she faced Keith, and he held his hands out to her in apology. For a moment, I was afraid she'd forgive him, ruining everything. Instead, she flung herself to the floor, and I gasped as she began punching herself in the face, screaming for help. Keith ran over to her in a panic, trying to stop her. He didn't know what she was doing, but I did, and it was disgusting. My friend suffered under the thumb of an abusive husband for years, and no one believed her until he took her life. And now this ungrateful witch had the audacity to ruin an innocent man's reputation and tarnish every true victim's account just to punish Keith. She wasn't going to get away with it. I pressed the record button. I considered calling the police as well, but a vindictive part of me enjoyed watching her pummel herself. No matter what she did, I had proof Keith was innocent. She was a petty, controlling, repulsive fool for taking a man like Keith for granted, and her loss was my gain. Her blotchy face was twisted in ugly sobs, blood pouring from her nose as she bashed her face against the floor. Keith kept trying to hold her, but she thrashed and kicked, her screams for help causing heads to pop out of neighboring windows. Keith's door bust open, and a man pounced on him and dragged him away, crushing him against the floor. A woman ran in afterwards, tending to the deceitful fiancé with horrified disbelief at the damage she'd incurred. I could see Keith was speaking, but the man pinning him down was yelling at him as he twisted his arm back. I could imagine the insults he was spewing. If Keith was guilty, he deserved so much more. But he wasn't. And now was my time to shine. Police showed up, cuffing my man and dragging him away while EMTs took care of his scheming fiancé. That was when I made a copy of the video and went down to the station. I gave them my statement as a witness, but unlike the others, I had the truth on tape. I told them I heard a commotion and just had to record the injustice. I handed everything over and went back home, certain Keith was going to be released tonight and that he would rush right over with infinite gratitude. I stayed up that night, waiting for him, waiting for his arms to wrap around me, for his lips to find mine for our love to flourish where it belonged. There was a knock at one past midnight, and my heart fluttered as I ran up, a robe draped over my laciest lingerie, my trembling hands adjusting my hair before opening the door. A sharp pain exploded from my face, and I staggered back, stars bursting before my eyes. My hands flew up to my gushing nose, tears streaming down my face as I stumbled away from Keith's fiancé. Fury radiated off her as she swung another fist at me, sending me crashing on top of my coffee table, breaking it. Gasping, I tried to get up, my heart stuttering as I tripped on my open rope. Taking advantage of my stumble, she stomped down on me, and I screamed as her heel punctured my side. Wrestling me flat on the floor, she held my head steady by the hair as she sent one punch after the other to my face. My teeth tumbled into my mouth, and agonized moans gurgled from my throat as I tried to fight her off. She was strong, much stronger than me. She was also fueled by rage. Amidst her frenzied punching, she lost her balance, and I took the chance to wrench my hands free a fistful of hair remaining in her grip as I squirmed away. While calling out for help, I scrambled up and made a mad dash to my bedroom. A blinding light flooded my vision as my skull rattled, and I crumbled to the floor, my ears ringing. She flipped me on my back, and my heart ricocheted between my ribs as she battered me with my polished stone ashtray. 
Not a word escaped her mouth, only animalistic growls as froth foamed at the corners. I continued to scream and sob, trying to shield myself with my arms as my bones cracked with every blow. Through my tears and blood, I could see the inhuman brutality emanating from her wild eyes. She wanted me dead. I exposed her ugly truth, and she wanted me dead. Twisting and writhing in despair, I reached up, clawing at the fresh stitches on her face. She shrieked, pausing her assault, and I shoved the heel of my hand into her broken nose, sending her reeling off me with a quivering squeal of pain. I backed away, tripping over myself as I crawled towards the bedroom. My spasming lungs squeaked as red sprayed with every breath. My pulse rioted at the sound of kitchen drawers being open, and I staggered down the hall in disoriented panic, crashing into walls and slipping on my blood. Pressure against my shoulder sent me back to the floor, and I screamed as it evolved into searing agony. Another stab crunched against bone. My vision faded with each vicious thrust, my energy ebbing. My last coherent thought, Keith. I was going to die before I made Keith mine. Miss Pauline? I groaned, muted pain throbbing beneath a medicated haze. I peeked through my crusty eyelids, and my heart skipped a beat when I saw Keith beside me, holding my hand. Keith? I croaked, wincing as it felt as though I'd swallowed barbed wire. He smiled, tears in his eyes as he reached to the side. Let me buzz for the doctor. Don't speak a lot now. Your ventilator was taken out just last week. Where am I? The hospital. He opened a water bottle and moistened some tissue before he cleaned my eyes and face with tenderness. You're my guardian angel. You defended me, and you almost died because of it. I'm really sorry. I don't know how to make it up to you. I melted at his words, all of my aches and pains forgotten. He finally knew the truth. He was finally going to be mine. I'm glad you're free now, I rasped. He dabbed a wet napkin against my chapped lips with a rueful frown. Living with her, I couldn't see just how bad it really was. But then she pulled that stunt. I'm forever grateful you heard her and were in the best position to film it. I'm just sorry you had to suffer for it. I smiled. You deserve someone who respects you. And I think I've found her. I almost forgot how to breathe. It was happening. It was finally happening. I'm so happy, I whispered, tears brimming against my lashes. Me too. I never imagined I'd ever feel like this. I've been visiting you every single day, and over the weeks, Miss Natasha and I really got to know each other. She's a nurse, and one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. She cares so much about you. My heart shattered. A nurse? Yes, he replied, with a love-struck smile. Now I know many are thinking she's out of my league, but she told me to never put myself down like that. She respects me, just like you always said. You saved me, and you helped me find someone I deserve. You're my guardian angel, Miss Pauline, and I'll forever be in your debt. Look who's up. A doctor said, walking in alongside two nurses. Nice to have you join us, Pauline. Can you speak, or is there too much discomfort? I tried to hide my irritation at her interruption. I can speak. Wonderful. She looked at Keith. If you'd please give us a moment with the patient. Yes, of course, doctor. I gotta get going anyway. He turns to me his beautiful smile wringing my tattered heart. I'm so happy you're awake, Miss Pauline. I'll drop by again tomorrow. Please let me know if you need anything. Anything at all. I nodded, 
a tear trickling down my cheek. Don't worry, you'll be okay, he said, giving my hand a gentle squeeze. Dr. Fida and nurses Natasha and Raj are wonderful. He gave Natasha a sunny nod, and she nodded back with a smile before he left the room. The doctors and two nurses approached me, talking and testing, but all I could hear was my blood boiling, and all I could feel was my heart aching as I glared at Natasha. He didn't deserve her. He deserved me. How could I make him see? Late summer, 1986. We were driving through the Rocky Mountains on our way to Ure. There were three of us, Steve, Danny, and myself. We were young, dumb, and fed up with what life was really like after college. So we bought some matches, packed a cooler of beer, food, and beer, and loaded up a trustworthy Toyota with all the fixings for a classic camping trip. This trip was supposed to shake up the devastating monotony of our daily life. And shake it up, it did. To the very core. Right before we were ready to get set out, Steve's mom ran out of the house and told him he should take their newly adopted family dog, Luna, for safety. Steve was hesitant. He didn't want to have to look after the dog, especially if we were going to be drinking. And she was a big dog. A mixed husky and something else. A Great Dane, maybe. But his mom insisted until, finally, he broke and agreed to take her. Luna looked up at him with her warm blue eyes and seemed to smile. Steve sighed and said, I guess I'll sit in the back with her. No, no, I said, walking over and patting her head. Let her sit up front with me. She wagged her tail. Most of the car ride went smoothly, and we sang along to the radio, mooed at cows, and waved at, or flipped off, motorcyclists. But as we neared our destination, and the sun sank behind us, leaving us in a thick, almost tangible darkness, we started to become jumpy, pointing at strange shadows and swift movements. Luna, though, was curled up and asleep beside me, unaware of our growing fear. The sky was covered in big, rolling clouds that blew swiftly towards the east, covering and revealing the full moon at random intervals. By now, we were the only vehicle on the road, my headlights barely slicing the darkness around us as we weaved our way through the mountains. The isolation, the darkness, the silence. It was all so crushing. Steve, I thought you said we would be there before the sun set. I told you we shouldn't have stopped at that bar. Oh, Danny, I didn't know we'd get there for that long. You wouldn't stop your stupid pool game. And I won. Come on, it's not that dark out. Would some money make you happy? You... Cool it. Look... What the hell is that? I slowed the car down to a stop, trying to see what was blocking the road, but the light from the cloud-covered moon was too dim. What the hell? Danny, I whispered, as she rolled down her window. I was apprehensive, worried this was someone's attempt to rob us, or worse. I had heard all the urban legends before. I just want to see better. She stuck her head out the window, and I rolled a little bit closer. Luna, feeling the change in the car's movement, lifted her head and sat up, panting. It's... I... Uh, I think it's a dead deer, guys. Gross. Danny retreated back inside the car and rolled the window back up. Who the hell just leaves something like that on the road? Dicks, Steve said then leaned forward. Hey, man, think you can drive around it? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. I approached the thing, now seeing the antlers and the gleaning black eyes, open, staring, dead. It blinked. I yelped and jerked the steering wheel, sideswiping the mountainside. What the hell, man? It's alive. What? That deer, it's alive. 
As I spoke, the deer lifted its head and belted. The sound echoed around the chasm. We all jumped and watched as it pushed itself up, up, until it was standing on its hind legs, like a man, but uncanny, grotesque. Mesmerized, we sat, unable to move as the thing walked over to us, slowly, decidedly, as if walking on two legs was a thing this deer did often. It leaned down next to Danny's window, its face so close to the glass that steam from its nose fogged it up. A low noise rang out through the car. Luna was growling, her hackles raised, crouched in the seat next to me. The thing rammed its head into the window. Chaos erupted. Danny screamed, piercing, high. Luna started barking, booming persistently. Steve yelled, telling me to floor it. I was shaking, struggling with the clutch, stalling. The window cracked, and the thing started making an incredible sound. It sounded like a strange, screeching, guttural form of laughter. Finally, the clutch caught, and I sped the hell out of there. I checked the rear view, and saw the thing, standing on two legs, looking after us. Suddenly, it leapt forward, and began running after us. It ran on two legs instead of four, and it ran fast, incredibly fast. I drove as fast as I could on that winding mountain road, but despite my speed, the thing still caught up with us. It tapped its antlers on my window and screeched that strange laughter again. Then it pointed in front of us, baring its teeth, and stopped. The abruptness of how quickly it disappeared caught me off guard. Watch out! I snapped forward, and what I saw made me slam on my brakes. A house. A house in the middle of the road. I guess it was more of a cottage or a hut, but there it was. Clear, vivid, in front of us. Danny was audibly crying in the back seat. Steve was breathing heavily, like he had just run a marathon. Luna was whimpering beside me and scratching at the window. Nausea enveloped me, made worse by the vibration from my pounding heart. Seriously, what the hell is going on? I think I'm gonna puke, man. Don't open that door. Just back up and turn around. Let's go back. Towards that. No way. Well, if you didn't seem to notice, there's a house in front of me. Just drive through it. Come on. No, 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 no. Danny, calm down. It's okay. We're okay. We'll be fine. Danny simmered and started sobbing again. Guys, look. Oh, God. The house. It was spinning, slowly, and stopped when the front of it pointed directly at my car. The door to the house slammed open, emitting a sound like a gunshot. A single point of light emerged from the darkness inside the house. A candle, and holding it up was a figure, stooping over, covered in what looked like blackened rags. It began to approach us, lurching forward, swiftly, then slow, then swift again. It was making an eerie, deep, staccato sound. Are you for real right now? Steve was leaning forward, peering out the windshield. Let's go. Reverse. That thing is behind us. Run it over. Look. Look. Danny screamed. The stooping figure was now running at full speed straight at us. It slammed onto my hood, and we could finally see that it was an old woman, covered in wrinkles, completely bald, with sharpened yellow teeth. She crawled up the hood, opened her mouth, and licked the glass, leaving a trail of blood-colored saliva. Luna went wild, barking and foaming at the mouth, throwing herself at the door. Back up! Back up now! I slammed my foot on the gas, but my tires made a sickening sound, and the smell of burnt rubber slipped into the car. It's behind us! I turned back to see the deer's head, teeth still bared, peering at me from the back window. What do we do now? Luna, no! With a final lunge, Luna forced the door open. 
A powerful wind picked up, and the rolling clouds dissipated, allowing the light from the full moon to illuminate the scene in front and behind us. Luna was as still as a statue, slightly crouched, poised to leap. The hackles on her back quivered, and a single thread of drool spun itself down from her mouth. She began to shake, faster and faster. It looked like she was having a seizure. The old woman and the dear horror were both looking over at her. Something strange was happening to Luna. It looked as if her limbs were breaking, elongating. Her snout narrowed, sinking closer to her face. She rose up onto her hind legs, humanoid and howling up towards the sky before locking eyes with the hag on my car. In the blink of an eye, Luna was on the woman, ripping her away, shaking her to and fro in her jaw like a rag doll. Luna flung the woman towards the house, and she stuck it with some force and didn't get back up. The house and the woman vanished in a puff of smoke. Luna turned towards the thing behind us. It screeched, raising itself up to its full height, challenging her. Luna howled again, then licked her fangs. The thing took two steps towards her, before turning tail and fleeing down the road, Luna giving chase. They both ran on two legs instead of four. We sat in total silence for a few moments, until I leaned over and slammed the passenger side door close. Uh, I think Danny passed out. I turned to look at Steve, and he looked back at me. Let's get out of here, man. We got two miles before the thumping beneath us couldn't be ignored any longer. A flat tire. I pulled over and we eyed the darkness around us, paranoid. I'm not changing it. I'm not going out there. Steve said loudly. Don't worry, there's no spare. What? I took it out to make room for all the camping stuff. Are you kidding me? No. Well, what the hell do we do now? I sighed. I didn't know. Suddenly, like magic, like a miracle, headlights appeared behind us. A godsend. A car. I hope they're normal. Me too. Should we tell them? We locked eyes again. No. If they bring it up, maybe... If it's a cop, definitely not. He'll think we're high. The car rolled up beside us. It was totally black with tinted windows. The window rolled down and behind it sat a middle-aged man. He looked tired, possibly sad. Need some help? Oh, thank God. Steve whispered. Yeah, flat tire. I don't have a spare. Well, that's stupid, the man said. You should always carry a spare. Always. I never know what could happen. Luckily for you, I think I have one that will fit your car. You're joking. The man shook his head and hopped out of his car. He was dressed sharply. Black suit, black tie, black shoes all covered by a trench coat. Come on, you can hold the flashlight for me. I hesitated, then exited the car. What happened here? He pointed to the window next to Danny's head. No, uh, it's been like that for a while. A dumb neighbor kid hit it with a baseball. Aha, uh -huh. the man nodded. And her? Tired. Just tired. We've been driving for a while. Driving where? Hooray. For camping. Nice place. We've heard. Say, the man said, releasing the jack. Job done. Seen anything strange tonight? My heart sped up, and I looked around us, half expecting the deer or the woman or Luna to come sprinting towards us. What do you mean, strange? Oh, I don't know. 
Anything out of the ordinary? I... Uh, no. Why? Oh, no reason. Just heard some spooky tales. Uh, tales? That the natives who used to live around here would tell. What tales? The man stood up and dusted his hands off on his coat. Well, he said, ignoring my question. You're all set. You're about twenty minutes out from Ure and two hours from the sunrise. I'd advise you get a move on. Never know what might be stalking you out there. I'm headed the same way, actually. I can drive behind you if you'd like. A muffled yes came from inside the car, and we both looked up to see Steve nodding voraciously. Yeah, that would be great, actually. The corners of the man's mouth twitched a bit as he nodded, sliding back into his car. We drove to Ure without incidents, and as soon as we hit the city, the man in the car behind us flashed his brights twice, then flipped a U-turn, speeding back down the way we came. I thought he said he was going this way, I said, looking in my rearview mirror. Who cares? Let's get a hotel room and leave first thing in the morning, Danny said. She had woken up as we were driving towards Ure. We filled her in on the strange man and how he helped us, but she was still spooked and jumpy. And we did just that. We didn't dare camp in the wilderness or even leave the relative safety of our town. On the way back to civilization, we swore to never tell anyone what happened. It was too strange, uncanny, horrifying. Steve was silent, afraid of what his mom might say or do about Luna. We made up some story about how she had fallen over a cliff after chasing a deer. Poor Luna. We did stop for an hour around the area it happened and called out to her, but to no avail. It's been years since that happened, and I'm old now. The three of us lost touch after we returned from the trip, but vowed to keep this secret to our death. Last I heard, Steve died from a heart attack, and Danny was diagnosed with stomach cancer. I figured it's about time I shared my tale. Maybe it'll help me make some semblance of sense out of it. In the end, though... I don't know if those things were protecting us from her, or if she was protecting us from them. I guess I'll never know. Sometimes, late at night, when I hear howling, I like to imagine it's Luna, out there, somewhere, running free in the wild. As I pulled up in front of the shop, I had to recheck my directions. It was a dingy little hole in the wall stuffed between a Dollar General and a computer repair shop. It looked like it had just existed here since the creation of the first VHS tape. The windows were covered in thick yellow paper, and the outside was caked in a film of old dirt. The sign on the door said, Open, but it was barely visible through the dirty window. There was no way this place had what I wanted. When I was a kid, I remembered watching a show on cable called Children of Men. As a kid, the premise of the show appealed to me. The show was about kids living on an island out in the Pacific, trying to survive day-to-day -day trials. The producers had gotten 40 kids from all over America, ages 10 to 12, and dropped them off with supplies and instructions on how to survive. The host, Chris Mansworth, was a survival expert, and he would create challenges every day for the kids to complete. There were four teams of ten kids, and the winner of each challenge got something cool for their area of the village. I watched the show religiously as a kid. Every Saturday night, right after The Simpsons, the show would come on, and I would be enthralled. I always imagined that I was on the island with them, surviving day to day. The challenges were always interesting, too. They had the kids guts and clean their own meal, dig wells by hand, build rafts for their raft race, and make aqueducts so their village could have running water. It was a neat idea, but the show just stopped after eight episodes. No new episodes came out, and the station never gave a reason. 
This was before the internet, and there was no way to check for updates online, so the show slipped off into obscurity, and my ten-year-old self just forgot about it. I remembered the show a few years ago when my mom sent me a box of my stuff from the attic. There were a couple of old VHS tapes in there, and between Batman, the animated series, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were eight tapes with handwritten labels that read, Children of Men. We had a VHS recorder when I was a kid, and I can remember recording my favorite shows to watch later. I was excited to get to see the old show again, the memories flooding back, and I started looking for a VHS player among the tapes in the box. There wasn't one, but a quick trip to Goodwill and fifteen dollars, and I had a gently used VCR hooked to my TV. I watched all eight episodes back to back and fell in love with the show all over again. I remembered the kids I liked. Robert and Catherine were my favorites, but many of the kids had also been given a lot of screen time, and it was hard not to like them, too. As I watched, I found myself wanting to see how the show ended all over again. As I watched the show again, I began to notice something a little darker under the surface, too. Something I hadn't noticed as a kid. The village was divided into four teams. Green snakes, blue birds, red foxes, and brown mice. The teams had mostly been divided up by background, which seemed very divisive to me as an adult. The green snakes did most of the hunting for the village, a lot of their kids having a rural background, while the brown mice did most of the farming and gathering because they came from a farm background. The red foxes were in charge of construction and upkeep, they were the smarter kids, and they worked with the bluebirds, who were in charge of food management and cooking the meals. Every team had a representative who sat on a council. Robert sat for the green snakes, Catherine for the blue birds, Marco for the red foxes, and Karine for the brown mice. As the show went on, it became apparent that Robert didn't trust Marco, and with good reason. Marco and Corrine had formed a kind of alliance of their own through most of it, because Marco bullied her into doing what he wanted. Robert and Catherine set up their own alliance, and Robert started holding out food to sway Corrine's decisions. The village needed food, and Robert pointed out that he and Catherine were the ones providing it. Robert and Catherine wanted a fair split for everyone, but Marco tried to split them into a class system that would put his foxes in the higher tier. Roberts didn't like that, and it would become clear that if Chris hadn't been there, we would have seen a lot more fights. Robert was a big twelve-year-old, a stocky bruiser who won battles with his fists most of the time, and Chris had separated him and Marco more than once. Marco was smaller, but definitely had charisma. He had most of the mice and all the foxes on his side, and I wasn't sure how I missed all this tension as a kid. It all came to a head in episode six. Marco was caught hoarding food in the Red Fox Village. It wasn't just food that the other teams had been bringing in, either. He had been taking the comfort foods from the canteen the brown mice ran for the village and stored them in his hut. Robert discovered this and took Marco prisoner, demanding he be placed on trial. The whole village was in an uproar, but Marco agreed to be confined to a central cabin until the council could rule on his trial. Chris was setting the whole trial up as an Episode 8 draw for viewers. At the end of Episode 8, the Council found Marco guilty, and the episode had ended with a lot of shaky camera work and the Red Foxes storming the podium where Marco was seated. That was how the show had ended. The little bell chimed overhead as I stepped into the tiny place. The store looked like a throwback. Sharp-looking, rickety shelves that were covered in plastic VHS boxes and thick dust. The shelves held VHS tapes, Betamax, and DVD cases that were arranged neatly amongst the filth and dust. A quick look showed that they were all in alphabetical order, like some ancient library. The shelves fronted onto a glass display case that held murky wonders within. On the counter was a television an ashtray stacked with old butts, and the greasy store clerk who smiled at me as I approached. You the one who called about the tape? He asked, showing a mouth of stained teeth. I had searched for months on my own. I had taken to the internet in an attempt to find something, anything, that would give me some closure. 
Wikipedia told me that only eight episodes were aired, but twelve had been intended. As I dug deeper, I began to see that the show was a mystery all its own, though. The list of children that had been in the show was woefully incomplete. Marco and Robert were there, so were Catherine and Corinne, and Chris as the host, but none of the other children were even named. No one, except Chris Mansworth, had gone on to do anything after the show, and his only contribution was his death a few months later. His wiki said that he had committed suicide in his hotel room, and foul play was not suspected. As for the last four episodes of Children of Man, however, there was no mention. So I took to the usual online sleuths. Reddits, 4chan, TV message boards, no one seems to have the answer. Most people have never even heard of Children of Man, and the ones who had were more interested in my copies than the last four episodes. Apparently, the episodes were never compiled or released for purchase, and the only means by which the show still existed was on VHS tapes like mine. I had several offers for them. One guy wanted to give me $500 per tape, but I declined and told them I'd post copies of the tapes here for free if they wanted. That's how I met Charleston Hammer 462. He was a user on the hometown board of Reddit. He saw my post and the posted videos and got in contact with me about the place I was currently in. Heard you were looking for a certain tape. In my online of work, when you're looking for something, you go talk to Reggie. He owns a shop in Burlington, South Carolina, called Video Time Capsule. If you need a banned episode of a 70s drama or a never-aired documentary from the 60s, you talk to Reggie. I read the message a few times before responding. Thanks, Charleston, but these episodes aren't just unaired. They're unknown. No one has ever seen them. I don't even know if they exist, and the story you're talking about is over 400 miles away. I figured I'd never hear from him again when I hit send on the message. It took him an hour to respond. What you're after is very rare. I used to watch Children of Men myself when I was younger. It ended so abruptly that it's been an internet mystery since the net was just wells and message boards. I didn't learn about the last four episodes, though, until I met Reggie at TVCon. We got to talking about old TV shows, and after a few drinks, he told me that he had the last four episodes of Children of Men. That piqued my interest. Have you seen them? That response took a little longer. I have. It's some pretty different stuff. I won't ruin it for you, but if you value the way you remember Children of Men, then don't watch it. There's a reason these episodes never made it to air. Here's the number to the store. If it's late, call him anyway. Reggie keeps weird hours, and sometimes that store is open 24 hours. He's an erratic dude, no doubt, but he has what you're looking for. The number was at the bottom of the message. Yeah, I said, no longer sure about what I was doing. Yeah, I called about the complete series of Children of Men. He nodded, reached under the counter, and slapped a plain white case on the counter. All eight episodes, recorded at airing he said, his eyes studying me. I frowned. I'm after the last four episodes. His piggy eyes glinted behind the grease-smeared glasses. There were only eight episodes that aired. And you told me you had the other four episodes that never aired. He smiled, and it did ghastly things to his porcelain face. I had to be sure. Come to the back. And with that, he disappeared behind a curtain, into the back of the store. I walked around, hesitating for a moment, as I touched the curtain and followed him. I'd come four hundred miles. I might as well go another five feet into hell. The phone rang six times. I was just about to hang up when someone answered and spoke through a mouthful of food. I didn't understand him, but once he'd swallowed whatever had been in his mouth, he tried again. Video time capsule, where your memories are always on sale. What a tagline. 
Yes, I was looking for something specific. The sound of something being stuffed into the speaker's mouth and loud chewing assaulted my ears before he continued. Aren't they all? What you looking for? Clearly, customer service was not their strong suit. Uh, episode 9 through 12 of Children of Men. I heard something hit the floor, and the speaker cursed loudly. Uh, yeah, uh, you must be mistaken. Uh, there's only eight episodes of Children of Men. Look, I said, a little hotly. I was told that you have things that no one else does. I want to see these episodes. I don't even want to buy them. And I was told that you had them in your possession. Is there any way that I can... Five hundred dollars. The voice returned, and the tone was not one to be bargained with. In cash, before I will even let you see them. I agreed, despite the outrageous price. And now I was here, in this grungy shop, preparing to go into the back. The back was worse than the front. DVDs and VHS tapes were stacked in teetering piles. The back room was lit by only a few dingy overheads, and I could see an old TV casting its glow from the back. The floor was riddled with trash, and I swear you could hear the mice scampering around to get out of the way. What sort of videos could I find here? Would this place give me anything but heartbreak? This seemed like the setup to a thousand scary stories, and I suddenly didn't want to see those mysterious artifacts. But like anyone else who comes this close to finding the thing they want, I needed to see them. Reggie was waiting for me by the TV. He had an ancient set that looked very similar to the one my parents had owned. On top was a VHS, a DVD combo player, and a set of rabbit ears that stuck out like a weather vane. There was a wooden chair in front of it with a little blue pad on it. Reggie held his hand out. Five hundred, he said. How do I know it's authentic? Look, I could get in a lot of trouble for even owning these, okay? You think guys who possess child porn go to prison for a long time? This would put me under the prison for life. If you want to see those episodes, then I need the money. Are we doing business here, or what? I handed him the money, and he popped the cassette tape in and walked away. Not joining me? I asked. Not for another five hundred bucks, kid. I heard the curtain rustle as the show began. Episode 9 gave us a recap of the trial and then the storming of the stage. When the show started, I noticed a distinct lapse in film quality. Whoever was operating the cameras was much shorter than their usual crew and they seemed barely able to handle the heavy rig. Finally, the camera had Robert into frame, and he began to fill us in on what was happening in the village. It's been about three days since Marco's trial and his escape. Since then, Fox Village has been separated from our village. They took most of the brown mice with them, and now they try to raid us every night for food. Something's going on over there. We heard shouts this morning, and... But at that point, the shouts got louder and Robert ran off-screen as the camera tried to follow him. We came to the edge of Red Fox Village. Many of the huts that were once on the verge have been burnt out, making a kind of barricade between them and the rest of the village. Many voices were cheering as something swung from the tree. At first I thought it was an effigy, a dummy maybe, but then I realized that it was Corrine. She swung like a grotesque wind chime in the space between the villages, and Robert shouted for Marco to stop being a coward and come out. Some of the kids were crying, but everyone on the other side cheered and shouted traitor or faithless at the swinging body of Corrine. I sat, glued to the TV, unsure if any of this was even real. It was night when the next recording resumed. It seems that whoever was running the camera wanted us to see a raid. The night vision on the cameras showed kids with torches fighting over kids who were leaving their storehouse in a hurry. The kids with torches hacked at them with machetes, blood flying as they connected, and some of them dropped as they were stabbed or hacked to pieces by the blades of the other children. The rest of the episode was mostly uneventful. Lots of shaky cam, lots of crying, and at one point... 
Someone dropped it and didn't pick it up for several minutes. As the episode ended, I was left looking at my own stark face looking back at me. What had I just watched? There was no way that could be the same show. Things had gone very Lord of the Flies in the village, and as the tenth episode started, I wasn't sure what to expect. Episode ten started without preamble. There was no recap, no theme music, and the footage looked unedited. We see a much more professional camera crew and Chris Mandworth trying to bring some order back to the island. They're coming up through the shallows. Chris and about ten adults coming up in the dark towards the village. Chris was talking about how this had gotten out of hand and how they were going to try to rescue the children. As they came into the seemingly empty village, Chris cupped his hands and began to shout at the empty huts. He told them that the game was over and that it was time they went home. He told them there was a boat that would take them home. Still no response. He moved deeper into the collection of straw huts, the fires burning low around them. And that was when they struck. Kids with spears and machetes came screaming out of the darkness, and the cameramen backpedaled furiously as the adults were taken completely by surprise. Blood flew, legs were sawed off as the pint-sized savages hacked and chopped, and Chris Mansworth was buried under a pile of children as he screamed and flailed. As the cameraman tripped and went down, we see the shadows of children staring over him as the spears came down. The episode ended abruptly. I was speechless. What the hell had happened to him? These were kids that had been doing challenges and making friends. The rivalry between Robert and Marco had always been the most serious part of the show, but now they had evolved into savages. The eleventh episode was about ten minutes long. It opened on a stationary camera shots of the same space that had held the trial. Marco was on his knees before the camera, and he looked bad. His left eye was a puffy mass of bruised tissue. His left ear was a bleeding stump. His nose looked to be cut jaggedly. He was weeping silently, and his tears were thick and bloody. Robert stood behind him. He had always worn a white football jersey in every episode I'd seen him in, but the garment was stained red and brown now. He bled from several places on his chest, and when he raised his machete, it was with obvious pain. This morning, before the sun had risen, this dog attempted to attack our village. He violated the rules of war as agreed upon by he and I. We agreed to a battle between our two villages at dawn. This snake tried to attack us in the night, and lost. Thus, his village is forfeit. As the winner, I sentence him to death. Please, Robert. Chris Mansworth's voice can be heard off screen. The show is over. You can all go home now, back to your parents. It doesn't have to end like this. As Marco cried his terrible tears, Robert looked at Chris off screen and turned back to Marco. The show is over. This is our home now. He brought the machete down. Marco cried out and fell face first to the ground. Robert fell on him, hitting him with the machete again and again. Blood sprayed from the struggling child, and when Robert looked back to the camera, his face was splattered in gore. He reached out, and the camera went off abruptly. The last episode was only a few minutes. It started with a shaky cam journey through the jungle. The runner was being pursued. I could hear the footsteps behind him. As the runner got to the shore, he jumped into something and pushed out into the water. The wooden deck of a boat came into view, and as he drifted out, I could hear the oars working in the water. He set the camera on the seat, and as he rode, the faces of children could be seen in the surrounding jungle. Then, everything went dark. The tape clicked, and the TV went back to static. I left it in the VCR, and stumbled out of the back room. Reggie was sitting behind the counter, and looked up at me with something like sympathy. He held something back towards me, and I saw it was money. 
I shook my head and stepped away from him. I had bought a ticket, and I had paid the price. You gonna be okay? He asked. Yeah. So, what happened to the kids? They just left him there? Reggie shrugged. Coast Guard picked Chris Mansworth up two days later. He was drifting in the ocean and looked extremely rattled. He wouldn't tell them how he had gotten out there or where he'd been. When he got back, he gave the tapes to the studio, and the next time anyone saw him, he was dead. And the kids? The studio never pursued the show. They never sold the aired episodes. They never even tried to air what Chris brought back. They just made the whole thing disappear. I suppose there's an island out there full of kids who went to be on a TV show and never came back. Their parents were likely told that they'd been in an accident or something. The whole thing was hushed up, and eventually, people forgot. You'll forget one day, too. He added, as though it might help. As I lay in my bed now, trying to forget the horrible things I saw, I hope I do forget. But I doubt I ever will. So if you happen to find an island out in the Pacific, maybe one full of locals that just don't look right, turn your boat back out to sea. Those natives are not friendly. My college degree is about as useful as a broken foot, but I chose to study journalism, and the consequences are mine to accept. Still, in a time when award-winning reporting amounts to a listicle about ten foods to avoid if you want to cut belly fat, it's hard to care about your craft. I started caring again when I got a strange, terrifying lead from my former classmate, Dave Jensen. A formal write-up will never get published, but I owe you an account of what happened. As far as I know, the seamstress is still out there, still searching for her next pound of flesh. Is my journalism degree any more useful now than it was before I heard about the seamstress? No. But maybe my legacy lies in creating this warning. Maybe by writing this, I can save even one person from the gruesome fate of getting their skin unstitched from their body. Did you hear about the kid who shoved his arm down a garbage disposal? Dave had an eager way about him, an obsession with sensational breaking news, a bad habit of setting a grim stage for the day before you had your morning coffee. It was 7.30 a.m. I had just rolled out of bed. You really have to stop doing that, Dave. Stop doing what? He was legitimately confused. I knew, thanks to the three warping dots that indicated he was typing, deleting his message, typing again, but it dawned on him, and he sent a response. Right. I always forget. Several years back, Dave had been the one to tell me about the ghost ship fire. It was an artist collective built inside a warehouse, a maze-like makeshift hovel filled with flammable things like window and bed frames, railings, pianos, motorhomes, tapestries, sculptures, and even tree stumps. A spiral stairway was constructed from wood pallets that led up to a loft, into which more fuel was piled. It seemed that anything flammable the residents could find, they brought inside. The deadbeat proprietors of the place hosted an electronic house music concert, inviting dozens of people. No sprinkler systems, no exits marked, no safety measures in place. The fire had an unknown cause. Thirty-six people died. The morning it happened, I had been making a bagel with cream cheese, which was interrupted by Dave calling to break the brutal news. Now he was back at it again. I took the opportunity to remind him of my boundaries. As a general rule, I don't want to hear about kids putting their arms down garbage disposals before 9 a.m. Fair, but it's in your neck of the woods. Maybe this will be your big break. He piqued my interest, so I called him. It's the weirdest thing, said Dave. His words buzzed through the line. 
I mean, Christ, shoving your arm down a garbage disposal? The kid was a pitcher on the high school baseball team. Uh, Kyler Coleman's his name. Big leagues were scouting him, apparently. And it was his throwing arm. My stomach lurched. What else have you heard? I asked. Only that it's not the first time. He put his other arm down a garbage disposal, too? No, I... I meant he's not the first kid to maim himself. It's happened to eleven other kids, too. At least according to what I've found so far. All of them between the ages of twelve and seventeen. Different body parts, different methods of violence. I opened my laptop. The people in that town... Continued Dave. They've called it an epidemic. Epidemic was one of those words you knew, even if you didn't have an exact definition. But I typed it in to remind myself. A widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. I, I don't get it, I said. It, it's a disease? An infection of the mind, said Dave. That's what some called it. No one's taking the kids seriously. Just writing it off as them being nuts. Sending them to the nut house for a bit, and pushing it under the rug. How about the police? I asked. From what I can tell, they did the bare minimum, said Dave. The town's called, if you want to learn more. I didn't recognize that name, but after typing it into Google, I saw that it was about 45 minutes outside the city. I'm going, I said. Convinced already, huh? Yeah. I'm not interested in repackaging Wikipedia articles on Medium anymore. Maybe it'll be my big story. Who knows? I should get ready. I stood up and made my way toward the shower. Thanks for the lead, Dave. No problem. He said. Look, Kay, I know you're a lone wolf, but be careful. This whole thing's a freaky, man. The kids are chalking it up for, lack of a better word, an urban legend. An urban legend. They call her the seamstress, said Dave. They remove their flesh for her in various ways, offering it as tribute. That way, the thinking goes, she won't come for the rest of your family. My stomach lurched again. Too much information. Too early in the morning. Just the facts, said Dave. But I thought you should know about some of the anecdotal stuff. This stuff's wild. Cold calling, in my experience, is almost always a recipe for disaster. People don't like Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on their door with the latest issue of The Watchtower. They don't like snooping amateur journalists, either. If Kyla Coleman's parents had been home, I probably would have been read the riot act and told to get off their porch. But it was just him. I rang the doorbell, and he answered. He was a bit over six feet tall, athletic-looking, black buzz cut. Everything was intact aside from his amputated right arm. I knew it was him at once. Hi there. Are you Kyler? Who's asking? He looked skittish. It didn't match up with his broad chestedness, his confident posture. In another lifetime, he would still be a carefree seventeen-year-old star athlete. Whatever caused him to stick his arm down a garbage disposal had changed him forever. My name is Kate Hunter, I said. I run an online blog. You're a reporter. A freelancer. Kyler glanced down at his missing arm. I already told the cops what happened, he said. I was hoping to ask you a few more questions. Kyler looked up and down the street. He was worried almost paralyzed by anxiety. It didn't add up. It was a suburban street lined with cookie-cutter houses, white picket fences, and carefully sculpted front lawns. The birds were chirping, the sun was out, but Kyler's expression made it seem like we were standing in the middle of a war zone. Come in before anyone sees us, he said. He closed the door behind me and led me to the living room. The house was a split level, extensively remodeled. Kyler's parents made a good amount of money, or at least they spent like they did. The fancy furniture made that blatantly obvious. 
Do you want water or anything? He asked. Sure, water would be great. He went to the kitchen. I heard the sound of the ice dispenser and the faucet. I set up my things. Kyler came back and handed me the glass. Then he dropped onto the cloud-like couch, the overstuffed cushions wheezing beneath his large athletic frame. He looked exhausted. It didn't fit a person as young as him. God willing, he had sixty or seventy more years of life to look forward to. I'll talk to you, he said, sitting up. But you have to promise me you won't try to change her mind. Whose mind? I asked. Sarah Felton, he said. She has to offer tribute. It's too late now. Sarah Felton? I asked. Offer tribute? I don't think I follow. Sarah is next on the list, said Kyler. The seamstress needs a pound of flesh from her. It's either one pound or... He paused, his eyes focused on something I couldn't see. Or however much the skin of Sarah's entire family weighs. Kyler turns back to me, grave sincerity in his expression. Don't try to stop her. Sarah's already marked, so it's too late. But maybe if you do a write-up or something, I don't know, maybe others won't have to suffer. It was a lot to take in, so I decided to do what I did best. I listened. Do you mind if I record this, Kyler? No, he said. You definitely should. I set down my phone and started recording. If you wouldn't mind, just say once more that I have your consent to record our conversation. You do, he said. I mean, you have my permission. Okay, but why don't you? It all started last summer, Kyler said. Looking out the window, I saw her in the yard. It was a Thursday, the seamstress. There she was. Standing in the moonlight, smiling that big, ugly smile of hers. Who is the seamstress? I asked. A monster, he said. If she barks you, you have to act fast. Within 48 hours, you have to make your tribute and leave it in the spot where you saw her. What does she look like? I asked. Like a nightmare, replied Kyler. You know, Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat? I did, but it was older than Kyler. I didn't know a kid still read Lewis Carroll or looked at his psychedelic drawings. The only reason I heard about the Cheshire Cat, said Kyler, as if reading my mind, is because that's what her smile looks like. The seamstress is pretty normal looking until she opens her mouth. Beautiful, even... Which is why we trust her at first. She has pale, blonde hair, pale as moonlight, pale skin to match. Her eyes glow like twin stars, but when she opens her mouth... I waited for Kyler to finish his next words to avoid muddying them with my interpretation. Her teeth are needles, said Kyler. Not like needles. Actual needles. Thousands and thousands of them. She sews flesh with her mouth. I took a drink of the water Kyler had given me. The crispiness of it brought me back to reality. I looked at what remained of Kyler's arm, wondering more about how he'd lost it. You should have seen my coach, Kyler said, studying the hand and fingers that weren't there. He was sobbing. You were going to the MLB. You had such a bright future. But the adults don't realize it it isn't a choice. If the seamstress shows up outside your house at night, you better give her your flesh within two days. Forty-eight hours, like I said. You have to pay tribute, or she takes your whole family. I don't mean to be insensitive, I said. But how do you know your family will be taken if you don't... Uh, 
if you don't pay tribute. Because Sam Billingston, said Kyla. What happened to Sam? He got marked, said Kyla. He was one of the first, but he said it was just a story. Thought we were hurting ourselves for no reason. Kyler drew a deep breath. Then he grabbed my water and took a drink, letting it sit in his mouth for a moment before swallowing. I grew up with Sam, he said. I knew his family, and the seamstress skinned them all like it was nothing. And it was for nothing, too. Because Sam blew his head off with his dad's shotgun a few weeks later. The back of my neck began itching suddenly, as though an insect had skittered across it. I clapped my hands to it. Nothing there. Kyler was watching me, so I pretended to massage the muscles, then cleared my throat. Can you tell me more about the night you lost your arm? My parents go to bed early, said Kyler. Around nine, my little brother does also. It had almost been two days by then. I put it off as long as I could. But I saw the seamstress outside both nights. So I knew I had to be brave. And I saw the stitch marks on my right forearm. The stitch marks? Yeah, says Kyler. Bone white, like a scar drawn in chalk. One line, three others crossing through it. It's her sign. The seamstress puts it on whatever body part she wants. Then you have to take care of the rest. That night, he continued, I went downstairs, thought about what I could use. This kid in my grade, Phil Thomas, used his dad's bandsaw to cut off his foot. This girl, Lindsay Mayfield, she almost ran out of time, didn't know what to use. So she cut out a big chunk of her stomach with her mom's cooking scissors. It ended up being enough, and the seamstress left her family alone. But Lindsay has to shit into a bag now. I sat in silence, completely stunned. Kyler was desensitized. Lindsay went too deep, he said. Screwed up her guts, hence, you know, the bag. Tell me more about what happens to you, I said, wanting more than anything to shift the subject away from Lindsay Mayfield. I almost ran out of time, too, Kyler continued. But right as the sun started coming up, I thought of my mom and my dad, my brother, about wanting them to be safe. And I went through with it. I grabbed a huge bottle of hydrogen peroxide. My mom had always used it to clean scratches and stuff. Then I turned on the disposal and jammed my arm down into it, pouring in hydrogen peroxide with my free hand. I'd never felt anything so painful, but I fought back the urge to stop and kept pressing down until I hit the elbow joint. Right near the end, said Kyler. My mom came downstairs, hearing the sound of screaming and the grinding disposal. She fainted. It was lucky because... When my dad came down, he went to her rather than trying to stop me. I got a trash bag from under the sink where he kept them and reached into the drain, pulling out what was left to my arm. I remember seeing the peroxide bubbling up from it, frothing over, spilling through my fingers and onto the ground. I got most of it into the bag, stumbled outside and left it near where the seamstress had been standing. As unsettled as I was... I was also captivated. I'd never heard anything like this. Kyler's description of the seamstress and his conviction that she existed was terrifying. When I woke up, finished Kyler, I was in a hospital. My arm was gone. They cauterized the stump. They said I was lucky I didn't bleed to death. But my family was safe. It was worth it. Outside, a car pulled into the driveway. You should go, Kyler said. My dad's going to be pissed when he finds out you're interviewing me. I, I said, 
I'm so sorry for what happened to you, Kyler. He shook his head. Don't be. It sucks before, and it sucks while it's happening. But then the seamstress leaves and goes to bother somebody else. I'm thankful, honestly. Don't feel sorry for me. It's Sarah Felton you should feel sorry for. The front door opened. Kyler's dad was standing there. He looked furious. I wondered how many aspiring journalists like me had come to interview his son. He knew who I was and why I'd come, even at a glance. Please leave, he said, and I did. Kyler snuck through the side door of his house and ran out to meet me just as I started up my car. Remember, he said, about Sarah. Don't try to stop her. Just leave. Do your write-up. Warn people about this and tell the truth. But Sarah has to pay tribute. The seamstress already marked her. How do you know? I asked. We have a discord, he said, for survivors and for people who the seamstress has marked. Sarah was marked a day and a half ago. We coached her, told her she doesn't have a choice. She has to do it tonight or her whole family dies. I resolved to find out where she lived. You're not listening to me, said Kyler. If you try and stop her, you're responsible for her whole family dying. He reached through the window with his good arm with considerable strength and grabbed my collar and wrenched me toward the window. His eyes were wide with terror, like a rabbit caught in a snare. I put the car in reverse. Kyler started hyperventilating. He held on as long as he could, but eventually lost his grip, doing a sad pirouette in the driveway as he spun to the ground. He began sobbing. He looked utterly helpless, and I hated myself for not doing him the courtesy of promising that I'd leave town. But I couldn't. I had to stop Sarah. The kids were too young to continue maiming themselves. As I drove away, I saw that Kyler's dad had come out. He was attempting to hug his son, to pull him to his feet. Kyler pushed him back weakly with his remaining hand. His dad began sobbing as well. I spent the rest of the day hunting down Sarah's address. I searched social media feeds. I found her profile, saw her in pictures with her friends, but I couldn't find an address. Morning led the afternoon. Afternoon fell towards twilight. I watched the sun creep across the sky toward the western hills on the town's outskirts as time ticked by. Night wasn't far off. As far as I knew, Sarah was already preparing to strip the flesh from whatever body parts the seamstress had marked. I went to a diner, ordered a coffee to fight back against my exhaustion, and called Dave. Dave, the, the kids, they're hurting themselves, and they think the seamstress is after them. The urban legend you mentioned. Slow down, Kate. Shut up and listen, Dave. I need your help. A girl, her name is Sarah Felton. All I have is my phone and no clue how to find out where she lives. I'm at my computer. Dave replied. Hold on a sec. I picked up my coffee my hand shaking, the hot liquid spilling out of the cup and running down my arm. Coffee was the last thing I needed, but I had to stay awake, to stay alert, to save Sarah. Anything? I asked. People around the diner had begun to take notice of me. A man sitting at the bar, a waitress who just brought him a burger and fries, the line cook staring out from beneath the rectangular order window, and the kitchen on the other side. James and Marcia Felton, said Dave. Daughter, Sarah, 15 years old. Dave was the best investigative reporter I knew. Just as unemployable as I was, but exponentially skilled at finding things. I had no idea how he found Sarah, and I didn't care. Any other Feltons in... Not that I can see, said Dave. Take a deep breath, Kate. If the girl's in trouble, it's not going to help if he smashed through her living room window. 
I listened. I tried to breathe normally, to calm my frayed nerves. I pushed the coffee cup away and drank my water instead. Then I looked out the window. The amber magic hour light was gone. Darkness was descending. I raised my hand and snapped at the waitress. She came over. Don't be pushy, she said. Can I get my check, please? For a two dollar coffee? I pulled out a twenty and left it on the table, then rushed out. Still with me, Kate? I had forgotten that Dave was on the line. Yeah, I said. Text me the address. I'm heading over. Sarah Felton's house was too far away. Twenty-five minutes, according to Google Maps, far on the other side of town. I drove faster, hoping I wouldn't get pulled over. I swerved past cars that were driving too slow and threw yellow to red lights. Everything seemed to stand in my way, but I fought against each roadblock, keeping the girl at the front of my mind. After pulling out a winding private road, I saw it. A tall, three-story Victorian mansion. Remembering what Dave said about not smashing through the living room window, I slowed down and parked near the end of the driveway. I ran along in the darkness. I remembered the seamstress, her mouth made of needles, always watching her next mark. But I couldn't see anyone in the shadows. It was just me and the jackhammer feeling of my heart doing its best to burst through my chest. I got to the front door. I straightened my clothes, wiped the sweat from my face. Then I rang the doorbell. I looked down at my watch. 7.01 p.m. Night had arrived. I rang the doorbell again, and a minute later, a man answered. He scanned me with his eyes. Can I help you? Hi, there. Uh, is Sarah home? The man, Sarah's dad, raised an eyebrow. My name is Kate Hunter, I said. I'm a journalist. Why do you want to talk to Sarah? I need to warn her, I said, to stop her. She's going to hurt herself. His expression turned serious. I think you'd better go. Without stopping to think, I pushed past him and ran inside. He grabbed my shirt, stopping me, pulling me back toward him. I ripped away, and my shirt sleeve tore off, staying in his hand. What the hell is wrong with you? He yelled. Marcia, call the police. I didn't stop. I kept running. I circled to the kitchen, the TV room, another fancy lounge area, its back wall lined with expensive bottles of booze, but there was no sign of a fifteen-year-old girl. Sarah's dad chased me through the house, gaining on me, understanding the layout better than I did. I heard the sound of a door slamming shut overhead. I ran back to the entryway, from which a massive staircase led up to the second floor, Sarah's dad clutching at my heels. I heard the sound of her mom frantically yelling into the phone, telling the police about a crazy woman who'd broken into their house. I reached the second floor hallway, looking left and right. I saw that the doors were all open. I made my way to the third floor. At the end of the hallway, I saw a closed door, a sliver of light shining from beneath it. I ran toward it and grabbed the knob, locked. Sarah's dad finally caught up to me, grabbing my arm and yanking me back. What the hell is wrong with you? The door, I said. It's locked. Listen, send me to jail after this. I don't care. But if you have any love for your daughter... He tried the knob. It wouldn't budge. He began banging on the wood. Sarah, open up. I heard the sound of crying on the other side. It's too late. I'm sorry. She's already here. Sarah, hold on, I said. We can help you. The sound of a foot meeting solid wood cut off my words. Sarah's dad had lifted his leg, attempting to kick down the door again and again. Finally, the door smashed off its hinges, revealing Sarah. She was standing near her open window. As I went into the room, she started making her way out onto the roof. I noticed that one end of a rope was attached to her leg. The other end was attached to something else. I went after her. Sarah had reached the edge of the roof. 
I saw that the rope was attached to a thick tree branch, three feet in diameter. The tree was massive, as old as the property, fifty feet tall at least. I swayed, realizing how high up we were. Sarah, please, we can get you help. She's here, Sarah sobbed. I told you, it's too late. She crept closer to the edge of the roof. Sarah! Her mom and dad, looking out from her bedroom window, both of them pleading together. Honey, please come back inside. Come away from the ledge. I saw the look of determination in Sarah's eyes. There was no going back. I went closer, almost reaching her, until the sight of something stopped me. I saw a woman standing in the moonlight at the base of the old tree. Her blonde hair and skin were just as silvery and pale as the moon. Her eyes, like Kyler Coleman said, glowed like twin stars. She opened her mouth, a Cheshire cat smile. Even at a distance, my vision seemed to zoom in. The seamstress's teeth were needles, thousands of them. Like the action of a sewing machine, they rose and fell, looking for something to stitch. Do you see? asked Sarah. I don't have a choice. Wait. But it was too late. Sarah had already stepped off the edge of the roof, plummeting toward the ground forty feet below. The darkness swallowed her. I heard a snapping noise, a cry of pain, and a grunt. The tree branch creaked under the strain of Sarah's body hitting the end of the rope. I ran past Sarah's parents, down the stairs, and outside. I followed the sound of groaning, letting it lead me through the darkness. Then, I saw her. Sarah was lying on the ground, her body twisted unnaturally. The first thing I saw was her collarbone. It was broken. It stuck out through her neck at a diagonal, 45-degree angle. I went to her. Bending down, I saw the gleaming ball of her hip joint. Her leg was gone, torn away from her body. But the thing that terrified me most wasn't Sarah's mangled body or her non-existent leg. It was the noose swaying in the night breeze, a few shreds of flesh hanging from it like witch hair moss. There was no leg to speak of. Do you? Sarah groaned. Do you see? I followed Sarah's eyes. Backing away into the darkness was the seamstress. She seemed to be chewing on Sarah's severed leg, her needle teeth running up and down it, exploring the flesh, tasting it, savoring it, unstitching it from the bone beneath. The next several hours passed in a blur. The paramedics came. They saved Sarah's life. I overheard them talking about how she broke her back, that she couldn't move her remaining leg. Her parents clutched each other, wrapped in blankets provided by the EMTs. The cops cuffed me, put me in a cruiser, and drove to the station. But my stay was short. The next morning, Dave picked me up, having driven the whole night after I called him. In the time since then, I followed Sarah's case. News cycles came and went. Sarah's accidents had paralyzed her from the waist down. Not long after being admitted to a psych ward, she was released and went home to live with her parents. They could have pressed charges. There was speculation that some insane amateur journalist had pushed Sarah from the third floor of her home. But surprisingly, Sarah's parents came to my defense, saying that I'd only tried to help her. I think about what happens to Sarah every night when the moon comes up. I think about the kids in that small pastoral town, wondering if the seamstress had finally satisfied her hunger, if Sarah was the last victim. But looking out my window at night, I see that Cheshire cat smile. In the moonlight, 
I see a mouthful of needles, rising and falling, starving for a fabric of human flesh. My grandfather isn't the type of man who is particularly communicative. Actually, he barely bothers to speak at all, unless it's a grunt of satisfaction aimed at a piece of pork chop, or a prod to turn the TV channel back to golf. My mother says he's just selective with his words. I prefer to call him what he is. A dick. He's always been this way. Even when I was an adorable little toddler teetering my way around his living room, he barely acknowledged me. He would just sit in his plush armchair and read the paper, ignoring my squeals of delight as I practiced my dance recital in front of him. Papa! Papa, look! I would squawk in his direction. He would just shift his newspaper higher in his lap to hide me from view. It was always Grandma who offered me any sort of grandparent-related comfort. She doted on me throughout my childhood. Pinching my cheeks, baking me cookies, cooing at every sound or accomplishment that I made. So when she passed away last spring, I was heartbroken. Apparently, so was my grandfather. That's when my mother cooked up the idea for a granddaughter-grandfather bonding extravaganza. She shipped me off to live with him for two weeks during summer vacation while she took a honeymoon with her new husband. Even though I'm fifteen and purely capable of staying alone for two weeks, my mother just couldn't resist the opportunity to kickstart the grandfatherly affection that should have taken place the day I popped out of the womb. You'll have fun, honey, she said earnestly, as she practically kicked me out of the moving car. He doesn't even talk, I yelled in frustration. Yes, he does, my mother rolled her eyes. You just have to listen. The first week and a half ticked by pretty much like I expected. We ignored each other in gruff silence and ate our meals separately, him in front of the TV and me in the guest bedroom. It wasn't until the last night of my visit that I got up in the middle of the night to piss, only to find a light shining from his bedroom. Curious, I peeked out from around the corner. My grandfather was sitting in his armchair, a glass of scotch in his hand and eyes puffy from tears. His gaze was trained toward the air vents next to his bed. I wish you were still here, he whispered. I could barely hear him over the clink of ice in his glass. You wish who were here? I asked, lightly stepping forward. He gazed up towards me, and he beckoned me to sit down on the edge of the bed. I balanced myself on the edge and looked back at him nervously. I don't think we've ever sat this close next to each other. Wordlessly, he handed me the glass of scotch. I took a sip and let the liquid bite my tongue, sending shivers down my spine. I handed it back to him. I think it's time you know about my sister, he murmured. This is his story, in his words. I know you don't think very highly of me. I don't think very highly of me either. Honestly, there are a lot of things I would change if I could. You're young, but you'll understand that one day. My parents and I lived here ever since I was a little boy. Back then, after the war, this place was like a castle. I loved living here. This was actually my room, believe it or not. And for an eight-year-old boy, it was my kingdom. I used to pretend that my mother and father were the king and queen, and I was a prince. I would rule over my stuffed animals as if they were subjects. My parents actually encouraged it. They thought it was cute. My mother was a homemaker. Back then, most women were. So she was always around to cook and clean and play my childish games with me. My father was different. He was attentive when he was home, but he was rarely home. See, he was a preacher. He was a man of faith. When you are young, you just trust your parents. You take them on their word, and you believe what they say, and you have no reason to consider otherwise. So when they told me to go to church three times a week, I dutifully followed through. It was fun being the preacher's son. 
My mother and I always seemed to bathe in a heavenly glow wherever we went. People knew us as the perfect family, a family of faith and God and virtue. My father was known as a man of God, someone the community should trust in. So when father told me to ignore the sounds coming from the attic, I did. I first noticed the sounds the day we moved in. I was sleeping when I heard a muffled cry coming from the air vent. The cry was immediately silenced with a dull thud. I fell back to sleep instantly. For the next few weeks, I would hear the occasional pitter-patter of footsteps or the offbeat thud in the middle of the night. My father told me that we had rats. I learned to grow accustomed to the random spurts of noise, much as children do. Then, one night, I was playing in my room when I should have been sleeping. I held my fake sword up to my stuffed animals and pretended to knight them. I was asking them to bow down to me when I heard it. Hello? The voice was a muffled echo, barely reaching my ears. It was a girl's voice. I think that's why I paid it so much attention. I wasn't allowed to have girls in the house. Someone there? The voice echoed again. I realized at this point that it was coming from the air vent next to my bed. I quickly scrambled towards it, letting my fake sword clatter to the floor. Who's there? I asked, using the bravest voice I had. I'm Polly. I live in attic. It's then that I noticed how childish the voice sounded. How strained it was. I bent my head closer to the vent. You, my brother? The voice asked. I'm not sure. Are you my sister? I countered. Oh no. Daddy says I have brother who won't let me see him. Why not? Daddy says something wrong with me. Is there? I can't think real good. Oh, who's your father? I asked. Michael Larson. That's my father, I yelled excitedly. That means you must be my sister if we have the same father. That how it works? I think so, but I guess I don't really know. I don't know either. We were silent for a little while. Why do you live in the attic? I finally asked, the question burning the roof of my mouth. Daddy say I can't leave because I'm not like everyone else. So you've never been outside? Don't think so. Polly said nervously. Not allowed to talk about it. Oh. I sat back on the bed, puzzled. I'm... I... uh, I'm gonna go to bed. I said, hesitantly, into the air vent. Oh. Okay. Polly answered back, her voice faltering, and for moments I thought she was going to cry. But... uh, but uh, I'll be back, I said urgently, trying to calm her down. You will? Of course. I'm your brother, I assured her. And I, your sister. The next morning I woke up excitedly. Not only was it Saturday, but I had a sister. I bounded down the stairs, two at a time, eager for breakfast. Like every Saturday, my mother had laid out a full breakfast spread for us. After Father led us in our morning prayer, I dug into the steaming pancakes and sausages on my plate. Whoa there, champ. My father laughed as he watched me shovel the food into my mouth. What's the rush? I want to finish quickly so I can go play with my sister, I explained through a bite of toast. My mother's face went stone gray, as if she had just seen a ghost. My father clenched his jaw and very carefully put down his fork and knife. They didn't make a sound. MJ, he said, 
with an edge he couldn't hide. You don't have a sister. I looked up from my plates, confused. I, yes, I do. She lives- Enough! My dad roared, pounding the table with his fist. My mother was now looking down at her hands folded neatly in her lap. I saw a small tear fall onto her plate. Can't you see you're making your mother upset with your lies? He hissed. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. Go to your room this instant, MJ, he demanded. And if you try to lie to us again, I promise you, you will never get to leave your room. I pushed back my chair and ran from the table, hot, messy tears sliding down my face. I threw myself onto my bed and cried at the unfairness of it all. After a few minutes, I heard her. You okay? Polly asked. Anger flared in my chest. No! I spat bitterly. I got in trouble, and it's all your fault. What happened? I could hear her concern, but I didn't care. I told my dad that I had a sister, and he yelled at me and grounded me. I hiccuped between sobs. You told Daddy we talked. She said in a panicked voice. Kinda? You shouldn't do that. I could hear her voice trembling. I'm going to be in real trouble. He would kill me. Yeah, well, you deserve it. I screamed at the air vents. You ruined my whole day. I was fine before I met you. I could now hear Polly crying through the vent. I thought her muffled sobs would make me feel better, but they only made me feel worse. Guilt bubbled in my stomach. I put a pillow over my head to drown out her crying. I must have fallen asleep, because when I woke up, the pillow was on the floor, and I could hear Polly again. But this time, she wasn't alone. No. No. She whimpered. How did you find a way to talk to him? Her voice hissed at her. I immediately sat up, my heart pounding in my ears. I knew that voice. No. No, I'd be good. I'd be good. Polly cried back. I could hear a thump, and Polly cried out. I pressed my ear closer to the vent. I talked to no one. You're lying. My father's voice yelled back. No, I... I do it. I don't lie. I heard another thump, and now Polly was crying loudly. I shivered as I listened to what was happening above my head. You better be a good little girl. My father replied. You know what happens when you're a bad girl. Please, please, no, I could... I very good. Take your clothes off. No, no, I don't lie. Polly's voice was interrupted by another slap. I heard her cry out and had to clamp my hands over my mouth so I wouldn't either. You heard me. My father challenged. Take your clothes off. I sprinted from my bedroom and ran all the way downstairs. A part of me really hoped to see my dad sitting in the living room when I rounded the corner. I prayed. I begged God that I would see my father sitting in his favorite chair. I prayed that I was just imagining things, that my creativity had gotten the better of me. But when I turned into the living room, I saw only my mother sitting rigidly on the sofa as she knitted. Mother, I said. Tears were still dripping from my face. Mother, where's father? I was shaking. She looked up at me with a sad smile. He's praying, darling. Are you telling the truth? Of course, dear, she said, but her eyes told me something different. Come on now, she said. Let's listen to something on the radio. Your favorite program should be starting soon. I took my seat beside her, and she turned the radio on. She hummed as she continued knitting her mouth pressed in a firm and tight line. She held the needles so tightly that her fingertips were turning white. I love your father, 
she said. I know, mother, I know. My father cut through the steak as if he was cutting through butter. The meat bled lightly, just how he liked it. Are you done lying, MJ? He asked, without looking up from his plate. Yes, sir, I am. I asked back. I let my imagination get the better of me. He smiled at me, and pointed his knife towards my mother. And what do you have to say to the woman who gave birth to you? My face flushed red. I'm sorry, mother. There's a good boy, he said, as he continued eating. I think you learned your lesson then. I did. The dinner talk then turns towards the church fundraiser happening the next week. My mother promised she would bake her famous pecan pie, and my father discussed who from Bible study would be attending. After dinner, I excused myself to my bedroom. Polly. I whispered into the air vent. I heard a small series of sniffling, as if she were crying. Guilt boiled in my chest. Polly, I'm sorry, I mumbled. Can you forgive me? I can. Polly replied. Are you okay? No. I looked around my room for a second. Well, whenever I'm sad, I like to play a game. I explained as I picked up my toy sword. Do you want to play with me? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'll be the prince, and you can be the princess. And we both have kingdoms that we can rule. Yours can be the attic, and mine can be my bedroom. Does that sound fun? I heard her sniffle. I be princess? Of course, I assured her. You can be anything you want to be. And that's how it started. With a game. We would wait until I heard my father go to sleep every night, and then we would give our secret code. I would tap the inside of the air vents twice, and if she could talk, she would tap right back. Then we knew it was safe to play. Some nights we would rule over our kingdoms, while other nights I would read her stories from one of my books. Some nights we would just talk. It was nice having her around. I grew accustomed to our routine, but, like all routines, sometimes they break. Sometimes I would tap into the air vents and hear nothing back except some weird groans and the occasional thud. When I would go downstairs, I would always see my mother knitting silently in the living room, knuckles white. Father was nowhere to be seen. That's how I knew he was in the attic with Polly. Polly didn't like to talk much after those times. What outside like? Polly asked one night. I was lying on my back, my head turned towards the air vent. I pondered for a second. It's big, I guess, I said lamely. But it's cold now because it's almost Christmas time. There's a lot of snow. What's snow like? You've never seen snow? No. Well, I said, uh, why don't I show you? Polly paused. I don't leave at it, ever. I sat up on my bed. Uh, what if you left just once? I can come and get you. I can take you outside so you can see the snow, and then I can take you back. Uh, Father won't have to know. Like, like, secret? Polly asked. I could hear the excitement bellow out of her. Outside, outside. She yelled, forgetting the hushed tones we normally used. I laughed. Yeah, let's do it. I screamed as I got caught up in the excitement. When? Polly yelled. We can go, right? Who are you talking to? My father interrupted. My face turned beet red as I turned from the air vents to face him. I was caught. I, uh, no one. I mumbled weakly. I'm just playing a game. 
My father's eyes wandered to where my stuffed animals were, shoved away into the corner, forgotten and abandoned. With who? He challenged. Uh, no one, sir. Uh, just myself. His face turned to stone, and he nodded gruffly at me. Carry on, then. Just try to keep it down. And he turned out the door. I nearly cried with relief that he had believed me. I waited a few minutes before I spoke again. Let's wait until he goes to bed. Then I can take you. I whispered. But I didn't get a response. Polly? I asked after a few more minutes. Polly, do you still want to go outside? No. My father's voice answered back. He doesn't. I clapped my hands over my mouth and bolted upright from my bed. MJ. Polly answered back weakly. Help. But I stood frozen. I didn't move when I heard thud after thud. I didn't move when Polly whimpered out for her brother. I didn't move when I heard my father smack her. And I still didn't move when the attic turned as silent as the snow outside. I stood there, in the middle of my room, with my hands balled into fists at my side. I stood there as I heard my father leave the attic, his steps staggered and heavy. I stood there as I saw the porch lights blink to life outside of the window. And I stood there as I watched my father digging all night long. In the morning, there was a raised patch of dirt under the maple tree that wasn't covered with snow like the rest of the backyard. And the air vent, the air vent was silent. My grandfather put down his glass and stared back towards the air vent. The room seemed heavier now. Her, her name was Polly? I asked. He nodded. Like you. He smiled weakly. When you were born, I asked your mother to name you Polly. Does she know why? She knows I had a sister. She doesn't know much else. I was silent for a second. What did you do after... after it happened? My grandfather looked down into his drink. Nothing. Just like what I did when it was happening. What was wrong with her? I asked slowly. Why did your father keep her locked away? He was silent for a moment before he took a swig of his drink. I think she had Down Syndrome, and I think my father was ashamed of that. He sighed. Grandpa, I'm... Don't, he interrupted. It's not necessary. We sat in silence for a few minutes, listening to the gentle hum of the air vent. Polly would have made a fine princess, I whispered. He smiled and for a second I could have sworn that I saw the flicker of what he had been like as an eight-year-old boy. Yes, he agreed. She would have. I'm pretty sure I live with a literary genius. A once-in-a-generation mind akin to Dickens or Shakespeare, with contents as dangerous as Robert Oppenheimer's or Salomon Rushdie's. Whereas Dickens and Shakespeare helped shape the world, though, Roy Bardicates would have no doubt ended it. Roy's stories and poems had readers laughing, crying, enraged, even sleeping at his whim. He'd set out a goal, then created a string of vowels and syllables with which he played his readers' hearts like musical instruments. His romance poetry had the most reserved of folk spontaneously professing undying love to bemused soon-to-be sweethearts. His tales of nation-forging heroism on the battlefield inspired more than one lad to drop out of university and enlist. 
His dramas thematically exploring death and loss left none who poured through them with dry eyes. Those times weren't what made me burn down our student accommodation while he was still inside, though. No. It was the stories he wrote after deciding he wanted to make people scream which did that. I've been in prison for a few years now. Arson and murder, in case you were wondering. This is it for me. It's worth it, though. I may be legally guilty, but my soul carries the weight of zero regrets. Sure, you could agree with the shrink and call me a walking delusional martyr complex. I don't care. I've made for the good of humanity. God knows what would have happened if those stories were ever published. As I said, Roy had a way with words. I met him in the first year, his room being next to mine in our flat. By the second, he and I were moving into a shared house with two others, Lisa and Ted, and coincidentally the latter's testimony to my outstanding character managed to knock all of two years from my sentence. Throughout our friendship, I could tell that Roy was different. No, not different. Different is the wrong word. Gifted. Yeah, let's go with that. He was gifted in a way that few have the privilege of encountering. At first, I felt lucky to know him. Word about the tall guy in the duffel coat who made the famous guest lecturer break down into floods of tears got around quickly. I don't want to reveal her name, uh, because I don't want any media hassle caused by a show trial when they sue for defamation. The public hate me too much for it to not be used to add another decade to my stretch. If the words vampire baseball mean anything to you, you'll be familiar with her work. Roy broke her after accusing her of being, in his words, a peddler of emotionally empty pig's will that's an insult to the trees which died for the paper it's printed on. When she'd challenge him to do better, he pulled out a napkin. He wrote a haiku. I never read it, but I saw the video of the famous guest lecturer reading it once, twice, and then throwing herself on the floor in hysteria. I laughed with Roy as she ran out of the room in the clip, wailing, It's too beautiful! It's too beautiful! over and over again, while the lecture hall howled and cackled along with us. And so it continued for the first six months or so. Roy would have drama and English-lit girls falling all over him. I'd be there with the closest available bed to his asexual brand of impenetrable genius. That all changed after the incident, though. It shocked the whole campus. About six or seven lads, one of them an underage visitor only down for the weekend, died at an after-party. Not died in a quiet yet tragic way, either. They died in the kind of way that meant journalists swarmed around our campus for a solid two months. The kind of way that caused over three dozen students to drop out the next day. One had killed two of the others. One jumped out a window. And there were rumors that the two survivors were so traumatized that they mutilated themselves. Nobody knows what happened exactly. But the university staff couldn't stop the photographs of the bloodshed and carnage left behind from being circulated around various WhatsApp and Facebook groups. I never saw the pictures myself. The sight of my future housemate Ted looking at his phone and instantly projectile vomiting across the room was enough for me to know my relatively squeamish stomach couldn't take it. I wish Roy had shown the same restraint. Probably a bad batch of acid or something, Ted had said, while Roy gazed at the phone in his hands. Either that or the others snapped when they saw what Luke did. I heard he cut. Could you send me those? Ted was as surprised by Roy's sudden interruption as I was. Uh, yeah, sure, he replied, shooting me a sidelong glance as he took the phone back from Roy. What do you want them for, though, buddy? Research, Roy muttered, already heading to his room. He had that face on, 
the face he always wore the nights before handing in an assignment which summoned gaggles of fawning female admirers to our flat. I should have twigged then that no good could come from that face mixing with those photos. I was too stoned at the time, though, and too content to get back to my Tekken match with Ted to worry about the activities of our pet genius. I didn't realize, but that night was the start of the nine-month countdown which would end with Roy dead, our flat burned to the ground, and me the monster of the week in the papers. The first three months were pretty unremarkable, if I'm honest. The first charges were in the fawning groupies Roy would attract to our living room. Guys started to appear alongside them, initially at least. The overall vibe of his acolytes changed too. Whereas before he'd lure bouncy art chicks, the tone of his ensemble realigned until I was trying to see Tekken over the shoulders of goth girls and sunken-eyed want-to-be Lovecrafts. However, after the first month or two, this crowd too started to shrink. The dwindling numbers of curvy goths and disheveled imitators wore increasingly harrowed, worried looks on their faces. The same expressions that the drama and literature girls I used to wake up with had worn when Roy's new artistic direction drove them away. I found out why about three months in. Roy was once more locked in his room, halfway through a days-long writing session. "'What's going on with him?' I asked Ted, jerking a thumb over my shoulder in the direction of Roy's room. "'I know he was always a shut-in, but I haven't seen him since Thursday. He stopped bringing girls over, too.' "'Yes, because that's what we should be concerned about,' Lisa butted in before Ted could reply, rolling her eyes. "'God forbid Rick the engineering student doesn't get laid.' "'Ha ha.' I let out a wry laugh. Yes, Lisa, very good. You got me. You figured out that it was I that hid the body in the floorboards. We all laughed at the in-joke for a few moments. Then Ted finally answered my question. I don't know, Rick. In all honesty, he's been off since, well, since those photos from that night in G-Block. The one with Luke McAllis. I know the ones you mean. That hit everyone, though. You can't tell me all my, I mean, all his, uh, friends, I guess, from his classes dropped out. Lisa shook her head. No, they're still there. Us journos have a shared lecture with the creative writing guys. Travel writing. Roy's stuff, lately. Uh, Ted, Rick, I think something is actually wrong with him. Lisa was leaning forward in the beaten-up living room chair, pleased she finally had an attentive audience for her concerns. The conversation lasted long into the night. It ended about 2 a.m., with the three of us stood outside Roy's bedroom. Roy? I hazarded, knocking softly on the door. Roy? It's Rick. Ted and Lisa are with me. Lisa was saying... Lisa grabbed me on the arm. She was shaking her head, eyes wide and afraid, crossing her open palms in the air to tell me to shtum. I mean, uh, you remember Rachel, uh, the girl from your course I got on with? That narrows it down. Ted chuckled quietly, prompting Lisa to deliver another shut-up arm jab. I rolled my eyes at Ted and kept speaking to Roy through the door. Well, buddy, I tried to catch up with her and invite her over, but she says she's uh, concerned, worried, uh, scared. Lisa nodded at me when I said the last one. Uh, yeah, she's scared, Roy. She said the stuff you've been reading in lectures recently has been... Uh, well, can we talk? I finished my speech, delivering in the same semi-condescending tone folk use when reprimanding thirteen or fourteen-year-olds who try to experience adulthood too early. There was a grunt from the other side of the door, but Roy didn't respond. This time, Lisa piped up. It's not just Rachel, Roy. Loads of your class have told me the stories you're writing are too much. People are on edge about the whole G-Block incident, you know? The response from the door's other side were clipped and impatient. Not my problem. If they were happy to kiss my ass when it was mushy romance stories or 
deep poetry, they should be happy to keep their lips on there when I'm trying to scare them. The three of us jumped. We hadn't heard Roy's footsteps, so it took us all completely by surprise when his bedroom door swung inwards as soon as the M in them left his lips. He stood in the doorway, grinning at us. Under his bloodshot eyes were deep purple bags. The room beyond was dark, save for the piercing glare of his laptop screen. What do you want? His gaze darted between the three of us. Although it hung around Lisa's nervous features a fraction longer than mine or Ted's. You want me to stop? Write something different? Go back to making the girls cross their legs and the boys jot down notes? Huh? All three of us in the hallway took a step back, but it was Lisa that spoke. No, Roy. It's just... Look, this piece you read last week in the travel writing lecture, the one about... The one about the blue desert, you mean? That I read about in... Yes, that one. Lisa shuddered, cutting Roy off. It freaks the hell out of me, Roy, and pretty much everyone else in the class. I've been having nightmares about it. Rick's not wrong. A lot of the guys on your course have told me about the twisted stuff you've read in other... Look, if they don't want to listen, they can leave. Roy's brow furrowed. His face did have a dash of concern, but nowhere near enough to distill the clear anger. I'll write what I want to write. Roy, a few months ago, there was a bloodbath on our campus. You saw the photos like I did. Loads of people aren't okay. If you're not, you can let us know. Ted surprised both Lisa and myself with this. He placed a hand on Roy's shoulder, which was quickly brushed aside. I'm fine. I'm just trying different stuff. As I said, I never asked them to listen. Makes no difference to me. We stood blinking at the door after he slammed it for a good thirty seconds. Well... Ted eventually broke the silence. I'd say that went well, don't you? The rest of the term continued in much the same way until we all went home for the summer. When we returned the following September, we were again living with Roy, although this time in our own rented flats above a small local shop. This had already been arranged months before Roy's strange turn of behavior. I found Lisa's protest annoying after a while, the constant messages in a private chat between the three of us. I got shirty with her more than once during the last couple weeks of August. The agreement is already signed. My thumbs hammered, lying on the bed at my mom's place on one of the last nights I'd ever spend there. There's nothing we can do about it now. Besides, he keeps himself in his room and he's got the money for rent. Is he really going to be any trouble? Roy didn't say much to us when he moved in his belongings. I was disappointed to see he still had that same tired, wild-eyed look on his face. My hopes that some time back home with his people would reinvigorate him weren't answered. He had less with him than when he'd moved into our old student flats the prior September. Some loose bedsheets, a bin bag full of clothes we could smell from the hallway and a couple of boxes he'd scrawled research on the side of in thick black marker. It was the three months between September and that Christmas, once we'd settled into our new place and the second year of university, that life with Roy started taking a much steeper decline. The first oddity was Roy's grades started falling off. Way off. He went from getting high 90s to single digits, and a lot of C-me's. I found this out vicariously, of course, through Lisa, who found out through Rachel, who still wasn't returning my messages. One time I'd managed to catch him on his daily journey from his room to the kitchen. Hey, buddy. You doing okay? Lisa said the feedback you've been getting from the lectures isn't too good. He'd stood in the kitchen for a good minute, staring at me. All I could think of was how awful he looked. The bags under his eyes had doubled in their depth and darkness. More red blood vessels had joined the network of them around his pupils. Roy had always been thin and a little on the pale side, but now he was gaunt. 
His pasty cheeks hung from his face, his features drooped and wax-like. I'm fine, he muttered, not really making eye contact. I'm just not wasting my best stuff anymore. I'm working on something, saving the good stuff for that. Okay, man. Still, could you at least have a shower? I had a date the other night and she noticed the smell. Roy shrugged. Sure. He didn't have a shower, or at least not one that I ever heard him take. The smell never left, but at least it never got worse either. It was a constant, a faint yet persistent whiff of gasoline and burned eggs that felt like it had sunk into the walls and carpet. I stopped trying to bring dates back to our place in the end. Ted and Lisa started dating about two months into that strange limbo period, so neither of them had the issue. Not that they didn't complain. More than once, I'd catch both Ted or Lisa either hammering on Roy's door and yelling about the smell, or marching up and down the shared living spaces, emptying cans of air fresheners. In addition to the smell and his grades, the other weirdness was Roy's following. He slowly started to gain it back. Despite only delivering half-finished work to his once adorning public in the lecture halls, his new flock was different. They were odds, but not in the try-hard way the fawning goth chicks and sullen imitators of the previous year were. The people that started knocking on our door, letting themselves in, and heading straight to Roy's room weren't even students. That was the only common thread. There were men, women, some much older than us, and others young enough that we debated phoning the police. If we were somewhere in the States where the age of consent is way higher, we would have done. I'll be honest, I don't think it was anything sexual. Sometimes the younger ones turned up with parents, fathers or mothers, or both. They always had the same furtive expression whether they were the homeless ones who smelled like piss, or the rich ones in crisp suits and ties. By the time December rolled around, he'd sometimes have as many as twelve or thirteen crammed into his tiny room at once. I'd listen at the door during these nightly meetings. This is how I know there was nothing sexual going on, although this wasn't as much of a relief as you'd think. In the grand scheme of things, I don't think it would have made what happened much worse. I couldn't hear exactly what was said, but all I ever heard was talking. Roy talking. He'd talk for hours on end, I assume reading from whatever the something he was working on was. Judging by what happened on the last nights before we once more returned home for a holiday break, I'd put money on my assumptions being right. I heard Lisa's scream before I'd seen anything. I had been in my room getting a little stoned and playing Tekken after a long day learning about rivets and gears. I threw myself into the hall to see Lisa stood in the doorway opposite mine, screaming so loud neighbors started banging on the walls. There was a man who stood in front of her, facing away from me. It was one of Roy's followers, one of the well-off ones in the crisp suits. Lisa was looking up at him, her face covered in tears, screaming as loud as she could on every exhale. I found out why her screams couldn't stop when I put my hand on a crisp blue suit shoulder. When the man turned around to face me, I started screaming with her. He'd taken out his eyes. Wetness was running down his cheeks, just like Lisa's although this wetness was a dark red crimson. Eyelids flapped uselessly in front of gaping, empty voids, voids that would have been pitch black were it not for the faint Merlot hue of the flesh within. He was at least a foot taller than me, which did nothing to help the sudden onset of knee-buckling panic. I passed out, eventually. The goatee on his otherwise smooth face was distended, stretching around something held beneath his pursed lips. Consciousness left me the moments they peeled apart. Staring down at me, from between his white teeth, was a pair of socketless, blood-soaked eyeballs. By the time I came to, 
The police were already poking around the flat. Ted and Lisa had hoisted me onto the couch after Ted, who was luckily drunk beyond belief, smashed a bottle over the eye-eating man's head and phoned 999. I was offered an ambulance, but I declined. After hearing how drunk Ted handled the situation, I felt much safer with him than I would have been at a hospital. Part of me wanted to move out after that. As you can imagine, part of me still wishes I had. As it was, I instead resolved that I wasn't going to let Roy or his disturbed followers ruin the first living space I'd ever picked out and signed a contract for. Over the Christmas break, we all agreed that, once we returned, we were kicking Roy out. Thing is, the police hadn't found anything that they could use to arrest him. They had found a book, a manuscript draft, which they confiscated, but, again, I couldn't find anything incriminating enough inside to warrant not returning it. One concerned police officer had told Lisa this via email. They warned her that, while there was nothing they could pin on Roy, that all three of us should be cautious. I'm sure the officer risked getting fired by saying this, but she'd very bluntly stated, I almost guarantee I'm going to be called back to that flat soon, and I'm worried that next time the mutilation won't be self-inflicted. I can't tell you why, but this is just all wrong. Please, Miss Pearson, your boyfriend and your flatmate should find alternative accommodation as soon as possible. It was the book that worried them. I've since seen it, of course, but when Lisa forwarded me on that initial email, all I had to go by was the title. The Children Are Bleeding, A Housewife's Tale. During those last three months, after we ignored the officer's advice and returned to the flats we shared with Roy, I'd come to know that book much, much better. It had clearly made an impression on some of the police officers because I noticed more than one high-vis jacket knock on the door and lead themselves through to Roy's room. I'd heard Lisa crying about it at night, when I was too afraid of the low mumblings coming from the direction of Roy, on the other side of the wall between our bedrooms to sleep. She was terrified, and to be honest, so was I. Trying to kick Roy out hadn't gone well. We'd managed to keep ourselves composed for a full month of the new term before Lisa finally snapped. She marched down the hallway, banged on Roy's door with her fists. You come out here right now, Roy Bardakit. You smelly, creepy bastard. I've had enough. You've got to leave now. Ted and I didn't have enough time to put down Tekken and head out into the hallway. By the time our PS4 controllers touched the ground, Lisa was backing into the living room, palms outstretched, pleading with the slowly advancing group of glazed-eyed acolytes. The ten or so strong crowd was just as mismatched as ever. There was a pot-bellied policeman, a mother and teenage daughter with matching get-me-the-manager haircuts, a clearly homeless man whose breath stank of white lightning, a woman in a crisp gray suit with a big name Banks, hi, my name is Badge, still above her breast pocket. A normally unremarkable group of people, all rendered terrifying by the hateful expressions in their glass eyes and the short figure in the dark coat they parted to let through. Roy was looking worse than ever. His skin was near translucent now. Dark blue veins crisscrossed the skin of his temples and round his eyes. His eyes themselves were milky red, more burst capillaries now than anything else. His thin lips were smirking at Lisa, but his bag-buried eyes shared the hate of his followers. Oh, I'm leaving, am I, Lisa? His words were slow, deliberate, the tone so measured and controlled it seemed like forming each syllable took him a conscious effort. Yes, Lisa stammered, bumping into the kitchen table and yelping. Yes, you've... You've got to get out. I'm sick of the smell and these... these freaks. She spat the last word, her anger somehow finding the strength to rise above her terror. The freaks found her defiance amusing, 
They began laughing in soft chuckles, each perfectly timed with Roy's own. Cute, Lisa. That's cute. His smirk grew, although it did falter when Ted stepped between them. Back off, Roy. I don't care how many of your sick little club you got with you. If you lay a finger on her, I'll mess you up. I was still standing behind them, so I couldn't see his face. But the fury in Ted's roar was enough to make even me jump. That's why Roy's unflinching response shook me to my core. I'm already messed up, Theodore. So are all of you. I'm just honest about it. He scanned the three of us with his sunken eyes. I'm fond of two of you, so I'm going to ignore this transgression. Don't disturb me when I'm working again. He and his followers shot Lisa one last disgusted look, then retreated back down the dark hallway into Roy's bedroom. That night's wall-muffled sermon lasted well into the dawn hours. So did Lisa's sobs. I didn't see Roy again until the night of the fire. I was still defiantly refusing to leave. Lisa had tried, but for some reason, Ted talked her out of it. She moved into his bedroom, leaving her old one as an empty space. As for Ted, he was still convinced he could end all of this at a moment's notice by giving Roy a black eye. I think he was just as scared as we were, and found the macho fantasy comforting. I don't think any of us could have moved out, though. Not really. Firstly, because I doubt Roy would have let us, and secondly, because the thought of leaving him and his followers to their own devices was somehow even more terrifying. It had become clear to me during that late month that I'd have to intervene. Even though I was terrified, I couldn't just let the situation develop. Evil triumphs when good men do nothing, or whatever the quote is. It took me four weeks to build the courage to step up, but I knew I couldn't live with myself if... Well, you'll see. Roy's followers were up to something. That became apparent over the next few nights following the confrontation in the kitchen. I lay awake, listening as the muffled sermons became intertwined with dull thuds and scrapes, banging and hammering, the grinding of saws on wood. After a week, the muted sounds of work started coming from Lisa's old bedroom, too. I didn't have many opportunities to talk to her about it, though. She rarely left her room during those last weeks. Ted had a job tending a bar, and so would be out most evenings. He'd return after midnight, with the sounds of heavy activity always starting when he was out the house, or, as I could tell because of the thin walls, snoring. He was working the night of the fire, which I think is the only reason he was still around to knock those two pointless years off my sentence. The first thing I noticed on the night of the fire was the stampeding of boots. I had gotten used to hearing them traipsing up and down the hallway outside my room in the night hours, learning to somehow sleep despite the heavy footfalls that grew louder as they approached the other side of my bedroom door, staying silent until they'd thump back towards Roy's room when the sun rose. Hearing the heavy thumps of the dozen or so pairs of feet leave the flat and slam the door behind them was new. I should have been relieved. I wasn't, though. I still remember the man with the eyes in his mouth. The police officer's warning was still in my memory, too. Wherever Roy's followers had gone, it can't have been to do anything good. I assumed Roy had gone with them when I found his bedroom empty. A quick peek beyond my own bedroom door showed me I wasn't being guarded. I did knock on Lisa's door, but... There was no response. She was sleeping, I guessed. It must be, since I couldn't hear her crying. I didn't have much reason to check Lisa's old room at that point. Instead, I'd tried Roy's door, tentative but hopeful I could catch him alone without his acolytes. I still thought I could get through to him, 
just as Ted was holding on to the fantasy of control through masculine violence, I was still banking on the fact that Roy was my friend. My friend who was ill. My friend who was ill that could be reasoned with, got through to, helped. When I learned the truth, I found out just how terrible a judge of character I'd been when I chose a friend in Roy. I also discovered my naive ideas about salvation and healing were pitifully misguided. When I found the book on the desk of his empty room, I realized Roy didn't need a friend. He needed an executioner. The lump in my throat was already building when his bedroom door swung open. I'd only knocked it once, and not hard. The rickety wood moved almost on its own accord, like it was inviting me in. The room beyond that was lit only by a small lamp on Roy's desk. I didn't notice that immediately, however. The first sensory feedback to hit me was from my nose. The stench of gasoline and burnt eggs was noxious. I had to raise my t-shirt over my nose, although it did little to smother the fumes. I headed over to the book on the desk because, in all honesty, I think that's what Roy wanted me to do. That was all part of his game, I think. I guess he must have misjudged. It didn't end the way he planned. At least, I hope it didn't. From what I read in my brief skim of the book, though, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that twisted genius had planned for me to do everything I did after I'd managed to stop vomiting. It was a printed volume, bound in a red cover, empty save for the title. The Children Are Bleeding, A Housewife's Tale. The fonts and odd typography were almost as disconcerting as the fact I had to open the front cover to confirm this was, indeed, the book written by R. Bardiquette. These inconsistencies with publishing norms were nothing compared to the contents, though. I'm not going to go into details, because writing it out would just be recreating it. I only managed about five or six pages before my diaphragm contracted and the inside of my shirt was filled with warm bile. I threw Roy's twisted book across the room, pulling off my shirt to wipe away my puke. I was jabbering away, tears welling in my eyes. I didn't have a word for my emotional state. Panicked, terror-stricken, insane... None do justice to the depth of the fear that overtook me from reading those few pages. What I can tell you is that it was a stream of untitled passages. Some poetry, others prose. They described the most abominable things. Well, I don't want to say that you could imagine, because I genuinely don't believe you can. I hope you can't. Unspeakable acts... Twisted creatures, horrifying landscapes. All were laid out in verse and text by Roy, with such clarity and poise they could not possibly have been purely from the imagination. This is when my resolve that I had to intervene solidified, in the moments I was wiping the last of the puke from my lips. I didn't want to know what the kind of people who, unrepulsed by this book, are capable of. Roy, on his own, was clearly dangerous. A following devoted to whatever twisted message his magnum opus conveyed was unthinkable. The open cardboard box I then noticed on Roy's bed, the one full of copies of the same scarlet volume I had hurled against the wall, was the last straw. I had never been happier that Ted had an affinity for Zippo's, it meant that we had a few canisters of lighter fluid in one of the kitchen cupboards. Along with the half-dozen bottles of vodka, I had more than enough to do what I needed to. I was about to light the match I'd swiped from a drawer in Roy's desk and ignite his bedroom when I heard the whimper. Lisa. I'd been so caught up in the terror-induced mad fervor that I'd completely forgotten about her. She hadn't made a sound up until that point. Despite me yelling at the top of my lungs as I threw vodka and lighter fluid across every inch of Roy's floor and the hallway outside, 
I could still hear her whimpering when I, at last, managed to kick through the door to her and Ted's shared room. The door burst inwards to reveal a screaming Lisa nowhere in the room beyond. Her terrified, now shrieks, weren't stopping, though. It was then I realized they'd never been coming from her new bedroom. They were coming from her old one. The door to Lisa's old bedroom, the one Roy's followers had been using, didn't need kicking. I didn't even need to knock. It creaked ajar as I walked towards it. The room beyond was unlit, but I knew Lisa was in there. Her screams grew noticeably louder the instant an inch of darkness was visible between door and frame. The light from the hall cast a long beam on the dark floor. It ended at Lisa's feet. Even with that little detail, I knew straight away that her screams were warranted. The light from the open doorway illuminated her feet, ankles, and up to her knees. She was unclothed, strapped with thick leather belts to a wooden X. Well, an X is the easiest way to describe it. I wouldn't see the full horror of the device until a few moments later, when I switched the light on. When I did see the full majesty of the infernal contraption, my attention was directed elsewhere, so I still don't clearly remember exactly how it was. What I do remember is that the heavy wooden X had ornate diagrams carved on every inch of it. It was nailed into a rotating mass of cogs and wheels, all engraved with the same intricate and unnerving pictograms. These wheels were made from a range of materials, from iron and different grains of wood through to plastic, paper mache, and animal bone. As I said, though, when I switched on the light, my attention wasn't on the spinning wheels and their arcane symbols. It was on Lisa. I can see you. Oh God, Rick, I can see you. How can I see you, Rick? I screamed the moment the light switch removed the blanket of darkness. I could see the full extent of the contraption she was strapped to, how it took up almost the whole room. I saw how it was connected to bubbling vats of God knows what, to pipes and valves that hissed reeking steam. The burnt egg and gasoline smell was so thick that layers of phlegm built up on each panicked breath. How I didn't pass out, I don't know. Well, I do. I think I was too scared of Lisa's eyes to pass out. My body simply could not allow itself to shut down and be vulnerable in the presence of her gaze. She was strapped on the machine. Her eyes, the ones I remembered, were hiding behind a thick bandage wrapped tightly around her head. I wept when I saw the two dark red patches above their location. My head filled with flashbacks to the man in the hallway. I can see you, Rick. I can see you. How can I see you? I knew how she could see me, although I didn't have the words to explain it to her. To be fair to myself, even if I did, I had no remaining sanity with which to form them. Lisa was watching me with her new eyes. They lined every inch of her naked body. They were sewn on with crude stitches, lids, and all. The surrounding skin removed from the faces of their original owners. Owners, I realized with a growing horror, were probably on the streets that moment, their eyeless, hollow faces hidden beneath hoods and sunglasses as they distributed Roy's foul teachings to the unsuspecting world. That wasn't the worst part, though. The worst part was that the dozens of transplanted eyes were still blinking. Rick! Rick! How could I see you? What's happening, Rick? I'm scared. Lisa was screaming rapid-fire pleas at me. She was struggling and tugging against the binds. I couldn't count how many eyes were on her arms, legs, midriff, chest, back, neck, groin, hips, and hands, everywhere. Registering that they were all staring at me, all blinking and tracking me around the room while Lisa continued to beg me to explain how her bound face wasn't blind was enough for me to snap. 
I hate myself for my cowardice. But I slammed the door shut. I tried to block out Lisa's wails as I lifted the match, my bottom lip trembling and vision swimming with tears. I told you I was working on something. I turned, slowly. Roy was standing at the other end of the hallway, between me and the kitchen, the living room, and, most importantly, the front door. I tensed, ready to fight for my life. Then, to my surprise, he stood aside. Go ahead, Rick. He was smiling at me. To my horror, it was the same warm smile he had during those first few months of our first year, before the incidents which set this chain of events in motion. He continued, his overly measured words soft and reassuring in a way that sent a shiver down my spine. I'm not going to try and stop you. This is always how your part in the story ends. Every time. I didn't look behind me when I shut the door to the flat. Last I saw Roy, he was sat on a chair in the living room, chuckling softly to himself while the burnt egg and gasoline smell was replaced by thick smoke. I could hear Lisa's shrieks as I ran down the street. I turned to allow myself a quick glance. The last I saw was neighbors stepping onto their front gardens, smoke billowing from the windows above the shop. The shopkeeper below yelling frantically into his phone. None of that troubled me. The only thing that did in the last few moments I spent on that street was that, even above the screams of both Lisa and the neighbors, I could still hear Roy's laughter. I handed myself in to the police immediately. I didn't want Ted to get pinned for this, and after what I'd seen, normal life wasn't an option. How could I settle into a job, a life, a family, when every time I closed my eyes, I could see a swarm of them on a naked woman's body, staring back? He didn't deserve to have his life ruined, though. He already lost Lisa. He didn't deserve to lose himself, too. That's also why I lied to him about what had happened. As far as Ted knows, Roy slit her throat. The police and jury didn't buy that. Neither did the judge. But Ted did. And that's all I care about. That's why I can finally write this out. Get this out into the world. Ted passed away yesterday. Tragic, but completely unrelated. Cancer. From what he'd told me during his visits over the years, he'd managed to move on. Settle down, have kids. I'm glad. It made it worth it in a way. If I hadn't acted when I did, it would have been Ted a few weeks later. Now that there's no risk of him finding out the truth, I can be open. I can tell the world the real side of my story. The timing also isn't fully accurate either. I've told a couple of the other inmates here my story. The true story. Usually, they laugh, say it's fake, but enjoy the good yarn nonetheless. Last week, though, one of the new guys didn't laugh. He grabbed me after, started whispering to me in hushed tones. You know Roy's book? The little red volume I thought I'd burned all known copies of? He'd seen it. I knew he wasn't lying, too, because he was able to recite to me the exact same paragraphs I refused to write down earlier. If there are still copies out there, then burning Roy and Lisa alive was for nothing. My life behind bars was all for naught. I already know Roy brought more than one police officer into the fold. I don't know how long this post will stay up, because I don't know how deep this goes. Please, warn everyone you know. Tell them to stay away from any red book with an odd title. Especially one called The Children Are Bleeding, A Housewife's Tale. If any of your friends or family start acting strange, going to odd meetings in the dead of night they refuse to disclose details of, tell them my story. If they do anything other than laugh, run. Don't stop. They're already one of them.
It's too late. I thought I'd keep you all safe from this. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I've used all of my accured good behavior internet privileges to get this warning out there. The night of the fire, I did something unspeakable and threw my life away so that you can carry on living yours in safety. Get my message out. Please make my sacrifice worth it. Make sure nobody reads anything by Roy Bardiquette. I just hope he's actually dead. It's getting harder to forget that they never found his body. I don't get out of the house much these days. I just don't feel like it. Whatever it is that makes you want to go out and about and be around other people, I guess I don't have it anymore. My mom, when I actually do answer her calls, says it sounds like depression, but I guess everybody has that these days. Certainly seems like it from what I can see online, and I spend a lot of time online. Of course, maybe that's just, uh, what do you call it, a selection bias? All of us depressives hold up in our rooms, plugging into places and realities far from our own. Anywhere is better than here, sharing with everyone else about how depressed we are, because why wouldn't we? But it's not like I even share anymore. My day-to-day -day existence has become a slow and steady quicksand of routine, a drudgery slowly smothering me. I've quit trying to break out of this cycle a long time ago. Working 40 to 50 hours as a convenience store clerk was the extent of my getting out of the house. It was nothing too taxing aside from standing all day, which I'd gotten used to. From there, I'd make the half-mile trek back to my cheap apartment, walking past various fast-food establishments that would oftentimes provide my dinner. Down the alley, with its meth heads on bikes digging through the dumpsters, me clutching my fast food bag or my pizza box, sometimes offering a slice or a taco, which they only took half the time because they were often far from hungry and only wanted cash. Up the stairs, past the smoking neighbors, who never say hi or really acknowledge me, and it's there in the living room where I park on the couch and veg out to Netflix and eat until I'm well past uncomfortable. Lie back onto the wrapper and napkin stuffed cushions, the tower of hot and ready boxes teetering on the armrest, stare at the ceiling until the discomfort passes, and I feel at least motivated enough to get myself up and over to my desktop, where I will away the hours until exhaustion takes me. Day in and day out it's like this. Towards the end of each workday, dread takes hold. I get anxious at the thought of going back to that dark and empty apartment and all of the time I will have to kill. In the morning, the reverse is true. Paranoia overtakes me, and I fear what it will be like to show up at my job, that I will have forgotten how to interact with people, that people will stare at the awful waste of space I've become. Lately, I've considered looking into applying for some sort of disability. I mean, if it is depression, then I have an excuse, right? But most days it seems like my job is the only thing keeping me tethered to reality, and I fear that if I quit, I would completely lose what little grip of reality I still have. The prescription bottle full of antidepressants winks up at me daily from the bathroom counter. I'd tried once before, many times than that, even in my youth, but they don't take. In fact, they had the opposite effect, and almost sent me inpatient, so I'm scared of trying more even though the doctor says that it can take a while to find the right meds. This lifestyle of mine has taken a toll on my body. My knees hurt during my shift. I've had to upsize my work shirts. There are calluses on my wrists and elbows from where I rest them on the desk, the mouse, the keyboard. I also think I might be developing a cyst on my butt from sitting so long. There's a tenderness back there, a swelling. What can I do about the pathetic state of my mental and physical health? I can only get more depressed whenever I think about it too long, how far I've slid. I avoid mirrors as much as possible and forget even stepping on a scale. I'm only getting worse. I don't even react to the videos I watch. It's like I've forgotten how. Instead, I just watch reaction videos, somebody reacting for me. And there's me staring blankly at it all, a reaction to the reaction. 
I don't tweet anymore. I don't discord. All the message boards I used to hang out on have long since died. It used to be that I'd actually game. Now I don't even do that. I just watch others do it. Twitch streams and YouTube highlights, so many rabbit holes to get lost in. It doesn't even really matter the content, I think I'm largely just there for that fleeting human interaction, the feeling that I'm not totally and utterly alone. It's a night like any other. The meal of the day is a 1500 calorie surplus from Taco Bell. I doom scroll through Twitter for a bit while I chew my food with only the ghost of a taste present. Before I even really know it, the food is consumed, only a few sips of Baja Blast remaining. My desk chair groans under the weight of my body, and I fire up my PC. I see if anybody is on Twitch because I prefer live streams when I can, because, yeah, I don't feel as alone when it's live. There's a whole chat room full of people on the side talking in real time, and there was a time where I'd join in the conversation. I ignore the call from my mom, but I text her back and tell her that I had a long day and that I would be in touch. There's a handful of streamers that I follow regularly. Lately, I've been talking to the more fast-paced FPS, their Valorants, and such. This had led me going to my old reliable streamers with much smaller followings. It's more intimate that way, I guess. This one chick I like is usually playing older stuff. She has a really soothing voice and calls herself the patient gamer, dark eyeliner, and thick glasses. Total goth chick vibes, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a little crush on her. Even though she says she's a lesbian, but whatever, I don't say anything creepy to her. I don't say anything at all. Tonight she's got a playthrough of Life is Strange going on, some game I remembered playing and enjoying when I used to care about such things. I don't remember finishing it, and the screen she's on is foreign to me. It's just two girl characters moving around some seaside-looking place, talking to a guy outside a camper trailer. Are you still with me, Jacob? The patient gamer asks me. I jump up with a start. That's my name. Is she talking to me? Surely not. Hello? She asks, and she's looking directly at the camera, somehow staring into my eyes. With a dry mouth, I manage to say, Me? Listen, she whispers. Her eyes go blank, like she's staring into space, and the screen starts to glitch, frames stuttering, her head and face jerking, jaw ratcheting open through the skipping video, her mouth widens into an impossible gap. A high-pitched sound of feedback comes from the black void of her slacked jaw mouth, out of my computer speakers. Nobody comments as she stares, retching and gagging there on the screen. Awful, wet sounds that make me gag. The jugular veins of her neck are fat and swollen blue. Her throat bobs as something white emerges from deep within her. It's a loudspeaker, square-shaped and something you'd see mounted on a pole outside somewhere. Static crackles from the speaker, and I am paralyzed in my chair, unable to click away, unable to shut my ears. A voice starts talking, fills my room with noise, fills my head with fear. It's not the tone of voice, but just some cowboy-sounding man straight from some old-school radio sketch. It's what he's saying. Howdy, folks! We interrupt your usual programming on this fine and dandy evening with a very special edition of the Rules of the Road. You know, we talk a lot about roads here on the program. Back roads and dirt roads and rough roads, interstates and freeways, highways and byways. Well, tonight we're going to talk about a particular kind of highway that we all know a little too well. This highway can enlighten and enthrall. This highway can educate and misinform. This highway can reprogram and reinforce. And this highway can lead you down some pretty dark paths. Leave you sitting alone in the dark at 3 a.m. and wondering just what it is you're doing with your life. And this highway can be just plain mean. You might ask, well, what in God's name highway are you talking about, Bucky? There must be something going through Dallas, right? Why, no, I'm not talking about anything as dangerous as a Dallas road. 
Now, I'm talking about the information superhighway. That's right. Cyberspace. The internet. That big old series of tubes. The World Wide Web. And oh, what a tangled web it is. The world's only gotten smaller since its inception. With each technological leap, our walls close in. I bet you're finding less and less reason to leave the house these days. Got the world at your fingertips. Don't even have to have a face-to-face conversation with a single soul. And isn't it great? All that power, all that information, all the collective memory of recent history. I bet scrolling on that, you might get a taste of what it's like to be in my shoes. (laughs) You wish. Compared to where I've been and what I've seen, the access I've been granted. The internet is a little more than a few pages of a phone book. Maybe y'all should sign up for my service provider sometime. It sure is something. Anywho, on to tonight's rule of the road. If at any point during your journey through the interwebs you discover some schmuck in the comments section trying to sell you on a load of horse feathers, then you must respond to their comment with a few specific words. Now I'll get to what those words are here in a minute. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. You know the type of fella I'm talking about. It's the obviously fake commenter looking to scam you in some form or fashion. It's always Mike Wilski in New Jersey. And he's just won the lottery. And he's feeling extra generous and wants you to contact him with your info so he can spread the wealth a little. Or it's Janet Pfeiffer from Grand Rapids and she's making 650 bucks a month working from home with a stay-at-home mom. And she wants to tell you how you can do it too. I believe the first part is getting knocked up, but I digress. Well, okay. So now the next step is to respond to the scheming scammer. You must respond with, That is very interesting, but your money is no good here. They will eventually respond with a website link. You must go to that website. You must watch the grainy black and white video within. You must bear witness. Feel the sinking down in the bottom of your stomach. Your rising heart rate. A mixtape of the worst moments of your life. Lick the screen and taste the salt of their tears through the glass. But you already have. It's a taste you will always be familiar with. Now I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, Bucky, it's Internet Safety 101. You never engage with these devils. They'll hack your information, steal your identity, your car will get repoed, you'll have to declare bankruptcy, and before you know it, you'll be living under a bridge with a brand new name. Your cat won't even recognize you. No way am I going to respond to these yahoos. And to that I say... Fair enough. But if you don't, well, these so-called yahoos might pay you a little visit. And I must warn you, they don't take kindly to being ignored. Well... That's all I got for tonight. Hope y'all are doing well out there. Hope you remember to blink every now and then and stretch your necks and adjust your seated position so you don't get a bed sore. Why don't you step outside and get some fresh air? Actually, better rethink that. It is a scary world out there. Much safer online. If you're not on the road, the rules can't get you. Ain't that right? Stay alert. Stay lively. Stay lonely. I'm Buck Hensley, and these are the rules of the road. The screen flickers. So, I'm going to go over to this room. The patient gamer says, staring at her computer screen. Her mouth is back to normal. The chat room flows on with innocuous comments. Nobody's mentioning the fact that her jaw unhinged with her chin on her chest and her forehead staring at the ceiling, a speaker jutting out of her mouth. I close the browser, push my chair away from the computer. Outside on my little porch of the upstairs landing, I lean on the railing and stare out at the quiet parking lot for a very long time. Because of where I'm posting this, you can probably guess what happens next. The next few days passed without incident, and it wasn't until the weekends that I saw anything. 
Most of the time I was avoiding the comment section like the plague, averting my eyes during video game streams. I quit watching the patient gamer. Couldn't stand to look at her and revisit that memory of her hideous, outstretched mouth. What if it happened again? I'm watching some guy doing a Half-Life Black Mesa playthrough when I see it. The comments in the chat are scrolling by with the usual stuff. Slut Slayer 91 is saying, One shot. You must have it on easy mode. Bananagram keeps begging the streamer to autosave, saying, You're just showing off at this point. And then, a user known as Joel Kicks 37 types out, You've been selected. Want $100 to Costco to spend on back-to-school supplies? Click here. My initial thought is to close everything down and just leave, but I'm in this thing now. I have to respond. I at the Joel guy. I type out what I'm supposed to. I tell him it's all very interesting, but that his money is no good here. And Joel Kicks 37 responds to me with a winky face. He follows this up with a link to a website. It's some obscure jumble of letters and numbers, but it's a definite clickable hyperlink. The mouse is slick with sweat under my palms. I hover over the link, ready to click. Click it. Joel kicks 37 types out. And I do. A media player window fills my screen. There's a big triangle at the center, the universal signal for play. Snowy static swarms over my computer monitor. My living room is filled with the flickering, dreamy, analog glow of a cathode television on a defunct channel. Then, the images start to play. Impossible images. Nobody ever had a camera with them when these things happened, but it's like they did. The voices, the images, the sounds, they're all accurate. The phantom cameraman whipping the camera's eye around, getting up close and personal with anyone and everyone. A highlight reel of the worst moments of my life. The mama bird flapped around the nest frantically, her chirps strained with distress. The naked pink baby bird with a solid blue eye, mouth gaping as the life was squeezed out of it, but kept alive long enough to be placed in a half-full Gatorade bottle. Me not saying anything, not even trying, nothing worse than a bystander. Head dipped low in the cyan fluid, Membranous wings stretched taut over flexing bones as if it could just take off at any moment. As if it ever even knew how to fly. And I guess it did have one first and final flight. The bottle was punted to the other end of the field where it disappeared into the brush. The way his laughter had an edge to it. An edge sharp enough to cut a wound so deep that it took years to fill it in and forget. Why couldn't I have saved it? Why couldn't I have tried? Oh. The grass on the back of my head and the rough fingertips with the bitten down nails prying my eyelids open. My eyes staring up at the autumn blue sky because they had no choice but to do otherwise. Getting irritated and dry and begging for moisture when maybe they should have begged for something else. Because the moisture, it was coming. His cracked, chapped lips he was always biting, pursed out, the phlegm oozing in slow motion towards my pride open eye. The other heads clunking together to get in on the action, shoulders and hair pressed up close in a huddle. Unable to scream because if I opened my mouth, guess where all that saliva would end up. And then I was somewhere else. The smell of mothballs and lysol and fecal matter. The weathered old hands, devoid of any padding or life. Papery skin draped over every visible tendon and blue vein. While my mom stared out the nursing home window with tears in her eyes, they reached out from under the quilt, blindingly groping for anyone, found my wrist. I saw my own frightened face for the first time, saw all over it again, but from different angles. The rasping, toothless mouth flapping at me in a dying fish death knell delirium. Finally, an escape. They said I would find my own people in college. The lecture hall was full of strange faces, and they all seemed to be staring at the camera as it made its way down the aisle. 
No seats here. Keep moving, buddy. That's what their faces told me. The panic rising up in my throat and my heart racing, and I had to excuse myself to sit in a stall in the public restroom until it passed. And it only happened each and every day. They told me they didn't take attendance in college. I just had to show up for the tests and I'd be fine. I could study on my own. I hold up in my dorm room for days, never talking to a living human for long stretches of time. Academic probation and second chances until I finally withdrew and went back to my mom's house, defeated. Tears are streaming down my face, and I'm dry heaving sobs between my fingers. I know what's coming, and I don't want to see. A few kids up to no good, but nothing too illegal. Just some firecrackers in the vacant lot where we used to play. The bottle rockets in the Pringles can seemed harmless at the time. All bark and no bite. Staccato explosions bouncing harmlessly off the dirt. Until the wind caught the cigarette lighter's flame and whipped it back onto my thumb. And I yelped and flailed my arms, knocking the can down at an angle. The fuse lit. The rocket fired towards the neighborhood. The roofs of all those houses and we ran away in mischievous glee, like nothing could ever catch us. The camera moves down an empty street on a quiet afternoon, its operator breathing heavily into the microphone. Off in the distance, you can hear sirens. Huge billows of smoke roll out of the small wooden-framed house, orange flame licking the roof. The fire roars, and rafters fall, and sparks fly. I can't take it anymore. I pick up my computer screen and hurl it across the room, its cord dragging the tower halfway across the desk before it disconnects itself. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's what I tell myself as I pound my head on the desk, smearing my tears and snot all over the surface. I'm referring to the facts as presented on the impossible video recording, what I couldn't watch. I'm referring to the fact that I didn't follow the rule to completion. I'm referring to the entirety of my miserable existence, whether I keep breathing or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And just then, when I'm at my lowest point, when the elevator of my panic sinks to the deepest pit of my despair, when I feel like I'm coming out of my skin, when I want to plunge the fingers of both of my hands into the depths of my mouth, pulling as hard as I can in opposite directions, ripping myself in half, rip myself out of this world. Just then, there's a knock at my door. I need your help. Should I answer it? It's innocuous at first. It's the shave and a haircut of polite, wrapping knuckles. Yet soon, it grows more insistent. The meaty thud of someone hammering away with the side of their clenched fist. Instinct is to run back to my bedroom or bathroom and shut the door, cowering until it goes away. It has to be a coincidence. The knocking continues. My tears recede and my cheeks dry. I look over my shoulder towards the front door, rubbing my nose with the back of my hand. There's no harm in looking through the peephole, is there? As much as I would hate to, I can always call the cops if I get too worried. Maybe it's one of those meth heads. I start towards the door, push my face to the hole. There's a man out there, past middle-aged. He's wearing a button-up vacation-type short-sleeve shirt, khaki shorts, white socks spout from his white tennis shoes and up his calves. The porch light is on and the moths and bugs hover around. They flutter drunkenly past his bald head and bounce off his face, but he doesn't swat at them. He just stands there with a frozen, toothy grin, staring. He pounds on the door again. I outweigh him, at least. There's a softball bat within reaching distance from the front door. I had brought it after the apartment manager had reported some break-ins. I open the front door. Just a crack. His eyes light up when he sees me. Good evening, sir. Wooden-looking teeth and his mouth stayed fixed in that grin, but just kind of flapped enough for the words to come out, like he's a ventriloquist dummy. His voice sounds like a chain-smoking Sesame Street characters. I... can I help you? I asked. 
Yes, I believe you saw my message several times over the past month. I was just following up on that, he says. His lips are a maroon color, and with the door open, I can see that his skin is pale white, covered in some type of powdery makeup. The thick lines and wrinkles of my face are spared, somehow looking even more noticeable through the dusted white. Simply put, he looks ghastly, his eyes wet and shiny from the sunken craters. A message? I asked. Yes, online. I know you've had to have seen it. You're on there quite a bit. I think you got the wrong guy, I said, stepping back. I think of slamming the door in his face, but his foot has inched into the threshold. I just want to ease out of this situation with as little confrontation as possible. It's not a big deal. I just need you to fill out these surveys and you'll qualify for a $250 Amazon gift card. He says, holding up a stack of papers. I'm good, I say. Come on, it's $250, and no scam. Everybody always thinks that, but I can assure you it's legit. Just a simple survey and we mail you the gift card. I notice he has a smear of barbecue or tomato sauce at the corner of his lip. Do you routinely do this so late at night? I ask. I don't know. Do you routinely eat so much disgusting fast food? He says back, looking over my shoulder and into my living room. The crumpled up bags peeked out from under the couch, the tower of pizza boxes. God, how do you live like that, you absolute slob? His voice drops an octave at the last words. For the first time in our conversation, he is no longer smiling. His eyebrows have dropped down. He glares. I'm scared all over again. I want him gone. Whatever, I say, and take the papers out of his hands, bark good nights to him, and slam the door. Looking through the peephole, I see him skip down the stairs. He disappears into the dark of the parking lot, the top of his pale, bald head the last thing I see. I frisbee the stack of papers onto the pizza boxes, swear that tomorrow I'm going to finally clean up the piles of trash that have infiltrated my living room. Every night he comes. Most nights I ignore him. He eventually leaves, but it can take hours of knocking and pounding. I've even caved and filled out a couple of the surveys, a long, erroneous task of answering questions of whether or not I've heard of specific brands or companies. There are questions asking me to rank on a scale from one to five how well I like Charmin Ultra Soft. One particular question stands out to me. Buried within so many other innocuous questions, it asks... Does the sweet bite of Mountain Dew sufficiently distract you from your greatest sin? I write down N.A. Filling out the survey isn't enough to deter him. He always takes them with a smile and thanks me profusely. But the next night, he's back. I never get my Amazon gift cards either, and when I ask, the creepy little man plays dumb. He doesn't get any less creepy no matter how many times he shows up. Still has that same wooden smile. Still looks like his head had been dredged in flour. In fact, he actually is starting to look even more ghoulish with each visit. The lines in his face deeper, his eyes more sunken, lips wetter. I tell the property manager about the strange visitor, and he simply shrugs. Nobody else has reported him. He's not harming the property, is he? Look. If you want, I can put up some no soliciting signs, or you can make your own. Tape it to your door. But, of course, the sign goes disregarded. He's out there banging away the night I put it up. I open the door and tell him to please leave me the hell alone. Excuse me, would you like to fill out a customer survey to receive a $250 Amazon gift card in the mail? He asks, and I scream. Get out! Get the hell out! No reaction. Not even a blink. A trace of drool oozes out of the corner of his mouth, and it's thick and viscous, and hangs in the air forever, like it's made of glue. Fine! I scream. Give me your survey! 
I've got a lighter this time, and I laugh maniacally as I burn it up right there on the porch. Take your time, he says, and skips down the stairs. Later, I'm sitting on the commode, my elbows resting on my bare knees in the closest I'd ever get to a daily act of meditation, and a stack of papers slides under the bathroom door. It's a questionnaire, a survey. In a rush, I open the door. I halfway lean out in an effort to shield my below-the-waist nakedness and look down the hall. No one is there. Sir, are you aware that this is the third time you've called, and that we've sent an officer out both times and no threat was found? Yeah, but it took over two hours for anybody to show up. He was long gone by that point. So are you requesting another officer tonight? Have you talked with the property manager? Yes and yes. Do you have any evidence of this alleged trespasser? A name or surveillance footage, or maybe you've taken a picture of him the last time he was there, like with your phone? I tried that. It came out all squiggly, like he was a scribble of a person. He must be wearing some sort of camera blocker. Something that scrambles the phone's signal or lens or something. Hmm. And this is the same guy. The one from the dark web or something. That came about because you didn't follow a rule from a rogue broadcast on your video game stream. Yes, I know how it sounds. If the responding officer has reason to suspect that you are experiencing paranoia and are a danger to yourself or others, then there's a possibility you could be detained under an emergency order for a mental health evaluation. Are you aware of this? I, I am now. So I ask again, do you need us to send an officer? I think I'll be fine. Okay then. Call us if you need us. Good night. It's gotten to where I'm scared of closed doors. If the door's already open, there can't be a knock, right? I now use the restroom with the bathroom door open. A development in a long line of developments in a life of solitude that I suppose was inevitable. For the next few days, I sit in my living room with the front door wide open. The fresh air is actually kind of nice. I don't know why I don't do this more often. Through some furniture rearranging, my computer desk is now angled so that it's facing the door. I keep one eye on my screen and the other on the doorway. The softball bat rests on the floor by my feet, at the ready. For several days, he doesn't come. It's like I'm daring him to appear there. Eventually, I let my guard down, get more absorbed in my videos, stare at the screen with both eyes. There's a flicker of movement in my periphery. He stands at the threshold, smiling, papers clutched in his hand. Evening, he says in that awful voice. Get the hell out, I yell, pointing the softball at him like I'm Babe Ruth calling my shot. Can I interest you in an Amazon gift card for the simple task of filling out an easy survey? He continues, unfazed. I'm standing up, crossing the living room. Or perhaps he'd like some hell of a deal on some insurance. You know she wished she had that when the polyester nightgown melted to her skin. You should have seen the way it bubbled and merged with her thigh, the way it peeled off. The softball bat clangs off his bald dome, and he doesn't even raise his arms in a defensive posture. Just lets it come. He's a puppet. He's not real. We're all puppets. And he sinks down to the landing of my balcony porch. The blows are still striking his head and neck and shoulders. But you should let me finish. He tries to say through busted lips, broken teeth, but I keep swinging, blinded by an intense fury, the front of his head crumpling in. The aluminum bat rings off concrete, vibrates my arms. It's just me out on the porch, swinging away at empty ground. My neighbors lean out on the balcony railing, looking over at me with strange looks on their faces. There's a thin girl with dusty skin and dirty blonde hair, 
and dark gray circled eyes, and a stocky guy with a flat billed baseball cap and a chin strap beard. You all right, bro? The guy asks. I look around frantically. He was just right here. There's no trace of him. Not even a drop of blood. Damn, it must have been a hell of a spider. I live and let live with those guys, but you do you. They help with the roaches, you know. I know what it has to be. I've reached a tipping point with my mental health. Can't be sure of anything. All that self-isolation at home and minimal human interaction, it's finally driven me insane. It must be some sort of depersonalization, derealization disorder, and now I'm finally hallucinating things. People from the internet. People from the internet are all I ever know about. Only natural that they'd start to manifest. Maybe I do need to be taken in. I haven't gone into work in six days. I've simply no call no showed, and I've had 17 missed calls from them and 21 missed texts. The only allowance I've made myself is that I've responded to just enough texts from my mom so that she doesn't contact the police for a wellness check on me. If I were to hear them knock on the door and respond in all the ways I have to my current knocking tormentors, the outcome would likely be disastrous. But it doesn't matter, because he's quit knocking on the front door ever since the softball incident. From a bedroom window, he raps on the glass, that grinning face in the dark. His voice calls to me from the air vents. Soon, it's not just him. Soon, the others start to come, too. Oh. A dry, raspy voice whispers from the drain in my kitchen. I lean my head closer. Boo. The whispering continues. Boost your credit score with these six simple tricks. Just write your social security number on a receipt. Slide it down the drain. I poke a chopstick down the drain and meet a spongy resistance, something that pushes back. The chopstick clatters in the sink as I jump back like I've touched a hot stove. One knock on the door is a guy in a tailored suit. It's late when he comes, and his sunglasses are darker than the dead night around us. It doesn't matter that he's wearing sunglasses at night, like that old song. It doesn't matter, because I'm willing to bet there's nothing behind those shades. Empty eye sockets or endless voids into black nothingness, I'm sure. Sup, dude, he says. I'm offering some exclusive secrets on crypto, and I need you to not pass up on this offer. Uh, I say. Look, I can understand your skepticism, but look at you. He gestures towards me and then back to himself. Now look at me. With crypto, my future's so bright that I gotta wear shades. I'm mildly intrigued by the appearance of this new individual, but yeah, it's more spam stuff. So far, these things haven't ever touched me. At this moment, this new development is nothing more than a novelty. Who are you supposed to be? The spam commenter of Christmas Future? I ask. Hey, he says. Chiller with the wise guy stuff. Last time I looked, I'm the guy swimming Scrooge McDuck style in the currency of the future. And you're the fat loser in his apartment eking out a pathetic existence. You really want to live this way? Come with me and I'll show you the way. His voice trails off and he looks off into some other realm to the left of my doorway. <sighs> what do you need? I sigh. I need an investment of $250, he says and an inky black liquid is dripping down his cheeks from somewhere behind his sunglasses. It runs into his mouth, and he smacks his lips, his pearly white teeth turning shiny gray from it. You need real money to invest in our fake money, I ask. It's all fake money, he says, and black liquids drip off his chin without him noticing. His fashy haircut is swooped back into an impossible tower on his head, and I think I see something peeking out from that mass of golden hair. A beak or a spider leg. Well, I'm out of a job. I'm gonna need all the fake money I can get. 
Where we're going, we don't need jobs. Isn't that what you want? All the time in the world to mess around on the internet? All that time for escape? Has it worked for you yet? Has what worked? What you're currently doing to get away from yourself. I can offer you true escape. Escape from that little secret of yours. The awful person you become. With enough money, you can rebuild yourself into someone that doesn't feel sorry for themselves. Just let me in, and we'll get this thing going. I'm not ready yet, I said. Think about it, he says, and slides his middle finger under his sunglasses, pulls something out, and hands it to me. It's a business card. All that's on it are a few words and languages and symbols I've never seen. He flashes deuces at me, gives me a nod, saunters off down the steps and into the night. They are relentless. The spam ghosts leave notes scattered around my house. They write their offers in the dust and grime of my kitchen countertops and furniture. There's files that appear from nowhere with promises of supplements that can make my dick bigger and increase my stamina. From my fridge, a muffled feminine voice tells me that hot and horny singles are in my area. Open the door and a lingerie-clad woman folded in on herself and shivering topples out. She can't be taller than four foot two and she flops around on the floor like a fish, stares at me with glassy eyes, flapping her mouth and making this popping noise with her lips. I scream and stagger backwards out of the room. She's gone in an instant, like she was never even there. Maybe she wasn't. There was the man in the mechanic's coveralls with the expressionless face and glazed over plastic eyes of a crash test dummy who warns me of my vehicle's expired warranty, who said that it could be fixed if I only gave him a vial of my blood. The rusty needle entered my vein and my blood swirled into a green cylinder. How could I forget the fifties housewife with a blood-spattered apron and a butcher knife? and the black eye who said that it didn't matter that I no longer had my convenience store job, that I could make three thousand a month from home if I signed up for her nifty calling service. I slammed the door when she handed me a corded phone with a voice on it that hissed at me that killing myself would never be enough. What about the man in nothing but yellowed briefs who offered a cure for all the pain in the world? He was covered in sores and said he'd never been healthy said I only had to drink from the brown bottle he had wrapped in a brown paper bag. He told me that doctors hated him because of this knowledge and how he was cutting into their bottom line, told me this as he picked a scab from his cheek and spit a broken tooth out into my apartment. And there were the voices. Oh, there were the voices. They bounced around my apartment and into my ears and brain. Whispers and conversational volumes and angry shouts. You are worthless, and you deserve this, and many people in much worse situations than yours have picked themselves up and dusted themselves off just fine. Never in the history of man has someone done so little with so much, and it's because you're worthless. Boo-hoo, you were bullied. Should have used the fighting tips contained in my pamphlet. How to be a confident alpha male. Maybe it's not too late. Just tuck three easy payments of nineteen ninety nine in the rotten tree stump in the vacant lots behind the apartment complex. You say you're shy and anxious around people. Sack up. It's just sweaty palms and a racing heart rate. There's people in the world that don't have clean water, and you're worried that, what, someone's going to look at you funny? Or you're going to say the wrong thing or stutter a little? Nobody cares. Nobody even remembers you. Nobody even thinks about you. Better yet, why don't you just stay in your apartment because you should be tucked away where nobody can see your disgusting self. Because nobody's even going to miss you either way. Jesus Christ, take a walk for God's sake. Download my podcast and learn how to not be such a loser. I yelled back to the voices and it shut them up for a while. I covered my bedroom windows with tinfoil. No faces could peer at me through the glass. Ditto for the bathroom mirror. I put salt around every doorway and threshold and finger-paint crucifixes with ketchup packets all over the walls of my apartment, 
cotton balls stuffed into my ears and wrapping my arms around my knees and rocking back and forth in the corner of my room with my overturned mattress as a barricade. They'll never find me here. Peace at last. Famous last words. With my face buried into the dirty carpets, I try to smother the moans and cries of my overwhelming pain. My throat is dry and ragged from begging for the sweet release of it all. Why don't I just leave? Just walk out the door? Get some help? I don't know. I've asked myself the same question, and I can't come up with a good answer. I think it's because maybe I deserve this. I think it's because it all feels like a dream. A nightmare. Yeah, but... Something that I just have to let pass. Some force keeps me from getting up and walking outside my front door and into the sunlight. It's not like this is an alien sensation. I've felt it time and time again, even when I was back working, on my days off when I stayed in bed all day and could not will myself to get up. With each day, I have less and less energy. I'm one step further from reality. I'm a few frozen burritos and a couple packets of ramen from having to leave my apartment. But I can't go outside. That's where they are. In my apartments, I suffer. I suffocate in the silence and solitude. I suffuse into the carpet, unable to get up from the floor for hours. My stomach hurts. My body hurts. My head hurts. My skin hurts. Text my mom. I need some space right now. Getting help soon. Can't let her see me like this. Can't let her know. Can't be a burden. I let my cell phone die and don't get up to charge it because I don't get up at all. Not since I chewed up half the bottle of antidepressants from my bathroom, passed out, and woke up in a pool of vomit. Hair is a greasy, matted mess. Grown long from the four-guard clipper trim that I usually do over the bathtub, the haircuts I haven't given myself in weeks. My clothes have to reek, but I wouldn't know as I've long gone smell-blind to the stench of the apartment and my filthy body. I've pissed my pants no less than three times. Only one of those was out of laziness. The rest was out of fear. Mice dash in and out of the detritus of Chinese takeout and pizza boxes. The last pizza I've ordered has sat on the porch for days, trampled by my frequent solicitors. Fine. Fine, I'll call 911. Tell them what's going on. I don't care if they come to take me away. Lock me up in an institute. I'm locked up here as it is. But yeah, the phone is dead, and I can neither find the knowledge or energy to figure out how to get it charged. Footsteps walk around me. They pay me no mind. Maybe they know their work here is done. Maybe they know that I'm too pitiful to even bother with. When you're so low, even the ghosts feel sorry for you. It sounds like a country song, I think, and I chuckle out loud. That chuckle is the tiny snowball that sets off an avalanche of hysterical laughter. My face doesn't know what to do with this foreign smile spreading across my cheeks. My ears can't register the sound of joyous laughter. I realize I'm alive. I'm alive. And if I'm still alive there's still a chance. I'm rising off from this filthy floor, up from this downward spiral, up from this bottomless pit. I'm on my hands and knees, about to push myself to my feet, and that's when I hear it coming down the wall. A high-pitched whine. The squeaky wheel from the little one-handled dolly that a green oxygen tank rides in behind her. The ashy vision of her emerges from the shadows. A cherry ember glowing in the region of her face. A blast of cigarette smoke envelops me, and I'm back down on the ground, gagging and coughing. It's like all of the smoke of a packed casino has filled the space of my apartment. The whine grows louder, and she stands over me as I curl into a fetal position. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I beg. I'm too dehydrated for tears. Charcoal face leering into mine, plastic oxygen tubes snaked from her nose over the blackened, bubbled half of her face, cigarettes dangling from the burnt marshmallow lips. 
She gets closer and closer. She doesn't say a word, just shoves me down with her non-burned hand with surprising ease, starts to push the cherry of the cigarette towards my face, stubs it out of my cheek. I'm swiping and spasming, screaming in cries that grow higher and higher pitched. You don't have to fight anymore, she says in a deep smoker's voice. Kathleen Turner gargling razor blades. But then, in the voice of an angel, she says, It doesn't have to hurt anymore. Every nerve ending of my skin tingles with a pleasant sensation. Divine goosebumps. The end is beautiful, she says. The voice of an angel juxtaposed with the face of pure death. Suddenly... I feel at peace. Okay, I say, and she reaches behind her and lifts the green oxygen canister above her head. It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out my impending fate, my head and face smashed with the oxygen tank until nothing is left but a bloody mess. I take a deep breath. The tank begins its rapid descent. I think of my mom. No note, no texts, no nothing. They interviewed a bunch of survivors that jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, and a common denominator among them was that during the plummet to the water below, they all started to feel regret. This had all been a terrible mistake, they realized, and they would stop it if they could. But they couldn't. I'm not falling. I'm not a slave to the inevitability of gravity. I can crawl back through the air and back to the bridge. It'll be like I never even jumped. I roll to my left, and the oxygen tank slams on the carpet right beside my head. I'm squirming toward my front door, not even looking back. Behind me, she howls with rage. Blustery clouds of cigarette smoke fill the apartments, whipping around in a gale-force wind, a nicotine-stained tornado. And I'm on my knees, and I'm on my feet, and I feel the oxygen tank pound into my hip as I struggle with the door. Scorched skeletal fingers tear at my shirt, and I burst out into the night. I'm on my porch, panting and catching my breath, staggering, stumbling, tripping, falling, rolling down the first set of stairs and onto the landing. I don't even look back. In the parking lot, someone or something clatters over by the dumpsters. A skinny guy with a bike is over there. He's watching me. Hey, yo. You all right? The hell? It looks like you've seen a ghost. I'm good, I say. My legs feel weak as I take a few steps towards him. He seems normal, and it's not like I'm going to go back to my apartment at the moment. I walk over to him. He's got a little trailer attached to his bike. There's a bunch of junk in it. A plastic bag, wads of copper wire, a speaker, a black plastic Blu-ray player. What are you doing? I asked. Just scavenging. What'd I do? He says, nodding to the pole behind. Find anything good? Hit or miss tonight, he says. Garbage day is tomorrow. Trying to find some treasures. Look, man, this is going to sound weird, but are you... I mean, do you have a home? Why? You offering up a place? No, I'm just wondering if it's cool if I hang out here for a bit. I could help you or something. Old lady kick you out? He asks with a smile. He's missing one of his upper canines, a black gap in his grin. <laughs> something like that. I'm not going back in there, I say, gesturing at my apartment. Guys like you, and you got some place to go? He sizes up my appearance, lets me adjust under the streetlight. Oh, you're looking rough. Yeah, you can hang out. We make our way around the apartment complex, stopping off at dumpsters. The next few are busts. Nothing of value or interest. He doesn't ask many questions while he works, too focused on the task at hand. 
His name is Bobby, and he says he's been living this way for a few years now. After this, I follow him a couple blocks down the alley to a vacant lot behind an auto repair shop. At the back of the lot and next to the fence is tall grass surrounding a scraggly tree. A blue tarp hangs from a branch, forming a makeshift tent. You sure you don't got nowhere to go? Bobby asks again. I realize that my phone and wallet are back in my apartment. Not going back there tonight, I really don't have anywhere to go. Old lady said she'd call the cops, I said. All right, then, he says. He lies on a spread-out sleeping bag behind the tarp. I recline on a flattened patch of grass with a dirty sweatshirt as a pillow. It's the soundest sleep I can ever remember. Mind turns completely off as soon as my eyelids close. No dreams, and I awaken to bright sunlight and the roar of a lawnmower in the distance. If there's no home or no apartment or no primary domicile, then there's nothing to haunt, right? It's places that get haunted, and not people. Or so, this is what I've come to believe. I finally did what you guys have been trying to get me to do. What maybe the spam ghosts have also been suggesting. I left. The night after my near demise, Bobby went into the apartments and got my phone and wallet and a garbage bag of clothes. I let him take whatever was salvageable, including my desktop monitor and TV, and we pawned it all and split the money. Bobby, he shows me the ropes of the lifestyle he lives. Shows me how you can get free meals over at food and shelter, powdered eggs, oatmeal and toast for breakfast, bacon on Fridays... The only cost is having to have someone read the Bible to you every now and then. They have showers they let you use, too. He doesn't stay in the same place for long, and with some of the money, we buy a couple of tents and sleeping bags, and we move out to a large encampment down by the river, under the large interstate bridge. There's a community of sorts here. Lots of crazies, lots of addicts, lots of drugs. Everybody down here is lost in some form or fashion. I fit right in. Bobby, he tells me he's clean. I even attended an N.A. meeting with him one time, but I guess at the river he gets triggered and I see him duck off and hit a glass pipe on more than one occasion. He starts acting differently, always messing with his scavenged junk. He takes apart worthless electronics and puts them back together again, his hands tweaking the whole time. Soon, he disappears, and I don't see him for a long time. There's music at night, and campfires, and sometimes somebody is grilling something, and sometimes they share. Sometimes there's a case of beer for everyone to partake in. The hardcore people have their own hoarded jugs. This guy, Mudcat, who stays a while, he catches several behemoth catfish with his bare hands. I'm talking the size of border collies. He hoists them over his shoulder, and that evening, we have fish. It tastes like dirt. All this walking around and different eating, I start to lose weight. Have to get some new clothes from the Salvation Army. I tell my mom I'm on a new diet and exercise program, and that I'm getting good results. Later, a hippie-ish guy in a van shows up at the encampment, and he takes me to a rock-climbing gym. Shows me the ropes. Literally. His name is Tom, and he's in the area visiting a relative on hospice. Says he's rolling out soon to a place with real elevation, real rocks to climb. Says he needs a belay partner. I tell him I'll think on it, and get back to him. They were just lulling you into a false sense of security. They're just messing with you. This whole time, it was just so that you would get a taste of what you would miss. They know. They know what they're doing. What's the fun in killing a depressive? Too easy. You're giving them what they want. No, that's not it. All that's behind you. It's just someone from the camp here up stealing your wallets, rifling through your stuff. These are the thoughts that run through my mind when I see the shadow looming outside my tent. Somehow the mere presence of it awakens me. Or 
more disturbing. It's been standing out there for a very long time, waiting for me to stir. How does one knock on a tent? I don't know. But a wooden knocking sound emanates from the zippered entrance. Hello, it's me again. I know you're in there. How could I forget this voice? I don't say anything. Open this tent or I'll burn it right up, the voice says with a mean-spirited laugh. Okay, okay, I say, making my way toward the flap. From my low vantage point, I'm greeted by the thick white tennis shoes, the socks hiked up blue veiny legs. I crawl out and stand up. It's the first visitor, the guy whose face I smashed with a softball bat. Hello again, sir. Glad to see you. How you doing? He asks, jovial and cheerful as he's ever been, face frozen like always. Defeat fills my veins. I can't think of anything to do other than cooperate. There's no way to beat them. I start to say, fine, but he cuts me off. I'm here to tell you about some huge medical savings on your home medical equipment. What? Medical equipment from the home. You know, like hospital beds, bedside commodes, oxygen concentrators, portable oxygen. Never have there been savings like this. Oxygen? Yes. Just be sure to not smoke while wearing your oxygen. You just might catch your face and house on fire and convince some youngster that he was responsible for your death while coincidentally he accidentally shot a bottle rocket onto the roof of a nearby house where it promptly fizzled out and didn't harm anyone. The wind is knocked out of me. My legs are jello. I try to speak. No words come. By signing up for this supplementary plan, you'll get huge savings by entering into a network of quality physicians. He continues. Uh, are you telling me? My knees are on the ground, eyes exploding with hot tears. Oh, shh, 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 he says, pushing an ice-cold finger to my lips. He places his other hand on his head. I just need to ask you one more question. I can only choke out a sob in response. How do you feel about the recent quality of food at Arby's? Is the same? Better? Worse? I haven't been in a while? What? Hmm, option D. I understand. Thank you for your time, he says with a bow and tromps off into the night. So, this is Colorado, I say, more of a declaration than a question. It hasn't been that long since we've passed the state line coming out of Kansas. Through the windshield, I-70 stretches across a slightly crumpled flatness. The sun is blinding, setting in the west. I can't see the mountains. Yep, yeah, Tom says. I figured the Rocky Mountains would be a little rockier than this, I say. But Tom, he doesn't catch my reference, doesn't take the assist, only responds. You usually can't see him because of the sunlight. In my pockets, my phone buzzes. I answer. Hey, Mom. Oh, yeah, it just crossed into Colorado. No mountains yet. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think I'm feeling pretty good. There's many names that we call it, the formal one being Incident 13, although some of us like to call it the Dark Giant Massacre. Me, personally, I call it the Genocide, even though the term isn't fitting in the definition of the word. I won't disclose the location of where the Genocide happened since the cleanup is still in progress. However, although my superiors are keeping it under wraps, I feel as though the public should know. They must know the mistake we made. I won't say what we did, 
since I don't want anyone else to try it. Just know that we made a mistake, and some poor souls had to pay the price. In a way, posting this is an apology, albeit one that can never be accepted. Before I go, please heed my warning. I don't always ask, can I? Instead, try asking, should I? The following is a journal entry from a young man whose whereabouts are currently unknown. If you're reading this, chances are I'm dead. I don't know if the rest of the world is experiencing the same thing, but I pray to God they aren't. I don't have a whole lot of time or the amount of space in this journal, but I'll try my best to explain. It was the middle of the night, me and my girlfriend were sleeping in bed together. For context, we live in an average apartment, not too big nor too small. The day before was no different than any other day before it, so there would be no indication of what me and my girlfriend, Sarah, would have to go through. When I woke up, I was drowsy from sleep. At first, I was too drowsy to hear the noise, but as I woke up enough, I heard the noise that woke me up. You're probably familiar with the Amber Alerts, uh, you know, those messages that you get on your phone after a kid goes missing or is kidnapped. Well, that was the sound I was hearing. I felt the bed shift as she stirred in bed. Turn it off. It's annoying, she said, barely awake. Reluctantly, I turned over and grabbed my phone that was on the left side lamp, and I made the noise stop. But before I put it back, I checked to see what it was about. I expected to see the standard thing, but instead, there was a long message. To the citizens of... You are advised to immediately shelter in place. Do not leave your homes. Lock all your doors and windows, and stay as quiet as possible. I repeat, do not leave your homes. Do not leave your homes even if you hear people screaming or calling for help. I sat up, utterly confused. Did I just read that right? Immediately, I once again read it, this time examining every word to make sure I had read it correctly. When I had finished, I found it was exactly the same as before. My mind then tried to think of any possible explanation. Was it a prank? It had to be a prank. Because if this was real, who would make a message like that? Hey, Sarah, wake up, I said, nudging her. What? She turns to me, with annoyance in her face, as I most likely woke her up again when she was just about to enter sleep. Read this, I said, handing the phone to her. She took the phone and began to quietly read the message, and slowly her eyes began to open more as she continued. The hell? She muttered. She then turned and looked at me. Is this a joke? She asked me, a little accusingly. Uh, no. Why would I make a joke about this? Especially in the middle of the night. It was silent for several moments before she spoke once again. So, what do we do? Do we listen to it? I thought for several seconds before I made a decision. I'm going to ask Phil. Maybe he didn't get one. And if he did, then we'll take it seriously. Phil was our next-door neighbor, a middle-aged man who was single and had dark brown hair. He was a Marine who currently is spending some time away from the military. Although he could be tough, he was a nice man who wanted to help people whenever possible. I got out of bed and turned the lamp on. This'll only take a second, okay? She nodded and gave me my phone. As I exited my apartment, I accidentally bumped into someone. Sorry, I was... Alex. A voice I immediately recognized asked. It was Phil. Phil, what are you doing out of bed? I asked. Well, I wanted to ask you about something. That was when I realized he had his phone in his hand. So, you got one too. 
He at first seemed confused at the question, but when he saw I also had my phone, he understood. Yeah, I did. He then raised his phone up so I could see the exact same message I had gotten. So, what does it mean? What should we do? I said. He shrugged and said, Either it's a prank, or it's real. And I don't know if I want to gamble on it being fake. So, we do the shelter-in-place method? I asked him. Personally, I was really betting on it being fake, since I didn't have sufficient supplies to really bunker down. Maybe some food to last a couple days, but other than that, not much. Besides, we didn't really know how long it would be if the warning was, in fact, real. To some partial relief, he shook his head. No, we know too little of what's actually happening. I was going to respond again, although I forget about what, but was interrupted when I felt myself shaking. Actually, I wasn't shaking. The floor beneath my feet was shaking. As a matter of fact, the whole building was trembling, and a loud roar was heard from outside. What the hell? I said, and looked around to see what could be causing it. Phil, on the other hand, wasn't scared, rather surprised. A jet. That was a fighter jet. A fighter jet? I said. What the hell is one of them doing out here? I don't know, but it's definitely one of them. As the roaring sound went away, I suddenly remembered Sarah. Sarah, you okay? I yelled as I walked back into our apartment. Now the sound of the fighter jet itself probably couldn't do anything besides make the building tremble. But it's just instinct to protect the people you love when you know something bad could be happening. But when I went inside, she was no longer in bed. Instead, she was standing by the window, looking outside. Sarah, are you okay? She didn't look at me, and then I went to the window to look outside myself. There were people in the streets, maybe hundreds of them, all going in one direction. Some were carrying luggage and backpacks, some were carrying children, some were even still in their pajamas. Some were going a steady pace, while others were running. When I saw that, I had no idea what to think. Confusion, fear, dismay. I didn't know if I was supposed to feel any of that. So many of them. Going to where? Sarah finally said. Instead of responding, I turned around and went out to the apartment again. When I went outside, Phil was still there, but there were more people in the hallway. Some of the tenants, who I assume were woken up by the sound of the jet. I looked to Phil and without me saying anything, he made a decision. We should leave. I saw the people in the streets. Whatever they're running from, I don't want to know. When we left the apartments, we didn't take very much. Just our phones, a backpack with some stuff we thought we might need, and our shoes. Then we left the apartment. When we entered the street, there were even more people. But what I found intriguing was that they walked, but... Some looked uncertain, as though they didn't know where they were going, or even why. Phil walked up to one of them, who was a young man in his twenties. Phil asked him what was going on, and the man simply looked around as if he didn't see the giant crowd of people. He looked back to Phil and shrugged. Honestly, I couldn't tell you. I just woke up and found all these people in the street. When I asked someone, he told me to get out of the city... So that's where I'm going. Phil thanked him, and he walked off to join back with the rest of the crowd. There was another man running down the road, and this time I stopped him. Hey, I began. Do you have any idea what's going on? After that, I got a good look at his face, and it disturbed me. He was scared, terrified even. His face a pale white, as though all the blood had been drained. He was panting, and he looked down the street in the direction the people were coming from. His face somehow went more pale, and when I saw where he was looking, I saw nothing. 
There's death that way, he whispered. I'm sorry, what? He turned back to me, his face as pale as ever, and said something that sent chills down my spine. Get out, or the giants will kill you. Before I could say anything, he had already began running again. With the three of us having a short chat, we decided it was best to travel where the group was going, as to wherever they were going was most likely safe. Looking back, it seemed like the right call, though that's probably how most of the people got on that card. You see a large group of people going in one direction, and you join them as well. I have to ride faster. I think they're getting closer. We traveled down for twenty minutes, the crowd only getting bigger and bigger, which only made the movements slower. At this point, there must have been thousands in the streets. We all had to hold on to each other to make sure we wouldn't lose one another. However, soon the mood in the crowd starts to turn. First starting off as a rather calm march, the air slowly began filling with fear. One man shoved past us, knocking Sarah to the ground, not even stopping to say sorry as we continued shoving people out of the way. Soon more people like him kept popping up quickly. Some yelled as they ran, saying things like, Hurry! Go faster! They're coming! Get closer together, Phil said, as the crowd began to get more agitated. Those still confused yelled out their questions. Where are we going? What are you running from? And in response, I heard one man yell, The Giants. But even then, as we continued to walk, the crowd remained mostly calm but that changed when we heard the noises in the distance, coming back the direction we were coming from. Did you hear that? Phil said. I did, in fact, hear it. There was a loud commotion coming from behind us. It was far away, so it must have been loud and big if we could hear it from so far away. Others heard the noise as well as they turned their heads around and tried to stand on their toes to see what was happening though they immediately were forced to keep moving forward. What was also noticeable was that more people began running. It was only a minute after the noise began that we were able to distinguish what it was. It was the screaming of people. Behind us, we heard shrieks, wails, yelling, cries of terror, all of it. It was at first far away, but eventually got close to the point that it was unmistakable what it was. The things that happened before got the crowd churning, but it wasn't long before the screaming got the crowd into a full panic. Soon people began shoving each other out of the way, knocking others to the ground to leave them to be trampled by the growing stampede. All the while, the screams only got closer and closer. Phil grunted and said, We have to get out of this crowd. Looking around, I spotted a parked car. We can go on top of that to look around. I had to yell since the screaming at this point had filled the air. The crowd now descended into full panic. We almost swam through a current of people, making sure Sarah was close behind. She was, at this point, terrified, but we didn't have time to calm her down. We finally reached the car, and Phil and I climbed on top while we told Sarah to simply stay by it. I looked in front of us, not behind like Phil did at first. I only noticed something was off when I looked at his face. It had gone pale, and his lips were almost quivering. Phil? I waved my hands in front of him, which managed to snap him back to reality, and he immediately began once again looking around. However, I couldn't fight the urge to look at what he had seen. And so I turned around and looked down the street. What I saw was something straight out of nightmares. Down the streets, what looked like only 100 meters away. The crowd going along all that way only stopped at their feet. The feet of the giant. What I saw was something in the form of a person, but he was huge, standing what looked like two stories tall. He had pitch black skin, even blacker than the night sky above us, and from this far away, I couldn't make out any facial features, but there were two white dots I could only assume to be its eyes. What was worse was there was another marching right next to it, 
and there was another one marching beside them. I counted six marching along, almost as if they were taking a leisurely stroll in the park. But then one stopped for a moment and reached down. When he brought his hand back up, I saw in absolute horror he had picked someone up from the crowd. The person was flailing their arms and kicking their legs in the air, screaming at the top of their lungs. The giant paid no attention and simply stared at the person he had in his hand for several seconds. Then the person stopped flailing, stopped doing anything, as the giant suddenly squished its hand and split the person in two as flesh and blood dripped through its fingers. After that, it kept marching along. It wasn't an odd one out, either, as while it had been observing its catch, the rest of its giant companions had been picking up people as well. Before I could see what they did to them, Phil finally yelled, Over there, there's an alleyway. I looked to where he was pointing, and sure enough, there was one about a hundred feet from where we were currently. Without wasting a single moment, I jumped down to where Sarah was and grabbed her by the hand. What did you see? She yelled. I ignored her question and began pulling her as we made our way towards the alleyway. We had to fight, shove, all sorts of things in order to move a couple of feet. We were making progress, but it was slow. Too slow. The screams only got louder, and soon I was feeling the feet tremble beneath me as the steps of the giants caused the ground to shake. They were catching up to us, and by the time we were fifty feet away from the alleyway, there was a new sound of snapping and popping. What was worse was that the snapping and popping came right after one of the trembles. We were so close. And then I glanced behind us. Realizing they were close enough that I was able to see them. I could make them out even more this time. But what I only focused on was their face. Their smooth, featureless face. There was nothing there. No mouth, nose, ears, or hair. The only thing there was two white dots. Faster! Faster! I shrieked. We pushed and shoved even more, and right now it pains me to know we most likely shoved people to the ground who would inevitably get trampled. Twenty feet away, the shrieks were unbearable. Fifteen feet away, I could hear the sound of bones breaking more clearly, as well as the mush of flesh. Ten feet, a shadow slowly began to look over us. Five feet... The shadow was unmistakably that of a giant hand. One foot away, I turned to the right to see the man next to me be picked right up, his wails soon to be cut off. Then we burst through the alley and exited the crowd. He stopped, all of us panting, catching our breaths. When I looked up, it soon became apparent that others had gotten the same idea. There were maybe fifteen others in the alley with us. Then I turned around back to the crowd, and the exhaustion left. There were the giants just walking along, stepping on people as they walked. A few stopped occasionally to pick up someone before violently killing them. They were creative. One took off a woman's head. One threw a man high in the air and watched him land hard on the pavement. One grabbed a young woman by the leg and slammed them against the ground, practically making them explode. We all just stood there, mesmerized by the parade in front of us. We didn't even move when one of them finally stopped and turned their heads in our direction. We only got back to our senses when it walked into the alleyway towering over us and leaned down and picked someone up. I turned around, and to my despair, I saw the alley ended in a dead end. However, looking to the right, I saw there was a door. When I saw this, I ran up to it and tried to open it, but it was locked. Phil, help me! I screamed. He was next to me in a split second, and we both immediately tried to kick the door down. By now, the rest of the group in the alley had broken out of their trances as well, and began screaming. I ever heard someone begging, Please, spare me, please. 
It went on until I heard a gurgle and the sound of blood splattering on the floor. Finally, the door gave in, and we rushed inside. I turned around and grabbed Sarah by the hand, and when I did, I looked to the entrance of the alley and saw there were more giants with us. What I was shocked to see was that the rest of the people who had entered the alley weren't there anymore. Instead, all that remained were piles of flesh. I turned around and crossed the threshold into the building. Then I heard Sarah scream. Phil! I snapped my head to look at the doorway. There was Phil inside, but he was being dragged by a dark black hand which had gotten a hold of his leg. He kicked it and hit it with his fists, but it wouldn't let go. Immediately, I ran up to him. I pulled and pulled, but my strength was irrelevant to the strength of the giant, and instead, I was only being dragged. Let go, a voice said. I looked around to see who said it, everywhere, anywhere except Phil. I knew Phil had said it, but I didn't want to accept he did. Let me go, please. Finally, I looked into his eyes and saw no fear, no terror, no hatred. He was calm. Let go. I did. Sarah and I didn't say anything as we climbed the stairs of the building. We looked around for a bit and it seemed there was no one in sight. They must have fled the building like we did. We eventually climbed the stairs to the roof, which was about ten stories up. Then we looked into the street. The giants by now had long passed the building, at least those in the front. But I was amazed, shocked, horrified to see the long parade of giants continued down, and down the streets where we originally were. There had to be hundreds, maybe thousands, marching all of them just walking forward as if this were an everyday occurrence. Then I looked up off the street and looked across the horizon. It was happening everywhere. I saw in the distance plumes of smoke which came from fires and long distant screams and the occasional sound of bone. It's been about an hour since it began. Sarah and I are currently on the rooftop of the building we entered. I wrote this in a journal I had in my backpack. There was only a couple pages left since most were already torn out. So, since it will be of no use to me anymore, I will leave it here. I hope my questions will be answered soon, but for now, Sarah and I must leave. We know we can't stay here on the roof, so we will go inside the building to try to find supplies. The parade in the streets has long since died down. Though there is the occasional one that walks down, most likely searching for any survivor who thought it was now safe to come out. The strangest thing is the military is here. A helicopter went over as I was halfway through riding this. Sarah and I jumped up and down, screaming, trying to get their attention. However, their light passed over us, and they simply flew by. They must know we're here and they must come and help us. But for now, we are on our own. All right. I'm almost out of space. Hopefully I'm able to make it, and maybe I'd be able to see you, who's reading this, in person. Is this a new couch? I asked. The psychologist looked at the couch. No. Same as always. New chair? No. New glasses? No. Are you the same doctor? The psychologist paused. Yes. He scratched his head and sighed. Father sighed the exact same way, often. He opened his desk drawer and pulled out a small rectangular bottle of Jim Beam. He raised the bottle to his lips, avoiding eye contact with me, and took a sip. Then he offered the bottle to me. Take a swig. Uh, what? I'm retiring in a week. 
I'm leaving. Take a swig. I took the bottle of whiskey, unscrewed the cap, and took a sip. This isn't whiskey, I said after swallowing. You're right. It's brandy. You noticed that. You're fine. You overreacted. You're a clam. Excuse me? It's all the same to a clam. Shel Silverstein wrote that. Would you call a clam stupid because it doesn't notice when prodded by a fish or stepped on by a human? Maybe. The clam functions well enough. But I'm not a clam. And this wasn't whiskey. I shook my head. I'd guessed that it wasn't whiskey. I had no idea that it was actually brandy. The psychologist must have realized that. I wish he did. You don't think my problem is a problem? I asked. It's not. It's a peculiarity. Nothing more. Your mother's been missing for six years and you've never noticed. It's unobservant, but not abnormal. Your father has accused you of her murder. I've seen families more dysfunctional. You took the bus here all on your own. You are completely normal. Do not let anyone ever tell you otherwise. The fact that you can't naturally observe is just a peculiarity, and nothing more. I looked around and scratched the cuticles on my thumbs with my pointer fingers. Did you switch my room? Something looks different. It was a bad habit, the cuticle scratching. All of my habits were, I suppose. My cuticles were red and raw with hints of blood. I rested two fingers against my lips every once in a while, a habit reminiscent of my time as a smoker. My fingers felt yellow, like the old glow from a night spent binge smoking until four in the morning. Except my smoking had never been from going out with friends. No, I spent hours at night staring at a certain spot. The coffee shop by the bridge. The park with the lights on the trees, even my own home, wondering what looked different. Nothing felt different. That was the problem. Nothing ever felt different. Not only did we not switch your rooms, but every room here is exactly the same, said the orderly. So even if we had switched you to a new room, still nothing would look different. The orderly wore white. He had brass skin and his forearm muscles twitched when he spoke. The hair on his forearms was thick and blonde and looked like a memory of wheat. He had dark eyelashes and a heavy nose that seemed to melt from his face. His baggy white pants looked comfortable. It seemed a shame that wearing them out in a social setting would be abnormal. The orangutans are skeptical of changing in their cages. Did the orderly ever wear different pants? When I was eight or so, while at school, my parents switched my bed for a bunk bed and moved all my older brother's things into my living room, I said. Or maybe I switched into his room. He had a lot of things, clothes and furniture, but also posters, like that Captain Marvel poster. The one where he looked like he was about to dive back down to Earth from the clouds. He had a lot of stuffed animals and action figures as well. Mostly Captain Marvel stuff. He had a few Wonder Woman toys, but he kept those hidden. I used to tease him and call them Barbies, and he'd punch me for saying that. I didn't notice when he went off to college. I didn't notice when he came back. I didn't notice that while he was gone, Father made the empty bedroom his office. I didn't notice Mother was missing... I didn't notice any of those things. Who knows why a butcher needs an office? Either way, I didn't notice. My brother asked where Mother was. I hadn't thought about it until he asked. He and I found out at the same time that she'd been missing for six years. My brother and father had gotten into a fight. He came back all of a sudden. My brother. It all makes me feel stupid. So much happened, and I tell it as if it was told to me. Not as if I experienced it. You're not stupid. That's kind of you to say, orderly. So, uh, anyway, my brother insisted I see a psychologist. Father would grimace at me. 
He would say, even the orangutans are skeptical of changing in their cages. He would give me steak every day because I don't like change. That line is from a Simon and Garfunkel song. I, I tried to be skeptical then. I knew I'd always have steak for dinner. I was always skeptical. Am I the only skeptical orangutan around here? Yes, there's been no change in your cage. Not that a change would be easy to notice. I wiggled my toes. I was barefoot because walking the hallways without shoes allowed me to feel the cool tile on my feet. There was something relaxing in pacing a small room barefoot. I shifted my weights and began picking at my eyebrows as I looked around the room. The walls were beige with a horizontal line of blue. The floor, tan tile. Details. My psychologist thinks I don't have a problem. You guys think I do. I feel like a caged orangutan that doesn't move. The kind that if you had to describe it, you'd think it was depressed. That's how father looked at me. Like I was a depressed, confined orangutan. The orderly didn't reply. I sighed. So, when can I leave here? After the trial, maybe. Uh, no, I mean, uh, when will I be fixed? I keep having the feeling you guys are going to test me by making a change in my room and seeing if I notice. We don't do that. We're here to help you, not play tricks on you. You know that, don't you? My psychologist tests me, I say. I tapped my forehead, imagining a conversation where the orderly told me to take control. Unshakable habits beget unfavorable function. Something like that. That's what the psychologist said. I scratched my cuticles and looked at the orderly's pants. Are those dickies? My pants? Yes, they look comfortable. Is that an elastic waistband? You have the same pants, except yours are blue. I felt my waist. I haven't given my pants a thought. If someone had blindfolded me, I'd haven't the slightest idea what pants I was wearing. Is that normal? Yeah. Everyone here wears the same pants. Sorry, not that. I was thinking that it's strange that I'd have no idea if what I'm wearing is different than normal. Isn't that odd? That's not for me to decide. I'd like to be able to notice change, I said. The orderly scratched his head. The doctor has diagnosed you with neophobia. Do you know what that is? A fear of change? Exactly. But I'm not afraid of change. I just wish I'd notice it naturally. The orderly shook his head as he left the room. I don't know what to tell you, but I believe you. I don't think you murdered your mother. A lawyer looked at me with an eyebrow raised, but also with his nose crinkled a little. So, you never noticed your mother's absence, he said. I shook my head. I, uh, no, uh, father never mentioned it. I know that this is my second day in court, but I'm not sure if you're the same lawyer I spoke to yesterday. The court didn't look like a courtroom. It looked like a room. Yes, the judge sat on a raised platform, but everyone else sat on folding chairs. Yes, the jury sat behind a wooden bar, but the room was carpeted, and there were only three people in the audience who all looked vaguely familiar. Everyone looked vaguely familiar when out of context. The lawyer turned to the jury. Why is that something that would need mentioning, if you already knew? I... I don't know. Are you the same lawyer as last time? I asked. The lawyer raised an eyebrow and turned back to me. I'm not your lawyer. I work for the DA. How did you not know? I thought I already answered this to the other lawyer. Isn't that why the judge sent me to the facility? Don't you already understand? I'm not an orangutan. There was a second lawyer. He nodded at me. A reassuring nod. The district attorney looked confused. I'm sure I looked confused, too. The orderly leaned against the frame at the doorway. Tough day in court? 
I'm just glad to be back, I said. It's comforting here. I like the padded floors and walls. I don't like it out there. I can never shake the feeling that everyone's playing a big trick on me, moving things around and laughing because I don't notice. I hate it when people laugh at me. The orderly had brass skin and thick blonde hair on his arms. He had a heavy nose and dark eyelashes. His forearms were thick like an ape's. He looked familiar, but you could never be too certain that everyone looked vaguely familiar to me. Are you the... Yes, same as always. Is this the same room? The orderly looked at me curiously. You really don't remember? You even mentioned it to me yesterday. The tan walls with the blue horizontal stripe. Now today, padded walls. So, this is a different room? I said, wide-eyed. I began scratching my cuticles. I don't like being surprised by change. I don't have a fear of change. No one likes surprises. Yes, this is a different room. So you don't hurt yourself. Your lawyer's request, actually, says bad news is coming. None of you understand me. Father understands me. He gives me steak every day for dinner and for breakfast. I hate change because I don't notice it, but Father understood. He'd tell me all day that we'd be having steak, then we'd have steak, and I knew nothing had changed. The orangutans had nothing of which to be skeptical. I knew I'd be having steak. I wouldn't have noticed if one day I didn't, but it was more comforting not having to worry about not noticing a change. Steak every day. I envy you, man. I love steak. Well, uh, after a while, he would switch to hamburgers. Probably because it was too expensive to give me steak every day. But then we'd go back to steak. We alternated. I, I didn't like the burgers as much, though. That's understandable. The burgers made me sick sometimes. I wouldn't notice that he'd switch the burgers. They made me sick sometimes with their crunch. That's why I started seeing the psychologist. Why would you see a psychologist for a crunchy hamburger? Oh, uh, not about that. Sorry. Uh, I mean, mother missing for six years and I never noticed. That's what I was thinking. That's crazy. I love her. That's why I began seeing the psychologist when I found out she'd been missing for six years and I never noticed. But now I'm here, in this psychiatric facility. Perhaps this is where I belong. I scratched my cuticles with my pointer finger. Wherever I was, I'd always been there. Whomever I'd met, I'd always known. Whatever I ate, I'd always eaten. Whatever I'd think, I'd always thought. Not noticing change meant never getting excited. Never pleasantly surprised. Never owning. Never having. Just seeing. Never observing. I recognized this, but unless I made a conscious effort to observe... Everything passed by me unnoticed. That's crazy, said the orderly. But I'm certain you'll be out of here soon. You'll continue seeing your psychologist and you'll slowly get better. You don't deserve to be here. That much is obvious. Imagine two boxes of chocolate, if you will. One's uncovered, one's covered. Both are yours. You would notice immediately if the uncovered had missing chocolate. Missing chocolates from the cupboard, however, could only be noticed once the cover was removed. This is how the butcher's son lives his life. Every uncovered box in his world is covered. While you or I would notice missing chocolates immediately by just glancing at the box, he wouldn't notice unless he actively wanted a piece of chocolate and it wasn't there. A favorite sofa, even if it were the only piece of furniture in his otherwise empty home, would only be noticed as missing once he intended to sit on it, and not a moment before. The rest of us would notice the second we set foot inside the home, and his father kept feeding him steak. He pointed out the front door of the courtroom for some reason instead of at me in the witness stand. I guess father was here too, somewhere. I hadn't seen him since the case began. The DA stood. Objection. Move to strike. The other lawyer turns to the judge. It's all about the evidence, Your Honor. The judge looked at both clients. Overruled.
I want to see where this goes. Same couch? The psychologist looked at me like I'd covered myself in fecal matter. He didn't reply to my question. He really did not like me. It was the exact same look father always gave me. I'd been released from the psychiatric facility. I wasn't guilty. I did not murder mother. Now both father and mother were missing. I just needed to see my psychologist. The orderly looked apologetic as I'd left. I'd taken the bus straight here. The psychologist always made himself available to me. He felt sorry for me too, I think. Yes, this is the same couch, the psychologist said, sighing. He took a swig from his bottle of Jim Beam. Do you understand what happened in court today? Pity was common. People always felt sorry for me because of my debilitating stupidity. The orangutans are skeptical of changes in their cages. They are especially skeptical of the clam. Uh, yes, apparently father is now the alleged murderer of my mother. I only get to see bits and pieces of the trial when I'm on the stand, but I'm not stupid. I could figure that much out. I still can't believe it. The psychologist stood from his chair and walked to the window. He stared at the parking lot down below. I watched him, wondering what I missed. That's why I hated change. I obviously missed something, but I had no idea what. I missed something. The psychologist's complexion became slightly pale, but also a tinge green, as if he suffered from food poisoning. He turned, grabbed his keys from the desk and coat from the hook by the door. Come with me, he said. This will all be over soon. We're going out for lunch. Lunch? The psychologist held the door open for me. Yes, let's go. I wrapped my fingernails on the table. Why were we out to lunch at Outback Steakhouse? The waiter approached. What'll we be having today? One steak, said the psychologist, for the young man across from me. Uh, you're not eating? I asked. Not right now, no. That's all. Thanks. The waiter nodded and left. I looked around the restaurant. A giant boomerang hung from the wall. Do Australians actually use that? The psychologist cleared his throat. Do you understand what happened in court? I nodded. Father is wanted for the alleged murder of mother. They think he did it. I didn't do it. Mother's body was never found, so I'm not sure why they think there's a murder to be solved. Maybe she just left. That's what I've been saying. No, she didn't just leave. She was murdered. Your father is guilty. I grimaced. I, I don't think so. But either way, he's been missing since the verdict. I'm sure he's off trying to find her now. The psychologist spoke slowly. Your father, the butcher, cooked you steak every day. Yes. He understood how I didn't like change. I didn't notice it, and it makes me nervous and uncomfortable. He'd tell me we'd have steak, and that I'd always be having steak, and I always did. If he never repeated himself, then one day he gave me fish or chicken or something, I'd never notice. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I hate not realizing that something is different. I'm smart enough to realize how brain-dead this all makes me. I wish so badly I could notice change, but then I'd be completely normal. But I can't. And I hate that so much. Most messed up people like me can't imagine what they're missing. I can. I can imagine it. I see normal and know I'll never be that. But I've accepted that, I guess. The waiter returned and placed the steak in front of me. Is this definitely steak? I asked. The waiter looked at the psychologist and then back at me with a slight grin. He thought I was joking. I wasn't. It's definitely steak. Okay. The psychologist frowned at me. 
try it. A strange bubble grew in my stomach. I began to feel nauseous. I really did not want the steak. It didn't look good at all. It looked weird. I scratched my cuticles. I'm not really hungry. Eat the steak. I really don't want it. I scratched my cuticles harder. The scabs made way for fresh blood. I'm not going to ask again. Eat the steak. Now. I stared at the psychologist. He glared back at me. I really did not want the steak. Now. He repeated. I begrudgingly stabbed the beef with my fork, cut off a chunk, and placed it in my mouth. Notice anything? He asked as I chewed. I felt nauseous, but forced it down. I placed the fork down and took a large sip of water. I did not want to be here, and I did not want to eat this steak. No, of course not. Nothing. I shook my head. Nothing. Take another bite now. What you have there is a T-bone steak. That's an expensive cut, from the short loin, and if the butcher did it right, a tiny piece of the tenderloin. That's my favorite part of the T-bone steak. The psychologist pointed again. Take another bite. I forced myself to pick up the fork, cut off another piece, and chew. It doesn't taste different to you. The nausea subsided. I chewed slower. I suppose I'm enjoying this taste more than I remember enjoying the taste of father's steak. So you notice a difference? I, I suppose I do, yeah. So I'll just tell you exactly what someone without your condition would notice. He would have immediately noticed that that steak he's eating now tastes far different from the steak his father fed him. He would have noticed it looked much different, smelled different, and even felt different. He would? Immediately. You never liked your father's steak. That's true. But you like this steak. I kept on eating. Yeah, I guess I do. The psychologist pressed on, his hands clenched on the table, a weird grin on his face. Your mother's body was never found. We can't even be sure that she was murdered. I already told you, she was murdered. You never had steak for dinner. The psychologist said. He looked excited. He was smiling. Yes, I did. I had steak for dinner and for breakfast. The psychologist shook his head, smirking. No, you didn't. You had steak before your mother died, but after she died... After she died, father cooked steak every day. No, 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 no. The psychologist's smile broadened by the second. He looked deranged now. You never had steak for dinner, because you wouldn't notice the difference. The orangutans are skeptical of changes in their cages. The clams, well, it's all the same to the clam. Your father killed your mother. Your father killed a lot of people. You had meat for breakfast and dinner, but it wasn't beef. No, it was never beef. Your father had a room, your brother's old room. That room became your mother's. Your father prepped your every meal, every day, but it was never steak. I dropped my fork. It clanged on the table. I dropped the knife, too. It was hard to breathe now. I missed something. The psychologist began laughing hysterically. He grabbed his mustache and pulled. It came right off. He took off his glasses. I missed something big. It was hard to breathe. He was laughing so hard. You still don't recognize me. You're so stupid. This disguise costs two dollars. He took a handkerchief out of his pocket and dabbed tears from his eyes. The handkerchief was stained heavily from blood. You never had steak. For dinner, you had your psychologist, he said, wagging the handkerchief. And for breakfast, you had your mother.
I got this package in the mail from my dad. Brown paper wrapping, large but flat, with the word fragile written on it in black ink. When I unwrapped it, it was this big acrylic painting framed in some sort of bronze gilded plaster. The painting itself was of this long hallway full of doors, uh, kind of like you'd see in a fancy hotel. The walls had edging about halfway up. The upper part was painted, sort of an off-white, while the lower half was a crimson red that blended into the carpeting. Between each door was an upturned light, as well as on the far wall at the end, where the corridor seemed to connect to another hallway running perpendicular to it, disappearing around a corner. It was really an amazing detail, though I wouldn't call it lifelike by any means. Just the sheer amount of intricate pieces to each aspect of the scene showed that the artist really paid attention to every little thing, like somewhere in the world was this hallway, and he could stand in it and hold the painting up in front of you, and if it weren't for the border and the clearly stylized art, you wouldn't be able to tell where the canvas ended and the real world began. I called him up and thanked him immediately. But where'd you find this? I got it at an auction. I kind of figured as much. So I hung up the painting in my office, just resting behind my desk, which I realized later wasn't the best place for it, because in order to actually look at it, I had to swivel completely around. But there wasn't anywhere better, really. And once I'd gotten it hung up, I felt less willing to take it back down, so I just left it there. It kind of hung out over my shoulder and watched me work, and every now and then I'd turn around and stare at it and get entranced by it. Feeling like I could get up and put my hands in the frame and climb into the painting, as if the frame were a window. Of course, I wouldn't be writing this if something weird didn't happen as a result of the painting. We had a couple friends over, Mark and Sabrina, and Mark and I went into my office when the women folk started talking about knitting, which has become my wife's new favorite hobby. I went and sat down at my laptop to find a video I had been telling Mark about and Mark wandered over and started admiring the painting. Where'd you get it? Uh, my dad bought it at an auction and gave it to me. It's creepy. <laughs> it's not that creepy. It's uh, kind of, uh, I don't know. Hypnotic? Yeah. I turned around to look at it with him while the video loaded. He got up and close and was running his finger over the canvas, feeling the raised acrylic and I just let my gaze wander over all the details again. Huh. I didn't notice that before. What? Uh, at the end of the hallway, there's some sort of light coming from around the corner, and it's casting a shadow on the floor. I got up and looked closer, because I really hadn't spent a lot of time studying the far end of the hallway. There was definitely something yellow and some darker colors making what looked like the shadow of a person coming from around the corner. I even reached out and touched it to make sure it wasn't some trick of the light in the study, making it just look like there was this shadow in the painting, but I felt the paint, and sure enough, it was actually there in the painting. See what I mean? Mark said. Creepy. I genuinely felt weirded out by it. It was one of those moments where you started thinking, why didn't I notice this earlier? Was it there to notice? A couple days later, I was working on a project in my study, and it was around 9.30 at night, and I just couldn't focus, so I spun around to my chair to look at the painting, and I felt this sudden vertigo effect, like the ground wasn't there, and I had to grab my chair to keep from tumbling into emptiness. You wouldn't have noticed it if you hadn't looked at the painting a hundred times like I had. The hallway was long, with exactly six doors. I remember, because I counted them the first day. Three on the left, three on the right, each with a little shiny metal doorknob. Only now there were seven doors. Three on the left, four on the right. It didn't make sense. Everything looked proportionally exactly the same, and the far end of the corridor was just as far away, and yet there was a fourth door in the right side of the hallway, with its little metal knob. I don't even know which door was the fourth door. That's how well it was blended in. I just know that there were four doors where once there were three. What the hell is going on? 
I turned away in my chair and back to check several times and make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me, but the number of doors remained constant. I called my dad again, and I asked him, Is this a trick painting you sent me? What do you mean? I mean, it keeps changing. I can see it changing. Now, as far as I know, it was just one in a bunch I picked up at the same auction. After I got off the phone, I took the painting down and checked the back for some mechanical or digital hocus-pocus, but it was all soft canvas, so I left it on the floor behind my office chair with the painting facing the wall, because the thought of it was freaking me out. The next day, I pulled my wife into my office and held the painting up so she could see it, because she hadn't had a chance to before. How many doors are there? I asked. She looked it over for a moment. Seven. When I first got this, there were six. She just looked at me like I was being a moron. Okay, so which one wasn't there before? I have no idea. You don't know which door magically appeared. And she laughed and gave me a kiss and went back into the other room. It gets worse. The next time I chatted with Mark, I told him about the extra door in the painting. Are you sure there weren't seven doors to begin with? Well, I would swear I counted six. Well, if another one shows up, at least Melissa counted seven and can confirm it. You know what you should do? You should take a photo of the painting so you can prove it if anything else changes. What a great idea. I got my phone and took a photo of the painting. Two days went by. Nothing. On the third day, I walked into my office, and there was a man staring at me. Well, I mean, it wasn't. I can't say that it was a man or a woman. Hell, I can't say that it was human. There was a shape at the end of the hallway in my painting. It was oddly lacking in the detail that the rest of the painting had, like someone had hurriedly painted it out. I even ran my hand over it to make sure it wasn't fresh, that someone hadn't actually come in and painted over my painting to drive me crazy. It was really there. And the look of it scared me more than anything else, changing painting included. I wish I could do it justice with words, but the best I can describe it is that it was human-ish, with legs and arms, but it seemed squat or hunched and lopsided like someone had slapped a blurry Quasimodo onto an otherwise beautiful painting. You couldn't see the details on its face, but you could see shading on it, defining warped features. I was almost glad that there wasn't more detail on it, except that it left just enough to the imagination to give one nightmares. But I had proof. Here was proof that the painting was changing. So I brought up the file on my laptop to show my wife for comparison. Only when I did... The figure was in the photo I took, too. At no point did I start questioning my sanity about all of this. Something unnatural and terrifying was going on. So I took the painting out of the house and set it on the curb where we put our trash for pickup. I was done with that painting. Or so I thought. The next evening, when I got home from work, it was gone from the curb. I figured someone had seen it and taken it home, and I waved my hands and said, Good, now it's someone else's problem. I went in, played with my daughter, had dinner, put them to bed, and after watching a show with my wife, went into my office to check my email. No, the painting wasn't back on the wall. I made sure of that the moment I walked in the door. But I got a message from Mark, asking if the painting had changed any more and I told him about the creepy new addition, and also how I had gotten rid of the painting. Oh man, that sounds cool. Wish I'd gotten a chance to see it. Well, I can send you a photo I took of it. Cool. So I opened the image file. The thing in the painting had raised its arms. Before, you could only barely make out the arms hanging at its sides, but now both arms were raised up over its head and its fingers were spread apart like it was waving hello at me. I zoomed in as best as I could without pixelating the image, 
and the shaded contours of the face seemed stretched into a grin. Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. I sent Mark the file, but the connection kept messing up, so I put it in a folder on my Dropbox account and gave him access to it. Files corrupted, he texted me. I tried to open it as well, but he was right. Every time I copied the image file, somehow it got corrupted. Must be that spooky magic, Mark spoke. This isn't a joke. I'm freaking out here. Just delete the file if it's scaring you so badly. So I deleted it, but it gnawed at me, you know. The painting was still changing in horrible, terrifying ways, seemingly acknowledging my observation of it. And now it was gone. But if it was gone, why should it matter? If something unholy happens, it's the problem of whoever has the painting now, right? And they'll see it changing too, won't they? It was two days later, and I was organizing a folder of documents and had accidentally deleted a couple I hadn't meant to. I went into the Windows recycling bin, and you guessed it. There was the image file along with the documents. I had to look. I was trembling with dread at the thought of it. But when something so surreal happens to you, you have to witness it and see it through to the end. I recovered the file and opened it. The walls of the hallway seemed to be melting. The partition separating the red from the off-white was lower than it had been before, and drooped in places. The ridge of the lights looked like they were peeling off. The carpet seemed less crimson and more reddish-brown, and the figure had taken several steps down the corridor towards the viewer's perspective. More details had become defined, hair hanging off its head, long and black like it had been painted with a fine-tipped brush. The eyes were little more than dull black points under the shading of the brow. The grin came with teeth, uneven and fat, like those of a child more than an adult. Its arms were extended out on either side of it, touching both walls. One foot was ahead of the other, as if I'd caught it mid-step in a game of red light, green light. I realized I was panting and shaking as I looked at it. It was getting hard to breathe. An anxiety attack. The painting was going to make me pass out just from looking at a digital photo of it. Quickly, I closed the image to calm myself down, but that suddenly brought forth the thought. What if it progresses every time I look away? The only way to stop it is to keep looking, and I opened the file again. No change. Oh, no, wait. That wasn't a new change. I had noticed it before, but... It hadn't dawned on me. One of the doors was open. There was a dim blue light coming from the room inside. Moonlight, I thought. And just outside the threshold of the door, there was an object lying on the floor. I zoomed in for better detail. It was a little yellow stuffed lion with a scraggly orange mane. A child's toy. Of all the details, the melting hallway... The grinning fiend with arms wide open, the blue light from the open doorway. It was the innocent nature of that little toy lion that filled me the most with dread. My wife came into the office. Come kiss Gabby goodnight. I went into her darkened room, where she was wrapped up in blankets in her bed, hugging a half dozen stuffed animals and looking cute as could be. My little darling, I loved her so much. I kissed my daughter goodnight. She kissed me back and hugged her little pillow pets with the built-in nightlight. It glowed through a variety of colors. I love you, baby. I told her. Can I get Simba? I looked around. Where'd you leave it? Over there. She pointed to the closet. The door was open, and her toy lay on the floor just inside. Simba. Her little yellow stuffed lion with a scraggly orange mane. Seeing it lying there, just past the threshold of the closet door, while the dim glow of my daughter's nightlight faded from red to purple to blue, I felt my heart rise up in my chest. The closet was just a closet. I could see it was just a closet. There were clothes on hangers and bags with toys and blocks in them. They were right there. 
And yet, as I looked at the stuffed lion lying on the floor, waiting for me, I felt as if I could see carpeting on the floor inside the closet, even though there was none. Carpeting, not in my vision, but in my imagination. And maybe if I went in and shut the door, I'd find that the walls beyond those clothes had a wooden partition. Red below, off-white above. And maybe there was something hunched and terrible shambling its way towards us, even as I stood there, staring at that toy. I walked, briskly, trying not to look half as frightened as I was, snatching up Simba and shutting the closet door. My breathing was heavy, like I'd just run a mile, and I struggled to avoid gasping for breath as I tried to calm myself down. Hey, did that poster fall down? I asked nobody in particular, then pretended I was trying to adjust a cat poster that had been on the floor by her dresser for months, and shoved the heavy dresser over so that it was partially blocking the closet door. Here's Simba, sweetie. I handed the lion to Gabby, gave her a quick hug and kiss, and wished her good night, before rushing back to my office. The painting had changed, as I knew it would. The open door was closed, the toy gone from the floor. The hallway was dimly lit with yellow light from the melting lights again. But the thing, that not-quite-human fiend, was standing right outside the now-shut door. Its body turns to face it with both hands pressed up against the door itself, like it was running its hands down it, caressing it, and its head turns towards me, still grinning that awful, frightening grin, full of gnashing, crooked teeth. Oh God, how close had it been? No, it's just a closet. The hallway's not there. It's not real. None of this is real. I've put up signs around the neighborhood, knocking on doors, asking everyone I knew, and many I don't, if they know who took the painting. I need to find it and get it back. I want to tear it, shred it in my hands, throw it in the fire, and watch it burn to ashes. Jesus, God in heaven, I hope it didn't end up in some landfill. I've learned the awful truth. All doors lead to the hallway. It never stops. I don't know the rules. There don't seem to be any. I thought, okay, this thing is bound to a painting. But then the digital photo I took of the painting began to change too. Then my daughter's toy appeared in the image, and in a panic, I barricaded her bedroom closet. I wish I could tell you how it works. All I can tell you is that if you are the one who ends up with it, it's too late. I'm sorry. For over a week, I hunted for that painting. I'd put it on the side of the roads to be carted off on garbage day, but someone saw it and picked it up and took it home with them. Who? I don't know. Do they see it changing? Is it terrorizing them now? What do I do? It eats at you, not knowing. I refused to open the image file, afraid to see what it showed. Certain that that hideously deformed creature would be twisting the knob on the door that presumably led to my daughter's bedroom. I lay awake, listening for the distinct sound the hinges on that door make, my heart racing like a track runner's. Sometimes I would imagine I heard it and bolt into her bedroom only to find it dark and empty, only the soft sound of her sleeping. The closet door still shut and blocked behind a wall of boxes. In desperation for my own sanity, I removed the doorknob, and then I sat there at my desk, studying the knob, wondering if that had made a change in the image. Was the knob gone in the painting? Oh, God, it was killing me to know, to see whether I was safe or not. So, I opened the file. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph... I opened the image, biting my knuckle in tension. And when I saw it, my jaw clenched up so tight, I tasted my own blood and nearly broke my finger. It was there. It was right there. The monster, the freak, the thing that lived inside that painting was staring right at me, filling the screen. Details so vivid, it didn't look like a painting at all. 
It looked like I'd taken a photo of a disfigured man standing in front of a canvas. Its skin was like wax, pale, greasy wax. The flesh lumped up in places, slowed off in others. It was as if someone had tried to build a human head out of modeling clay and then left it out in the rain. There was hair, black and brown and white streaked hair that hung like seaweed off the top of its head, running down over its face, covering its ears. If you asked me to sum up this thing in one sentence, I would say it looked like a desiccated corpse that got dredged up out of the East River after a week in a hot July. But the eyes, the eyes were the worst part. There was a clearness in them, a sinister intelligence that stared back at me as I tore into the flesh of my hand with my teeth. No dullness or milky coloration, just piercing brown eyes looking dead at me and a mouth full of teeth covered in a mischievous smile. And I mean full of teeth. It was like I was looking into a shark's maw. Behind the first row was clearly another row of the same crooked, yellowing teeth. Two rows, exposed by its excited grin. That was what it was. Not mischievous at all, but excited. It was happy to see me. And as I had that thought staring and escalating horror at my computer screen, this inhuman nightmare staring back at me. I knew it was true. It could see me. It wasn't just a painting that looked like a freak of nature was staring out of the canvas. It actually was looking at me, out from my screen, just as I was looking at it. I shouted and closed the image. Then I deleted it. I emptied the recycling bin just for safe measure. I got up and ran away from the computer and spent the rest of the day pacing and feeling irritable and snapping at every question my wife or daughter asked, until finally they just stopped asking me anything at all. When I close my eyes, I see it. It's there behind my eyelids now, smiling at me, its head cocked ever so slightly like a curious dog. It can't speak to me, but I feel like I know what it was thinking. It was thinking, Do you really think you can stop me? No. I don't think I can. My wife came into my office that evening. She stood there, frowning heavily and seemingly waiting for me to say something, but I was too distracted to speak up. Finally, she broke the silence. You've got to stop. Stop what? Stop taking things out on me and Gabby. Stop this story about a painting with a monster in it. Stop acting like you're crazy. The painting is real. You saw it. I got the image on my computer to prove it's still changing. Let's see it. I... I just deleted it. You're giving Gabby nightmares. I had to change her sheets today because she was afraid to get out of bed to go to the bathroom. This has to stop. I'm trying to protect her. I'm trying to protect us. Monsters don't come out of paintings. She threw her hands up in frustration. You're a grown man. Stop acting like a child. Stop scaring your child. It's real. She stormed out of the room, slamming the door behind her. I just sat there, holding my head in my hands and tearing at my hair. It felt like my stomach was eating itself from the inside. It groaned and tugged at my guts. We'd fought before, but never like this. I should apologize, I thought. She was in the bedroom, packing a suitcase. Where are you going? I asked. I'm taking Gabby to my parents. In, in Indiana? For how long? She threw a bunch of clothes in the pile. I don't know. That depends on you. Don't go. Please. Look, she sighed. You could use some time to relax. I think you're too stressed lately. And I hadn't seen my family in months. I can go with you. She looked at me. Could you? I couldn't. I had taken too much time off already from dealing with Gabby being sick over the winter. I pulled at my hair. 
No, probably not. She went into Gabby's room and came back with a pile of her clothes to go into the suitcase. It's a two-day drive, I reminded her. We'll stop at a hotel, like we always do. Gabby likes the one with the big pool. I covered my face. I didn't want her to see that my eyes were brimming with tears. Please. I could feel her eyes on me. Call me when you get there. I sat at my desk in an empty house. Just me and the television to keep me distracted. To keep me from thinking too much. Shut my brain off. Don't let the mind wander, you know. I wasn't actually watching it, just listening. If you asked, I wouldn't even be able to tell you what channel it was on. The clock on the wall said it was just after 11 p.m. My wife and daughter had left hours ago, and would most likely be stopping at the hotel she'd made reservations at soon. That was when I got an instant message from Mark. I hadn't talked to him in a couple weeks since the whole nightmare had begun. When the painting had started to change, I'd taken the photo of it and tried to send it to him, but for some reason, the file got corrupted every time I sent it. It felt good to get a little outside contact. I want you to see something, his message read. What is it? I wrote back. He sent a file. I double-clicked and opened it. It was the photo of the painting. The hallway was back to normal, though, and no freakish, shambling horror was staring at me or anywhere to be seen. The walls weren't melting. The lights were normal. It was just like it had looked when I first received it from my father. Except there were eight doors in the hallway. And like before, it fit so perfectly that I couldn't tell you which door was the new one. I closed the picture and wrote Mark back. I thought the file was corrupted. He didn't respond. I sat there, waiting. It looks just like it did to begin with. Did you do something to it? I wrote. Look again. Something was off. I saw there are eight doors now. Look. A pause. Again. I double-clicked the file, and the bottom dropped out of my stomach. There was the painting. There was the hallway. There were the lights. There was the red carpeting. There were the eight doors. And there was my wife and daughter walking into the eighth door. And in the background, there was the shadow of the shambler coming around the corner. Oh, Jesus. I scrambled to write a message to Mark. What's going on? See you. He wrote back. Or did he? Soon. Mark? I typed. No response. I wrote his name again. Screw this, I thought. I need to call Melissa. I ran into the other room and grabbed my phone, running back into the office. I kept trying to get Mark to respond while dialing her cell number. When she answered, I nearly screamed in relief. What's up? She sounded tired. I just want to make sure you were okay, I said, trying not to sound as panicked as I was. Yeah, we just got into the hotel room. Good timing. What does it look like? There was a long pause. I could hear Gabby asking questions about the TV in the background. What does the room look like? Well, actually, what does the hall look like? Um. I stopped typing Mark's name into the messenger box and double-clicked the image file. The melting man was there. He wasn't as detailed again, mostly a jumbled smudge of paints, but he was clearly halfway down the hall and looking not at the doors of the hallway, but at me again. I could see stipples of white showing the teeth in his grin. Oh God, he's right there. On the other end of the phone, I heard my wife. I didn't really look. Hang on. I could hear the latch on the hotel door turning. No. I squeezed the phone in my hand. What? No, uh, don't. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, 
Tell me tomorrow. I sat there and stared at the image on my screen. Maybe if I left it up, the thing wouldn't be able to move. Why the hell hadn't I thought of that before? Leave the image up and it can't possibly change, right? But what the hell was up with Mark? Why did he send me the photo? Did he? He still wasn't responding to my messages anymore. You're not Mark, are you? Had I infected Mark's computer by sending the file to him? What was that, honey? I forgot I was still on the phone with my wife. I, just talking to myself. I heard Gabby again in the background. Can we play in the pool? Look, I gotta go. The pool's only open for another half hour, and I promised Gabby she could play in it. She's all wound up from being in the car. She spoke to our daughter in the background. Do you want to say goodnight to Daddy? Wait. She wasn't listening to me. Gabby got on the phone. Good night, Daddy. I love you, Gabby. I told her. Can you put... My wife was back on the line. We love you, honey. I... She hung up. I sat there in the dark of my office. The quiet of my house. Even the television seems to have gone quiet. I sat there and stared at the image on my computer screen and prayed. Please, God, protect them. He didn't hear me. I should have been with them. I failed to protect them. Instead, I sat there at my desk all night and stared at the picture of the grinning beast as it lurked in its seemingly frozen state outside the door to my wife's hotel room. The phone ringing in the other room snapped me awake. I wasn't really asleep, mind you. Just sitting there in a trance, like a zombie, staring at the computer screen. My brain was in a fog. I shambled into the other room and picked it up. It was a police officer from Pennsylvania, calling to give me the bad news. My wife and daughter had been found in the hotel pool the following morning. They suspected that my wife had slipped, hit her head on the tiles, and fallen into the pool, holding my daughter's hand and taking her in with her. The injury apparently caused my wife to seize. Gabby had bruises on her arms. I knew what really happened. They had wandered into its realm. That thing in the painting, and it had finally gotten what it wanted. I dropped the phone and walked in a trance back to my study. My stomach was fighting to reject everything inside me. Both legs seemed confused about which direction they were supposed to be going, but I had to keep looking. I had to keep my eyes on the picture. I had to keep the monster in the painting. Melissa and Gabby were waiting for me when I got back to my desk. It had left them dumped unceremoniously in the middle of the hallway. There was blood... On the walls, on the doors, on the two sad forms flopped in the middle of that crimson carpeting. If I hadn't just gotten off the phone, if I hadn't known what my wife and my daughter looked like, I might have mistaken them for just a pair of sloppy, painted-on additions to the whole scene. It left them for me to see. It was gone. I closed the picture and reopened it. Nothing changed. I closed the picture and reopened it. Nothing changed. It... it was supposed to come from me. It was my curse, not theirs. When I finish writing this, I'm going into my daughter's bedroom. I reattached the doorknob to her closet door earlier today. I'm so sorry, Gabby. Daddy loves you. I'm so sorry, Melissa. I'll see you both soon. My head hurts. I don't even know why I'm here. Why I'm writing this. I should be somewhere else. I... I should be doing something. But I keep thinking. I keep thinking I should post here. Maybe that would be a good idea. I've always wanted to be a barista. 
Sure, it's never been an avid dream of mine, like the fantasies we have as kids. Well, I don't know, maybe someone out there dreams to serve coffee for the rest of their life. For me, it wasn't really a fantasy, like being a ballerina or an astronaut. Instead, like many other college students killing themselves to make a decent wage, I needed cash. I needed cash, and I needed it badly. I have always marveled baristas, though. I ordered a coffee at 8 a.m. before class and watched a sleep-deprived teenager turn into some kind of artist with whipped cream transforming my macchiato into their canvas, a piece of art worthy of an award. Seriously, what they do has to be magic. At least, that's what I thought. I always wondered how they did it, how they made these drinks without having a mental breakdown. It's the kind of thing I'd always known I'd suck at, but I wanted to try. So I did my research, and by that I mean I went on YouTube and watched barista vlogs. Yes, they exist. I was surprised too. There are hundreds of channels all dedicated to half-hour videos where you get to watch them make weird and wacky drinks. It's kind of therapeutic to watch. When I wasn't in class or sleeping, I was watching these videos to get a basic idea. I knew I couldn't just go in without experience. They would laugh at me. I spent maybe a few weeks researching and writing down all the different kinds of coffee, milkshakes, and smoothies. There were so many combinations, and the pace it was done at made my brain hurt. You might be sitting there thinking making coffee is easy, and it is, when you can memorize an order and know the combinations by heart. After weeks of trying and failing and giving up, and trying again, I handed in my resume to my local Starbucks as well as pretty much every store in walking vicinity. Starbrooks had been my go-to coffee shop all the way through my freshman and junior years of college. I'd watched baristas come and go. I could even name them. Becca, who couldn't use the coffee machine. Jake, who helped her out. Luca, who always gave me extra whipped cream. I wanted to be part of them. They looked like a family behind the counter, laughing and chatting while making coffees and serving customers. I know it's not always like that. We're all human. Life can be a drag and can get in the way. Sometimes they looked tired and their smiles were lesser than. Shadows under their eyes, uh, like they hadn't slept. Like they'd been up all night. Luca wasn't always smiling. Becca wasn't always laughing. They were college kids, and I expected them to have at least some humanity, even if customer service demanded they shed it. But it was the kind of job I wanted. I wasn't expecting a reply. It's not out of the ordinary when I don't get replies. Most jobs ignore me. I've applied for the local music store multiple times, and according to my online application, it's still pending. It's been pending for two years. So, I wasn't hopeful. It was more likely that independent coffee shop would take me on. Still, I waited for several weeks, with the application at the back of my mind. I still watched the barista vlogs because it was something relaxing to sit back to after class and when I was stressing over finals. I got a call maybe a week ago in the middle of class. Normally, it's my mom, so I have to mute it. I didn't recognize the number, but I found myself excusing myself from the lecture. The woman on the other end of the line had a voice like nails on a chalkboard. She seemed way too happy about calling me, like she'd been waiting all day. It was jarring. Hello there. Am I correct in saying I'm speaking to Miss Satori? Yes, I said groggily, suddenly forgetting how to speak English, as well as basic etiquette on a business call. I found myself falling asleep in the middle of my lecture. I tend to do that a lot. Sure, my lectures are interesting, but the room is cozy. Uh, the ambience of students typing and my professor's smooth voice like honey trickling in my ears. I shook my head of mind fog and pasted on a smile that I knew she couldn't see. Uh, yes, speaking. Hello, Miss Satori. I apologize for the delay in getting back to you. My name is Anna. I'm the assistant manager at Starbucks. We'd love your application and we think you'd be a great addition to our team. Would you be able to attend an interview at around five? She laughed lightly. Again, I apologize for getting back to you so late. We've had a lot of applications to get through, and yours certainly caught my eye. You're a student, right? I have to say, Miss Satori, with your current qualifications I have in front of me, 
We think you would be perfect. Qualifications? I had to mentally go over my resume. I left school with a 3.9 GPA and had worked in my local Sephora in my hometown before college. I opened my mouth to correct her, but hey, I wasn't going to turn away an opportunity to work as a barista. Yes, I said again, Anna's words were going in one ear and out the other. All I was able to say was yes and nod. My cheeks felt like they were going to burn off. She was speaking so fast I could barely understand what she was saying. I had to talk over her. Um, yes. I'm currently in my senior year. I have class four times a week. I wasn't sure what I was saying and why I was saying it. The words were streaming out of me before I could stop myself. I know my roommate lied about her grades to get a job in social media marketing. They wanted straight A's and she didn't even pass math. Still, though, they never checked. Mom always told me employers never do. Anna, however, didn't seem to care. It sounded like she was reaching for anything that I was apparently good at, instead of just admitting I was the ideal candidate because I was a broke college student with barely any social life and free nights. They really were exploiting kids, huh? Well, we can work around that. Anna seemed to say everything with expletives. Is five okay? Uh, today? Yes, today would be preferable. We're quiet around five, so that's when we conduct our interviews. Uh, oh, right. I felt stupid. Uh, yeah, uh, five is fine. I paused, my heart jackhammering in my chest. Uh, do I need any experience? Anna laughed. Well, what do you think training is for? Miss Satori, experience is, of course, preferred like in every job. However, we put our employees through an induction course where they learn all they need to know. I can assure you, no first-hand experience is required. She let out a sigh. I have to say that a lot. You have no idea. Uh, oh. I perked up a little. Uh, I'll be there after class ends. Uh, do I need to bring anything? Anna chuckled. Your brain is all we need. She said. And some common sense, of course. But no, we don't require extensive paperwork. However, we would appreciate a physical copy of your resume and your ID. I, I can bring them. That's no problem, I said. I felt like jumping up and down. A job, an actual paid job as a barista, and I'd be fully trained. The store was maybe a ten-minute walk away from my apartment. It was perfect. Great. Well, I'll see you there. Anna said, and I couldn't keep the grin off my face. She ended the call before I could respond, but I didn't care. All the way through class, I couldn't stop thinking about the interview. A million questions were buzzing around my brain. Would the interview be with Anna or someone else? What if I got choked up and messed up? Anna had explicitly said I didn't need experience, but then I was overthinking everything she had said. It was polite not to ask for it, right? So what if they did need it, and Anna expected me to know that? What if she wanted me to make a double espresso latte with ten types of sauce and whipped cream right in front of her? By the end of class, I was sweating, and my gut was twisting with nausea. I kept picking up my phone and then dropping it in my lap, over and over again. I wanted to ring Anna and tell her I'd made a mistake, but that was just anxiety taking hold. To soothe my mind, I grabbed a coffee from the campus store and took slow sips. A triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato was my go-to when I was stressed, but that day it was too sweet, too sickly. I couldn't enjoy it without worrying about how it was made. On the way out of my last class of the day, I checked my phone. 4.45. I had 15 minutes to go to the bathroom and make myself at least look presentable, and then head off to the interview. By making myself look presentable, I mean comb through my hair with my fingers and put it in a high pony and wash my face. I wasn't an avid believer in astrology, but I was convinced the stars were practically screaming that I was going to tank my interview. When I walked through the door, I was assaulted with the familiar aroma of crushed coffee beans and brownies. It was the kind of smell I was used to, and I immediately relaxed. Anna greeted me at the counter. She was right. The store was pretty dead. I could only glimpse dead-eyed college kids and businessmen typing on their MacBooks. There were four interviewees. The other three looked to be my age and seemed nice enough. Two guys and a girl. 
The girl had pretty nice hair, I remember thinking. It fell in blonde waves in front of her face. She was way too pretty to be a barista. The guys were like no other guys I'd met before. I only knew the frat kinds that ended up in my roommate's bed every morning. These guys, though, were different. Like they'd just stepped out of a Dungeons and Dragons convention. One of them had red hair sprouting from a baseball cap and had a strong British accent. The other didn't say a word and hid under a bright yellow hoodie which hung off a slimmer frame. Welcome. Anna was maybe my mom's age, with dark hair pulled into a ponytail and a permanent smile that seems to be glued to her face. She was exactly the kind of person I'd pictured on the phone call. You're all here for the barista position. Anna pointed at us individually, counting us. Ah, all of you made it. That's a relief. None of us spoke. I guess we had made a silent mutual agreement to only communicate through nods and hums. Though Anna didn't seem to mind. Great. Why don't you follow me to the back and we can get started? Um, excuse me? The blonde raised her hand like she was in class. Are the interviews separate? Yeah. The British guy nodded, playing with a loose curl of his hair. Is this a group thing? Anna shook her head. Oh, I thought it was obvious from the way I told each of you on the phone. You all have the job. Uh, there was no interview process. I just need you guys to take a little test, and then we'll be watching a training video as part of the introduction. She folded her arms. Is that okay with you four? It won't take long. The guy with the hoodie lifted his head, confusion crinkling his expression. Wait, so we're all hired? He said something else, the latter of his words enveloped by a screeching sound of beans being grounded in the blender. I tried not to cover my ears, but it was loud. I felt it like knives sticking directly into my skull. Anna was still talking, though I had to step closer to her to fully understand what she was saying. Yes. Now, if you follow me, we're going to go someplace quieter. She eyed the blender and the guy behind it. He looked several years older than the four of us, maybe his late twenties. He seemed unfazed by the noise, dancing with his torso to some pop song on the radio. Rich. Annie's voice broke through the machine's seemingly endless wail. Can you turn that off? The man, or Rich, seemed to snap out of it and nodded, switching off the blender. I caught his eye for a moment, and he held it. I'm not sure why. It was awkward, so I looked away, but... I still felt his eyes on me. He didn't speak, only shutting off the blender and turning to serve a customer. Thank you. Anna rolled her eyes. Please excuse Rich. He's a lovely guy, and not the smartest, however. She gestured behind the counter, and we followed her through a pair of swinging doors. We were led onto a narrow corridor, with stains and cracks and bruised yellow walls. Not exactly the most hygienic place... Anna took us into the first room. It looked to be her office. There were already four chairs positioned behind a messy desk full of paper and old Starbrook's cups. I noticed a binder hanging off the edge. There was something printed on the front of it that looked uh, familiar. I'd seen it before. It was a logo of some sorts, but I couldn't remember where I'd seen it from. Before I could look any further, Anna placed a stray cup over it. She took a seat behind an expensive-looking laptop, which was idle. If you would like to sit down, I'll be with you in a moment. Anna started typing on her computer, grabbing paperwork and sorting them into a pile next to her. I grabbed a seat and watched her. I figured the mess of paperwork was our resumes. The four of us sat in comfortable silence for a moment while Anna typed vigorously on her laptop. When my palms were starting to go sweaty in my lap, she finally lifted her head. All right, so there's something I'd like you guys to fill out first. It's just a small test, so I can get to know you a little more. She stood up and grabbed a handful of paper before depositing a sheet to each of us. Then she gave us a pen. The blonde looked up. So, we just fill these in? Yep. Oh, just wait a second. Anna disappeared out of the door for a moment, and the four of us exchanged looks. The others looked like they were going to laugh. It seemed absurd that we were being tested like we were back at school. 
I was so used to using a laptop and typing, I struggled to remember if I was right or left-handed. Anna came back in a rush, her cheeks pink. She was holding four cups of coffee, depositing them in front of us. When I picked mine up, it was a simple black coffee. Anna told us we had ten minutes to complete the test before wandering out of the room. Outside, I noticed it had started to get dark. The sky was awash with pretty oranges and yellows. I took a sip from the cup and burnt my tongue. It tasted good. It was the type of coffee I worshipped when I stayed up all night to write an essay. There was a tang to it, and I wondered what it was. Maybe a syrup or added espresso. Pushing mostly stray thoughts to the back of my mind, I focused on the first question. The scratching sound of pen on paper filled the room, and I hurried to follow behind the other three. The front was weird, I noticed. I didn't think I recognized it. It reminded me of a doctor's scrawl. Question one. What is your name? Simple enough, I thought. I wrote about Maki Satori. My handwriting wasn't the best, but I figured that didn't matter. Question two. What is your age? Reading the text was hurting my eyes. Squinting, I scribbled 22. Question three confused me. It was a math question. Not an easy one, either. I wasn't great at math, so I was automatically struggling. With the pressure of trying to figure out some complicated problem combined with the text, my head was starting to hurt. After a while of trying to count on my fingers, failing to count in my head, and risking a glance at the blonde's paper, I wrote my best guess, which I knew was wrong. I knew it was wrong because it was a random number. Come on, I thought. It's not like the math problem mattered. Exhaling out of breath, I moved on to the next question. Question four. Read this paragraph very carefully. Read this paragraph very carefully. Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? Repeated over eight times. A, yes. B, no. My eyes felt heavy, a dull fog settling over my mind. It kept going halfway down the page. I couldn't stop reading it, like the words were leading my eyes further down. No, I didn't, I thought. But the more I read, the more I started to wonder if I did. I did stay up most nights because of my assignments. I circled, yes. Question 5. Are you alone right now? Yes, no. My pen started to shake in my hands. I knew I wasn't, but it was clear the test was trying to mess with my head. It wanted out-of-the-box answers. After hesitating, I circled, yes. Question 6. Are you sure? Yes, no. When I glanced up, my stomach twisted. I could see the girl's head bobbing up and down, one of the guys chewing his pen, but I still felt like what I was seeing was wrong. Slowly, I scribbled out my first answer and circled, no. Question 7. There are five of you in this room right now. Who, out of the following, does not exist? I dropped my pen, but something came over me. A sensation taking over my hands. I grabbed it quickly, my gaze skimming over the multiple choice answers. I wanted to leave, to throw my paper down and get the hell out of there. But something came over me. My hold on the pen tightened. I couldn't let go of it. A. Ben. B. Sam. C. Luna. D. Jack. E. Me. I don't exist. When I risked a look up, I saw three faces. I knew there were three faces. I learned their names before we'd all walked in. I'd shared a cigarette with Sam in the rain. I laughed at Luna's anecdote about her own protective mother and smiled at Ben while he'd offered a shy wave. So why couldn't I remember? I remembered walking in the door. I remember Anna's bright smile, rich, behind the coffee machine, shooting me a scowl. So why couldn't I remember them? The test wanted an answer, so I hesitantly circled Jack. Question 8. Are you enjoying this test? A. Yes. B. Yes. 
C. Yes. Swallowing something rancid crawling up my throat, I circled yes. The others weren't reacting to the test, and I couldn't help but wonder why. It was some kind of trick, surely, but none of them were speaking. When I glanced up, they were embroiled in their own papers. My head was starting to pound, the taste of coffee still lingering on my tongue, making me nauseous. Outside, it was pitch black. When I looked around for a clock, there was none, though I could have sworn there had been one above Anna's desk. I'd seen it because I remember being surprised that it was almost quarter to seven. I arrived at five. My head started to spin. Had we really spent an hour greeting Anna? How had I lost a whole hour and not even realized it? And why was I only noticing this now? Blinking rapidly, I moved on to the next question. Question nine. How long did it take you to realize Jack does not exist? A. You have always known. B. You only just realized. I circled B. The next question stood out among all the rest. It was in block capitals. Question 10. Find the red square. There were no answers. No multiple choice options. After a disorienting second of staring at my paper like an idiot, I scanned the page and then turned it over, searching for any red squares. There weren't any. I was flipping my paper over, squinting, trying to see if they were hidden in the text or they could only be seen when you really concentrate, when Anna breezed back through the door. All right, pens down, she ordered. I didn't even get to recheck my answers before she was tearing the paper from my hands. Again, I expected the others to say something, like the kind of thing that was burning in the back of my mouth. What the hell? I wanted to say. I wanted to stand up and walk out of there. But the way Anna positioned herself in front of us made me realize she wasn't finished. I felt for my phone to get a proper look at the time, but it wasn't in my pocket. I started to inwardly panic, and then I remembered. Oh, yeah, that fog was back, encasing my mind in cotton candy. I'd left it in my bag, which was in the storage room. How could I forget? I was so, so clumsy sometimes. How did you find the test? Anna asked, her eyes piercing each of us. The blonde, Luna, stood up with a shaky smile. Do you mind if I get going? Her voice was panicked. I don't think this is the job for me. Anna nodded, still with that bright smile. Of course, Luna, after the training video. But I don't want the job, she whispered. Could I please go? Yes, after the training video. Now follow me. Anna said, her tone growing stern. I waited for Luna to give up and walk out, but she didn't. She nodded slowly, her cheeks paling. It was almost like the four of them were trapped under a spell. We couldn't move. We couldn't question authority. When alarm bells started ringing in our heads, they were quickly silenced. I stood up, too, my body tipping to the left and then the right. The clock was back. 11.35. The time struck me as wrong. No, it it couldn't be eleven. We had only been in the office for twenty minutes. I opened my mouth to say this, but Anna was already ushering us to the door and back down the hallway. But we weren't going back to the storefront. We were going deeper. The corridor felt like it was going on forever, and time, time seemed to slow down. I couldn't see an ending to the corridor, but the closer I got to it, it got farther away, like it was playing with me. When I was staring hard at Anna's back, I could still see the words, Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? Still flickering at the backs of my eyes. When I shook my head, I glimpsed something small, something white, bouncing along with the others. A tiny white rabbit. I shook my head again, but no... I wasn't seeing things. The tiny rabbit turned to look directly at me with beady eyes and lifted a small white paw. It was gesturing for me to keep going, bouncing between the boy's legs. So I did. 
I kept going, until the corridor ended on a simple wooden door. When Anna told us to go inside, I stopped at the threshold. Just looking at the room sent slithers of panic down my spine. But something pushed me forward, despite my body refusing to follow. The room reminded me of an old classroom. The walls were scratched white, and there were four desks. That was it. Four walls and four desks. The others were hesitant, walking in, and I followed, keeping an eye on the door. The rabbit had disappeared. Anna stood at the front, still smiling like she knew something we didn't. Sit down, please. She nodded at the desks. Any desk will do. Is this another test? Luna acted like the desk was teeming with spiders when she took an uncertain seat. Anna shook her head. No, this is the last stage of your induction. When I slumped down at a desk, the boys falling suit, the door opened, and I recognized the guy who had been grinding coffee beans. Rich. He wheeled an ancient-looking TV set inside the room, positioning it in front of us. I felt like I was back at school, back in middle school when the teacher would let us watch Bill Nye the Science Guy. I'd always found the introduction kind of hypnotizing. The room suddenly went dark, and the TV flickered onto a dark blue screen. Rich left, and Anna leaned against the door with her arms folded across her chest. Again, I wanted to speak. I think we all did. But the words wouldn't form coherently in my mind. The television flickered again, like an old VCR, before text appeared in bright white. Silver Screen Home Video System, Praj Blue. Introductory Training. Test 1. Intro. Test 2. Mirror. Test 3. Lullaby. I waited for something to happen. For a moment, there was nothing, before the top option blinked like it was being selected. After a second, the screen erupted into static, before a video started. It reminded me of those old-style VCRs my parents still had at home. I could tell it was damaged, or it had been used too many times because it kept skipping, colors mixing into one confusing hue. I'd seen some training videos from McDonald's on YouTube, and it was similar to that. Music started. It was upbeat and playful. A woman popped up out of nowhere with a wide smile. She looked to be in the background of a Starbucks. There were people in the background making coffee and loud laughter and chat. The presenter looked directly into the camera. You've just landed your dream job with us, she said loudly, never losing that smile. So, what next? Well, we have to train you up, of course. The screen flashed to three teenagers in 70s wear. The woman's voice continued while the camera panned on each one. We're going to show you the do's. It cut to the woman nodding with a smile. And don'ts. Her grin twisted into a frown. Of working at your favorite coffee chain. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Sarah is going to show you guys everything you need to know. The screen cut to a kid washing their hands vigorously, and Comic Sans text popped up above her head. Let's talk about hygiene, the presenter said. Now, you're going to wash your hands three times, okay? And then put on your apron, just like Sarah. The camera pans to the girl doing exactly what the presenter was saying. I watched Sarah be led through several steps which included checking stocks, making sure surfaces were clean, before she finally put a plastic cup on the counter. The woman appeared again, this time slightly off-screen, and the screen collapsed into static. The video was still going on, and I could hear the presenter's voice, but there was something overlaying the garbled static. At first, I thought I was seeing things, before the screen turned bright white. It was so bright. I wanted to look away. I wanted to cry out, but I couldn't. There was text in front of me. Those same words on my test in block capitals practically screaming at me. Find the red squares. But there, there weren't any. I couldn't find any. The video jumped back into frame. Sarah was making a mocha and the presenter was standing behind her. While I was watching the demonstration, that same message played again, over and over in my mind. Find the red squares. Find the red squares. I was looking for them, 
forcing my way through the footage, through the static. I was half aware of Anna in front of me. I felt her breath on my cheeks. I felt her cold hands forcing my wrists to the armrest and pinning them down with something. Velcro. I couldn't cry out. My eyes were glued to the screen. When I tried to shut them, Anna's ice-cold fingers were prying them open. Something replaced her fingers. Tape. Tiny pieces of tape held my eyelids open. I managed to move my lips, but all I could manage was a soft moan. I had no choice. I had to watch. I had to find the squares. I had to find the squares. The screen flickered from red to orange. Then the Starbrooks presenter was back, making something. A mocha, I thought. Yes, a mocha. Her eyes flickered to the camera. Okay, so what we're going to do to make the perfect mocha is... She started to explain, and I found myself mouthing her words. They came so easily to me, pouring from my lips, but with no sound. I noticed something in the corner of my eye. Something was pushing at the top of the screen. A red square. When my eyes found it, the square moved to the middle. Then it was at the bottom left-hand corner. I followed it eagerly. The faster it was, my eye movements tracked it perfectly. When the presenter had finished the drink and was holding it up in the air, I was tracking twelve different squares flashing from corner to corner, left to right. Okay then, test one. The presenter's voice dulled in my mind. It sounded less enthusiastic and over the top. No, it was a voice telling me what to do. It was giving me... It, it was giving me an order. Come on, guys. I just showed you. The woman was laughing, her grin growing bigger and bigger. Step one, I found myself saying, the others echoing. Wash your hands. Very good. The woman on screen smiled like she could hear us. And what is step two? The red squares were back, but they were bigger, growing bigger and bigger. Step two, we said. We grind the beans in the blender. That's right, the woman said. And what if your establishment does not have a blender? We use a rolling pin, we said back. The woman nodded. You're doing so well, guys. Why don't you give yourself a pat on the back? I strained to move my hands to do it, but I couldn't move. The woman's smile grew. There you go. Now, step three. Come on, say it with me. And remember, service with a smile. I don't want to see any frowns. The red squares were growing bigger. I felt my lips widening into a grin that hurt my jaw. The presenter's image wavered, and she looked almost 3D, like she was coming out of the TV. Step three. Our voices fell in sync with hers. And I couldn't control myself. I couldn't control my body. I couldn't control my smile that was quickly becoming a demented grin. We start whipping the cream and clearing the surfaces of any unused ingredients. The red squares were flashing in every corner now. I caught each one, and every question the woman asked me, I answered. When the screen flashed to another bright red screen with the words, Please stand by, I felt my left eye strain. Whatever was holding it open was struggling. And then something snapped. The tape, or whatever it was, came loose. My left eye was free. And once it was, that something was screaming, piercing my ears. I felt it rooted inside of me, something alive, something crawling directly into my skull. With my eyes free, I blinked. Then I blinked again. The training video seemed to snap out of existence, replaced by a white screen. The following footage is top secret. Unauthorized viewing of the following is punishable by 06-356-GM6. See protocol. If a subject resists, please refer to protocol H912. Neutralization. Please stand by. But the others were still talking, I realized. I could hear them reciting another coffee recipe in a symphony drone. Whatever the training video was, it wasn't playing for Anna. Only for us. Only for me, when my eyes were completely open. It didn't take Anna long to notice. 
The dull fog that had been choking my brain for hours was starting to lift. All those thoughts that had been forced back were drifting back into the forefront of my mind. I managed to tear one wrist free, but Anna was in front of me before I could try anything else. I remember crying out. I remember begging her. But she didn't listen. Her smile was gone. I didn't see a woman in charge of a coffee chain. I saw someone else. Someone a lot higher up. When my eyes were held open once again, my panicked gaze found the screen, which once again flickered back to the training video. The presenter and Sarah were back in front of the camera, like they were waiting for me. The presenter was shaking her head with a frown. Uh-oh, she said. Looks like someone's lagging behind. Let's try this again, shall we? Yes. The others droned on. Let's try this again. If you're wondering what happened after that, I have no idea. I remember going back to my apartment. I fell asleep and woke up three days later. My roommate thought I was dead. But worse still, I kept blacking out at random times of the day. I'll be at home on my laptop, and then I'm sitting in my kitchen talking to my roommate with no memory of the conversation. When I asked her what was going on, she seemed confused. This morning, I woke up, standing in the back rooms of Starbrooks. Sam, Luna, and Ben were with me. Anna was talking to us, but I don't remember what she was saying. There were two men in black standing either side of her. I think they were armed, though I can't be sure. I don't know if this is even real. I don't know if my mind is playing tricks on me. I keep blacking out and waking up somewhere completely different. I've had this recurring nightmare that I'm strapped down. The room is dim, and there is no light. The only light is the one looming over me. It's so bright, it hurts my eyes. Something sharp is pointed directly at my face. There are people in white dotted around me. They wear masks and stare at me with quizzical eyes that don't blink. Every nightmare I have, the needle gets closer. My roommate thinks I need to go and see a doctor. I told her the Starbrooks video did something to me, but she thinks I'm playing around. I just know I'm not the same. I don't sleep. I barely eat. I can't remember the last time I went to class. I don't work at Starbrooks, and yet... I'm always there. I'm always there, standing in front of Anna. But her words never make sense when I try to go over them in my head. I just know that I have to... do something. I have to do something important. I know something for sure. Whatever I'm doing, I don't think I'm making coffee. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. 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 There's... there's something in my head. I think I've done a bad thing. Tell me I haven't done a bad thing. I keep losing time. Ten hours. It's always ten hours. What I lost comes back to me in nightmares that I can't decipher. I'm strapped to a bed. I can't move. I can't scream. There's something sharp. The point of a needle getting closer and closer to me. It's been nearly two weeks since my interview at Starbrook's Coffee, and I'm sure the video I was made to watch as part of my induction did something to me. It's done something to my head. That's why I'm losing time, why I feel like I'm losing myself. Whatever happens to me and the other interviewees at the back of Starbrook's Coffee, it's rooted itself into the back of my head. I'm counting, all the time. I wake up, counting. I fall asleep, counting. And I don't know why. I don't know why, because most of my day has been torn from me, and I'm left with fragments I'm trying to piece together, like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sorry if that makes no sense. I can barely decipher my own memories, and what I have managed to salvage is coming out more like incoherent babbling. I'm trying to write as calmly as I can, but I don't have much time. I don't know how much time I have, because I should be doing something right now. I should be somewhere else, not here. The voices in my head, the ones that hurt me, the ones that tell me to count back from ten, they're pulling on my thoughts. They're in my head. They're in my head. I've lived out seven days since I initially posted here. 
and I can barely remember any of them. I can remember small things like eating breakfast with my roommates and grabbing milk from the store. I can remember phone calls with my mother, but the rest of it, gone. I don't remember going to class. I don't remember going to work, but I must be because there's always an empty Starbucks cup on my bedside. Like a reminder. My name scrawled on the front in black marker pen. It's my handwriting. Always a triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato. I don't remember writing it. I don't remember a lot of things, and it's starting to drive me crazy. My life is being sucked down a hole, and I can't get it back. Whatever I'm doing, though, I know it has something to do with Starbucks. It has something to do with Anna and the video she had forced me to watch. Yesterday, I awoke, counting to that same noise, the one that ripped into my brain when the grinning woman on the video had been crawling inside my head, seeping into my thought process and slowly taking control. I was on the floor, curled into myself, my body aching like I'd willingly thrown myself through a meat grinder. It took me several seconds to fully come to. I was on my back in the same clothes from the day before. They felt filthy, sticky to my palmy flesh. I stared at the ceiling for a moment, trying to get control of my own mind at my own lips. But I was still mouthing numbers. Ten. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to think of something else. Anything else. But the countdown was cemented in my brain. Nine. When I tried to force my lips into my control, the opening of a song I liked, a, a poem I'd written in my sophomore year of high school, the numbers took over. Eight. I shook my head. Seven. I waited for six, but six never came. Instead, my lips kept going in flux, mouthing the same number. Seven. 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 When I sat up, dazedly blinking through morning sunlight, I glimpsed something on my bed. A tiny camera. Next to it was a USB cable and my laptop sitting idle. The last thing I could fully recall was helping my roommate drag in a sofa she'd bought off of Craigslist. But even that was blurry. My bedroom was dark. The bedside lamp I normally kept on all night was off. My jacket was flung on the bed, next to the laptop, and, bizarrely, my phone was on the other side of the room. Leaving my phone to charge, I set up the camera. It was brand new, but I had no memory of buying it. When the device pinged on my laptop, I double-clicked, and whatever footage I'd managed to record popped up, what looked like the reflection of an eye shrouded in darkness. I was about to press play when my bedroom door flung open, my roommate, Cass, poking her head through. She looked half asleep, blinking through dark hair hanging in her eyes. Aren't you supposed to be at work? Cass's voice was a soft croak through a yawn. Her gaze fell on the laptop and the camera in my lap. What are you doing? I shut the laptop. Work? My gaze went to the empty Starbucks cup sitting on my bedside table. A job, I thought. I had a job. I had a job I couldn't remember going to. The last time I remembered stepping foot in the coffee shop was the night of my induction. After that, I slept for three days. Though I was starting to wonder if I'd really been sleeping. I was living a whole other life without even knowing. Maybe I was crazy, I thought dizzily. My aunt had a brain tumor. What if that was what it was? I could vaguely remember being sixteen and googling the symptoms, pulling up a WebMD page. Memory loss, confusion, headaches. I wasn't sure about hallucinations, but could that really be it? I thought. Had everything I'd seen been some mismatched delusion? Yeah, work, Cass said, snapping me out of it. Considering how obsessed you are with this new job, I figured you'd have gone by now. I'm not obsessed. She scoffed. Uh-huh. I personally believe you've been brainwashed. It's the only logical explanation. That was ironic. Cass cleared her throat when I didn't answer. Hey, Earth to Mackie. Are you okay? Yeah, I lied. What time is it? She shrugged. Half past eight. You were supposed to be at work like half an hour ago. 
Cass cocked her brow. Funny, you don't seem to care this morning. Which is weird, since you practically live there with all your new friends. I ran my fingers through my hair. It felt like straw. Live there? Yeah. Rolling her eyes, my roommate scowled. You're barely at home, Mackie. Didn't you get back late? Aren't you tired? I had to think about that. Was I tired? I felt terrible, sure. My head was pounding and my body ached, but I wasn't tired. Before I could answer her, Cass shot me a smile. Just promise me, okay? Don't dump college for a barista job. It might seem fun right now, but you need to think long term. It's something to think about. Cass? She cut me off, disappearing back down the hall. You're gonna get fired if you don't move. Shuffling off my bed, I stretched. My mouth was dry, like I hadn't drank in hours. Can you make me coffee? I'm half naked, came her squeaky reply. It's not like I wanted to go to work, but I did want to know what was going on. I wanted to know why hours of my life were being sucked away, and I was left with splintering pieces, pieces that didn't matter. The nightmares bled back into the forefront of my mind, starching white walls and a ceiling, intense golden light blinding me, gloved fingers curling around a scalpel which was inching closer and closer to me. They didn't feel like the night terrors I had as a kid, the ones I could brush away. These ones felt real, like they had happened. My Starbrook's induction was still playing in my head, the test with mind-bending questions that messed with my psyche and the coffee I was sure Anna had drugged to lower my inhibitions. Whatever she subjected me to was causing my blackouts, but what exactly had the video done to me? The question enveloped my thoughts while I showered quickly, changed into fresh clothes, and grabbed my bag. I was stepping out of my apartment, a dry piece of toast hanging out of my mouth, my hands in my hair trying to tie a decent pony, when a figure loomed into view. The guy was leaning against a door frame, no longer in a bright yellow hoodie. He wore a fitted jacket over a shirt and jeans, a pair of Ray-Bans slicked dark brown hair back. Finally, he said in a breath. His expression was bright, but I noticed dark shadows under his eyes. His cheeks had a paled look to them, like they were drained of color. We started to work like an hour ago. I was speechless for a moment. It was one of the other interviewees. You're... I dug for a name, but my mind was blank. The guy's lips curved slightly. Sam, he said. You've forgotten my name already, huh? Ouch. No. I started to walk, quickening my pace. Sorry, brain blank. He shrugged, sticking to my side. Happens to the best of us. I knew him. That's what my mind was telling me, at least. I'd been working with him for a week. When I racked my brain, however, there was nothing. Even one part of me knew of laughing with him about TV shows none of us watched, kicking through fall leaves on the way to work, and awkwardly asking him to fix the coffee machine for me. So many memories, and none of them felt right. How do you know where I live? The words were spewing out my mouth before I could stop them. I took quick steps down the apartment block stairs, eager to lose him. I expected my sour tone to scare him off, but Sam was right behind me. Uh, we walk to work together? He said, when I pushed open the swinging doors leading outside. The street was alive with the morning rush hour, and I was grateful for it. Sam followed me, and I pushed through a group of school kids. He was practically breathing down my neck. Also, you're late. Our boss is having an aneurysm. You mean Anna? I said, breathlessly, and he responded with a scoff. The cool breeze was a relief on my cheeks, blowing my hair from my eyes. When I crossed the road, I glimpsed something in the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a dog, but it was too small. When I got closer, fastening my pace, I realized I was seeing a rabbit. A small, white rabbit in the middle of the sidewalk. I blinked rapidly, but it was still there. 
It was the rabbit I'd seen after I'd taken the test at the job induction. Sam was talking, I realized, but his voice had collapsed into white noise. He was talking about work, something about a ring getting stuck in the trash disposal and an argument with Rich. I couldn't concentrate on his words. All I could see was the rabbit. It looked so out of place. A piece of my own personal nightmare sitting on a mundane street of grey on a weekday morning. I had to know if I was losing my mind. When I edged forward, the rabbit turned and started to bounce across cracks in the walk, hopping between people's legs. It wasn't real, I told myself. Except, it was. It was real. I was staring at it, and it wasn't weaving or blurring out of view. Before I could hesitate, I was catapulting into a run. I was aware of Sam yelling my name, but my attention was on the rabbit. I couldn't stop myself, like my body had a mind of its own. I was counting again, my lips mouthing each number. The pain in my head was back, cruel, slicing into the back of my skull. It felt like something was there, protruding into my brain. Ten. I threw myself into a sprint. Nine. The rabbit didn't move for a second, seemingly waiting for me to get close enough for my fingers to graze the back of its fur. Eight. Tearing down the walk, bumping shoulders with people whose responses were like gibberish. I could hear them, but I also couldn't. They were like Sam, incoherent. Seven. Seven. My lips burned with the number like it was poison on my tongue. Seven. I remember thinking, why couldn't I get past seven? Watch out, a voice was yelling, but I couldn't concentrate on it. I couldn't concentrate on anything but the number seven and the rabbit in my reach. I was so close. A dull fog settled over my vision. My head started to spin like I was going round and round on a carousel. I was back in the white room with the TV in front of me. The presenter was on screen, her smile stretched across her face. Very good. Her screech was rooted inside my head. Now, how do we make a mocha again? I could hear myself reply, my voice an emotionless drawl sympathizing with the others. The memory took me off guard and I almost went flying, though seeing more would have been torn from me only gave me more incentive to catch the rabbit. They had messed with my head, I thought. They drugged me and then messed with my head, making me see rabbits, making me question my sanity. I pumped my arms faster and had my hands stretched out to scoop it up when something flew past me, tearing the breath from my lungs. The air seems to turn boiling hot, fumes hitting me in the face, warm fingers wrapping themselves around my wrist in a tight hold and yanking me back. Reality contorted back into focus. I was standing in front of a main road, cars flying past me. Commuters were frowning at me like I was crazy. I just chased after an imaginary rabbit in broad daylight. I was crazy. Sam was bent over, gasping for breath, his hands on his knees. Okay, whatever you're smoking, hand it over. I shook my head, my cheeks burning. Did you see that? Was all I could choke out. See what? He straightened up. You mean your attempts to isekai yourself? Yeah, I did. There was... I trailed off, looking for the rabbit, but I was just looking at the empty air. What? Sam spluttered. What did you see? Instead of answering him, I stayed silent. Maybe what was best. I wouldn't say it was a comfortable silence, because Sam kept whistling in odd intervals before stopping abruptly. It was jarring, the way he whistled, like each melody meant something. A youngish woman walked by, pushing a stroller, but when I looked closer, it was empty. There was a blanket and toys, but no baby. Swallowing something warm, climbing back up my throat, I focused on Sam. He looked to be deep in thought, his gaze flickering to each passerby in quick succession. I noticed he looked nothing like the guy I'd met on the night of our induction. He had hid under a yellow hoodie and didn't want to be seen. This guy seemed to full-body scan every person that passed him with a simple glance. Sam? 
Saying his name felt a mixture of wrong and right, like I knew him, but at the same time I didn't. I wanted to know, then. I wanted to know if Sam was seeing the same things as me, if he was going crazy, too. His gaze snapped to me. Yeah. Are you blacking out? That's a weird question to ask after jumping in front of a truck. Are you? I pressed. Sam shrugged, kicking through a pile of fall leaves scattering the sidewalk. Not that I know of, he murmured, shoving his hands in his pockets. I pass out at work sometimes, but that's the night shift. It messes with my head. There isn't a night shift, I said. I knew that because I'd been on a late-night coffee run during finals. The place was closed. I'd even knocked on the door. So, if the store was closed, what the hell was I doing all night? Sam shot me a look and dug in his jacket for a pack of cigarettes and pulled one out, lighting it up. For new employees, they're extending the opening hours, Mackie. It's for our training. Anna told us like a thousand times. Nodding slowly, I followed his words. Right. So, we work all night. Yeah. He took a drag. Seriously, what's going on? I'm fine, I said dismissively. Do you remember the night of our interview? Sure. We watched that training video. And the test? I added. Sam looked confused for a moment before nodding. Oh yeah, that weird test? Yeah, freaky stuff. Right? I hissed. So, what I'm saying is, what if the test and the training video did something? Like, emotionally drain us? Sam chuckled through another drag. I lowered my voice. No, I mean actually doing something to us. Like, controlling us. Sam laughed. Not a quiet laugh. A proper laugh, throwing his head back, his Ray-Bans slipping over his eyes. He pushed them back up. Oh yeah, absolutely. Anna's a hothead. After several shifts, I'm convinced she wants us to be some kind of supersonic barista force. He sent me a grin. Who needs sleep, right? Not us. No, you don't understand what I'm saying. I gritted out. I'm losing time. I'm losing ten hours every night, and I don't know what I'm doing. I choked out a laugh which died in my throat. You keep telling me I'm working with you, and we're colleagues, but since the night of our induction, I have no memory of working. Sounds like you burn out, Sam shrugged, stepping over cracks in the sidewalk. Burnt out? Yeah, like I said, we've been doing long shifts. Hey, I can relate. I mean, we've been working the night shifts for a week now, and Anna's working us like dogs, so we're all bound to lose ourselves at some point, you know? He shrugged with a smile. Baristas, man. We're humanity's obedient slaves with a meager wage. His ignorance was driving me crazy. How could he be so dismissive? He remembered the test and the training video, so it didn't make sense that he'd seem unfazed by everything we'd been forcibly subjected to. And what about class? I demanded. Huh? Class, you're a student. Sam's expression changed drastically. His eyes prickled with confusion. It almost looked like he was awakening from a trance, like the fog over his eyes was clearing, even if it was just for a moment. Class, he muttered, his tone soft and whimsical. I haven't been in class in a while, actually. Which is weird. In fact, I was going to... I was going to do something. His expression twisted, like he was trying to remember, but was finding nothing. That's what I'm saying, I whispered. Sam, they did something to us. He shook his head, seemingly snapping back to normal. Nah, we're just tired, Sam nodded, as if reassuring himself. Yeah, we're tired. We're tired. That's why I forgot about, uh, about class. We're tired. 
His voice reminded me of my own during the training video. I shoved him hard. So you remember what we did last night? I gritted out. You remember the whole night? He hummed. Yeah, it was pretty dead, so Anna taught us how to make frappes. You should know. You spilled one all over yourself and snapped at a customer. His gaze snapped to me. You do remember that, right? I didn't answer him. I couldn't answer him, because I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. When the two of us finally walked through swinging doors into Starbrooks, I found myself overwhelmed by the warm glow in the store. Sam was back to his usual chipper self. It was fairly busy, a queue of around seven or eight people. Sam ushered me behind the counter, and I had no idea what to do, where to go. The other two interviewees were working. The girl with the pretty blonde hair had her back to me, blending fruits on the counter, while the red-headed boy was taking orders at the front. Neither of them spoke to me. Sam flung his jacket in Anna's office and put his apron on before throwing me mine. I felt a sick sense of deja vu being back in her office. The four chairs were still there, though her desk was a lot tidier. All the paperwork from last time was gone, her laptop sitting idle. I found myself staring at it before Sam grabbed my arm gently. Okay, so you can start with orders or Ben will kill you. His laugh was light. You know how much he hates talking to customers in the morning, so he's pretty pissed. Also, I need you to put out prices for the raisin cakes. We don't have any left. Pissed is an understatement, the girl said, her tone sing-song as she reached on her tiptoes to grab a fresh batch of fruit. She moved in sync with the song on the radio, sidestepping to the beat. I found it hard to believe she was so lively and it wasn't even 10 a.m. When I slided past her, she shot me a grin, though it quickly fizzled out. What's up with you? Luna. I remembered her name. This time, her blonde hair was in a neat pony, sticking through her Starbrook's cap. When Sam hurried past carrying a tray of donuts, she nudged him with her elbow. What's up with her? He shrugged. Tired, I guess. He caught my eye. Orders, Mackie. Don't just stand around. So, Sam was a control freak, I quickly came to realize. I nodded dizzily, trying to tie my apron with trembling hands. Sam wandered off who knows where, and I ended up taking orders. It wasn't as hard as I thought. As soon as I had the notebook and pen in my hand and was actively asking people what they wanted, my hands worked on autopilot, like I already knew what to do. A girl around a few years younger than me was next, but she ignored me, her gaze flickering to Ben, who was struggling with the coffee machine. Could I get a raspberry smoothie? The girl slid over five dollars. I'd only known Ben for maybe half an hour, and I could tell he wasn't a morning guy. Luckily... Sam took over the coffee machine problem. Yeah. Ben nodded at the girl and took the cash. See this, Sam mocked the narrator while he tinkered with the machine, is a Ben in his natural habitat. If you look closely, you'll see he's intentionally ignoring the female's advances. In fact, a Ben has been shown to ignore advances from the male and female. He's baffling scientists everywhere. See, look, here's a demonstration. The way the girl was leaning into the counter trying to expose as much cleavage as possible made it inherently obvious what she really wanted. When Ben dumped a smoothie in front of her with way too much force, her lips quivered into a smile. Could I get a straw? She was talking directly to him while Sam and I were right there. Sam nudged me. See? Nothing. Nodding, Ben grabbed a straw and pierced the top. The girl hummed. Could I maybe get a number, too? Ben leaned on his fist. Fifty-six, he grumbled, his gaze snapping to a young kid in the queue. Next. The girl's mouth opened slightly, like she was going to say something, before she turned and stalked out. Wow. Sam straightened up. That was brutal. Luna laughed, her back to the three of us while she prepped fruit. It's like he's oblivious. Thanks, 
Ben rolled his eyes and turned to me with his arms folded. Look who finally decided to show up. He wasn't smiling, but there was a gleam of playfulness in his eyes. I knew it. At least, that's what my brain told me. Ben. Sam worked like a robot, his hands doing seven things at once, somehow. Be nice. I am nice. The redhead rolled his eyes. It's the British accent, Luna chirped. The dead Pantone doesn't help. You're a dead Pantone. Ben ducked his head while the other started laughing, but I could definitely see the ghost of a smirk on his lips. My morning shift went surprisingly well. I knew where everything was, and I could make drinks without even thinking. The wrongness of it all kept coming over. How unnatural it was to suddenly be talented at something I had no memory of doing, but I fell into a daze, enveloping in symphony with the others. It's weird. It's like my brain refused to stop, refused to take a break. When I wasn't doing something, I was looking for something else to do. I made drinks I couldn't even pronounce, and talked with the other three like we'd been friends our whole lives. It was wrong. A tiny voice in my head kept murmuring. Except I was always working with noise, whether that was the screeching of beans being blended, or the radio blasting idle hits. I was serving a customer around early evening when I glimpsed that all-too-familiar ball of white behind the window. A woman ordered two espressos, and I made them with shaky hands. Turning back to serve her, I could see the rabbit at the corner of my eye. I looked away to put cash the customer had given me in the register, but when I risked a glance back, it was in the store, just behind two teenage girls. Again, it was out of place. So wrong. The world was going on around me in a blur, and yet all I could see, all I could concentrate on, was the rabbit. It was getting closer every time I looked away or blinked. Leaning forward, I squinted to see if once again I was seeing things. I couldn't be, but nobody else was seeing it. Nobody else was pointing it out. Which meant I really was crazy. I thought. I was losing my mind. Mackie? Sam's hands were on my shoulder suddenly. When I twisted around to look at him, he was practically bouncing on the heels of his shoes impatiently. You okay? Customers are waiting. Two coffees. The man wasn't even looking at me. His gaze stuck to his phone. When he did look up, his lips were moving, but I couldn't tell what he was saying. Instead, I was looking for the rabbit. It was inches from the counter, staring up at me with beady eyes. I squeezed my eyes shut and willed it away, but it was still there. The others were working behind me. I was aware of Sam taking over my order and Ben lecturing Luna about something. Except all the sound had been sucked away, leaving my own breaths. I felt my arms fall to my sides. I couldn't breathe. The time, I thought, suddenly. What was the time? I don't know why the words were in my head, scattered like alphabet soup, but they pushed their way to the forefront of my mind like they had always been there. I looked for the time. I was used to looking at the clock above the door. When I glanced at it, however, the numbers looked backwards. Warped. Wrong. I stumbled back with a sharp cry and reached for my phone in my pocket. When I looked at the time on my home screen, it was the exact same. Wrong. The numbers were distorted and blurry like I was underwater. I dropped my phone. I knew I'd dropped it because I felt it slip from my fingers. The world seemed to fall away before my eyes. The ground was torn from beneath me, and I was falling. I wasn't sure where. I could still hear the soft thump of the radio blasting and voices. Except, I was somewhere else. I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. A place far away from my reality. Far away from what I believed in. Wide walls. A silver ceiling. I was moving. Fast. The walls were flying by in a dizzying deluge I couldn't comprehend, and my stomach was diving into my throat. I couldn't move. Something was restricting my arms and legs. There were voices around me, drowning in white noise. When I opened my mouth to cry out, cold hands shoved my head back down. Figures. I glimpsed figures dancing around, silhouettes bleeding into the shadow. I was pushed through doors that looked familiar, and yet I'd never seen them before. Someone was looming over me, 
another faceless shadow prodding and poking me with sharp fingernails. The shadows spoke, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. Their lips moved, but only gibberish came out. No, 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 get off me, get off me. A panicked cry slipped into my ears. I knew it. When I lifted my head, strained from the Velcro straps pinning down my torso, a guy was dragged past me. I knew from the flash of red curls caught in the dizzying light who it was. It didn't look like him. Not the guy I had just been working with. There was something wrapped around his head and spotted different shades of red. A bandage. Ben was being carried out by two people in white. He was struggling, dragging his kicking feet. His arms were tied behind his back. I couldn't see his face. When I tried to see it, I only saw distortion. I only saw what my brain wanted me to see. I saw his feet, filthy and bloodied, scathing pristine white tiles as he was dragged further and further away. When Ben disappeared through a door at the end of the long winding corridor, I was pushed through another set of doors. The whole place seemed to be just that. Doors. Doors that led into terrifying places illuminated in sickly light. Where's Ben? I said with no sound. I had no voice. The words were tangled on my tongue. I kept asking it, or trying to, but I was ignored. This time, I saw a face. A real face I could identify. It was a man my dad's age. His eyes were cold and calculating, lips twisting into a scowl. He leaned close and prodded the back of my head. Something was there. I could feel it protruding into me. A sickening crunch sent my stomach into my throat, and my response was to cry. But I couldn't cry. My eyes were dry, my chest was heaving, but where there should have been an emotional response, there wasn't. Pain. There was so much pain, and I couldn't stop it. My body reacted to his touch, spasming, but I couldn't control it. I couldn't control my contorting limbs that were no longer mine. I screamed. I didn't hear my scream, but I felt it burning in my lungs. Something was there. Something was in my head. It felt like a parasite, like a leech crawling into my brain. The man held no sympathy in his eyes, no mercy, nothing. When he raised his hands to signal the others around him, his fingers were slick scarlet. Count back from ten, he ordered. I did. I did when his fingers were in the back of my head once again, twisting. Ten. Ten. The number slipped from my lips in a soft sob. Nine. Nine. Eight. Eight. Seven. 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 On the fourth seven, garbled on my tongue, he plunged his fingers in once again. It's not working, he grunted turning to somebody out of my view. Protocol 2193 was administered successfully. The subject seems to be having trouble following instructions. I'll need to do further testing, which include going deeper than I expected. With him distracted, I could only stare at the ceiling and wish death upon myself. I want to die, I thought dizzily. I want to die. When something sharp stabbed into my head, I felt something warm and wet slide down the back of my neck. I felt it dampening the sheets I was lying on. I started counting. I was counting when a tube was forced into my mouth and something dripped down the back of my throat. At first, it was slow. But then, it was gushing through my lips, choking me, burning me inside out. The same man was there again. Count back from ten for me. His voice was far more gritted and impatient. I tried again. My lips were burning. My chest was burning. My body was burning. I don't remember the countdown. What happens next came in rapid flashes like I was watching an old movie. Time seemed to jump forwards. This time I was standing in that same classroom in front of a desk. Something warm covered my ears. Sam, Luna, and Ben were next to me. They weren't moving. I saw their feet. I saw toes caked with dirt. I saw Luna's hair hanging in tangled rat tails in front of my face. This time, a group of people stood before us. 
Hold out your arm. We were ordered. When Sam stepped forward and pulled up his sleeve, I glimpsed a number etched into his skin. I couldn't make it out, no matter how hard I tried. My body was working against me on autopilot. I was ordered to take a step forward, and I did. Something cold pierced my skin, and I stopped thinking for a while. My mind swamped in cotton candy. I half came to sit at a desk once again. The room was dark. The TV set was on, static blurring my vision. Anna was standing over me with a pinched expression. I felt her hands tiptoe across my scalp before retracting. She straightened up with a sigh. Are they ready? The same male grunt sliced into the silence. Anna nodded. Not fully. However, if you really want a demonstration, go ahead. Indeed. The man cleared his throat. The TV flickered to the bright blue screen. Identify yourselves. The words were coming out of my mouth, and I had no control over them. But I wasn't alone. Sam, Luna, and Ben joined in, our voices once again in the symphony. Stand by. Project White Rabbit. Test 3. Phase 2. Very good. Now... Count back from ten. We did. Slowly. Another training video started, this time presented by a man. But it was mute. As the numbers fell effortlessly from my lips, I was tracking red squares once again, my eyes catching each one that hit corner to corner. When we were on the number four, the bulb above exploded, showering the room with glass. I didn't move. I couldn't move. Three. The desk I was sitting on started to rattle, and then the walls were shuddering. An earthquake was my initial thought. But when we reached two, and then one, I realized we were the ones doing it. Turn it off, the man ordered. The TV was switched off, and the room came to a standstill. Murmurs filled the air, speech I couldn't understand. Agent Terran, you said Mirror was a success. I did, Anna said. But there seems to be something interfering with the signal. Let me fix it. The man nodded. The initial stages went better than we expected. White Rabbit is on track to becoming one of our greatest breakthroughs yet. It's still a massive risk, Anna murmured. If we fail, the consequences will be catastrophic. What we're doing will benefit America's children. The man cut her off. Now, allow me. The TV was switched back on. With all due respect, Agent Terran, we will get better results if we use GM-46. While he spoke, my eyes found the TV screen once again while it flickered onto what looked like an old slide presentation, before landing on one that looked strained red, like it had been burned, or attempted to be burned. Underlined at the top, I could just about make out... Protocol GM-46 Only to be subjected in extreme cases. Protocol GM-46 should only be used if vocal, psychological, and physical torture has no effect. Please only use as a last resort. Anna shook her head. I saw a motion prick onto her face. Agent Carter, there's no need for that. Yes, there is. If no progress is made, we will be going through with GM-46. Anna's gaze snaps to the bright red screen. But it's... Stand up. Agent Carter ignored Anna and turns to us. And like clockwork, we did. The door opened and four children walked in. Two boys and two girls, maybe seven or eight years old. Each of them carried a white rabbit. Anna's voice shook silently. All moral inhibitions have been removed. The subjects will do whatever we ask of them, when we ask it, which is the first stage of mirror. Allow me to demonstrate. She opened her mouth to speak, but Carter stepped in front of her. He gently took the hand of a little girl and strode over to Sam. Subject 626, he ordered. Kill the rabbit. 
Sam bent and gathered the rabbit in his arms. At first I thought he was hugging it to his chest, but I saw his fingers twine around its neck and jerk suddenly. There was a sickening, snapping noise, and the rabbit dropped to the ground. The little girl who had been holding it lifted her head and stared at Sam with wide eyes. Agent Carter clapped his hands. Well done, he said. Now, kill the child. There was a pause. Sam didn't move. Six to six. I'm waiting. No, Sam said through gritted teeth. His voice was strained. I'm sorry. No, I, I can't. I gave you an order. No, I won't. I won't. Sam's confusion was evident in his cries, and I wanted to press my hands over my ears, but I couldn't move. The world wavered, my vision blurring. I was walking. I could see concrete beneath my feet, cracks in stone and leaves I was kicking through. There was something in my hand. Coffee. Four pairs of footsteps, fall leaves dancing in the air. Our footsteps were in sync, our breaths joined together in the air. The sky was dark blue. Twilight. Luna's laugh startled me. I caught the sight of her swinging ponytail. And then the customer was like, are you kidding me? You don't do it shakes? And I was like, no, you're two years late, maybe even three. And let me guess, she punched you in the face. Ben's voice was a low murmur. No, but she stormed out. Sam's laugh sent ice shooting down my spine. You're lucky it was late and Anna wasn't watching you. She spat at me. I stopped walking, my body going rigid. I don't know the time, the day. For a disorienting moment, I didn't even know where I was. I recognized the strip of stores by Starbucks. We were on break, I thought, the words streaming into my head. Anna let us go on break after we'd worked all night and day. We were getting lunch. It was like my body was working without me. Two worlds. Both of them felt fake. Both of them felt like I was dreaming. I clutched the coffee cup so hard, half of it spilled out. I've got to go. My voice broke around the words. The three of them turned to look at me, matching expressions, and my stomach twisted. I had to remove myself from the link. Whatever they were, it wasn't me. What? Luna frowned. But I was going to treat you guys. Looking at Luna, at the stranger my brain was telling me was a friend, the breath caught in my throat. I had to tell them. Before I could stop myself, I was grabbing Sam's jacket sleeve and pulling it up. But there was no number. Sam jerked his arm away with a snort. And once again, I'm questioning if you actually have a concussion, Mackie. Concussion? Luna grabbed my hand, her fingers entangling with mine. What happened? I... Uh, I'm fine, I said in a sharp breath. I've got to go home. I was moving away from them before I gave up and told them everything. Wait, Sam shouted. Hey, look out for the road this time. I was already stumbling back. There were no rabbits, no blurring vision. It was my reality, the one I knew. And yet, it still felt wrong. Like the white classroom was where I belonged. The crowd felt claustrophobic when I threw myself into a sprint. Footsteps following me back to my apartment. I knew it was them, but they were slow. I could sense them behind me. I locked my door and opened my laptop, but the camera was fried. I was looking at a black screen. Whatever footage I managed to capture without getting caught, everything I remembered in splintering fragments, everything I remembered in splintering fragments, it was gone. I didn't do it myself, I thought. Or did I? Did I destroy the camera without knowing? I don't know how many hours passed. I was still staring at the laptop screen when my phone rang. Three singular beeps. Mom flashed up, and I grabbed it and slammed the phone to my ear. Mom? I sobbed. Mom, something... 
Count backwards from ten for me. A male voice. I felt my grip on the phone loosen, and I was speaking before I could stop myself. Ten. My phone slipped from my steely grip. Nine. Eight. Seven. The word was stuck in my throat. I felt myself moving, cold air whipping my hair from my face. It was raining, and I was wearing a tank top. It was pitch black. 11 p.m. My feet were bare on wet tarmac, and a voice, soft and soothing, seeping into my skull and taking an unyielding hold. All I remember is the intense green of the Starbrook's logo getting closer and closer, blurring in my eyes. Anna in the doorway, waving me inside. That was fifteen hours ago. My head hurts. My body is aching and on edge. It's like a sensory overload. I jump at every little noise, and my first logical response to the noise is... Attack. My mouth tastes of blood. My hands feel filthy, but they're clean. Too clean. They smell of bleach. I remember nothing. Ten whole hours have gone by. My head is a cavern. My memories cruelly picked apart. There's a whole white rabbit in the corner of my eye. It won't go away. This time, its fur is matted with red. Beady eyes, colorless. When I stare hard enough, I see small arms still cradling it to a powder pink t-shirt. I see blonde ringlets hanging in wide eyes. Not Sam is outside. The noises he's making are scaring me. He keeps telling me to open the door. He's whispering into the hole in my head. I think I've done a bad thing. Have I done a bad thing? Please, tell me I haven't done a bad thing. I used to have this reoccurring nightmare as a kid. There would be a woman walking down my driveway. Sometimes she distorted herself, appearing as a sweet grandmotherly type. She would slowly come to my door and knock, but my whole family would be asleep, so she would let herself in. As she passed into my home and slowly up the stairs to my room, I would hear her opening each door in the hallway. I never knew what she was doing, but it always felt sinister. Once she finally got to the end of the hallway to my room, I would watch as the door quietly crept open before trying to hide under my blanket. I'd listen to her bare footsteps arriving up to my bedroom, and if I wasn't shocked into not moving, I might peek my head out to see the woman. But she was never there, standing above me. I'd usually be relieved for a moment, turning to go back to sleep, knowing it was just a bad dream. And when I'd turn... She would be there, sickly green with nappy hair and cataract eyes. She would be smiling, showing me her black gums and broken and missing teeth. The shock would usually wake me up and send me into a crying fit. It was also an ongoing problem. My mom would tend to try to coax me down for some time, but eventually she would end up shouting down the hallway that it's just a nightmare, it's not real. Knowing that there was little she could do to stop me from dreaming up things to scare myself. I was young then, but not enough to go waddling to her room to sleep next to her. I still remember when she told me I was getting too old for it, and I protested, asking if I could at the very least sleep on the floor. She didn't agree, but I still would from time to time until she had to put an end to that too. You're getting too old for this. You know better than to let a bad dream scare you. We started a process of our own DIY therapy, little habits to help me during the night. And they worked for a while. I'd think happy thoughts and keep a radio on so that I wouldn't feel so alone in the room. We even got a lava lamp in place of a nightlight. Things were getting better, and then they got much worse. The woman from my dreams showed up as she usually did, only this time 
I heard the screams coming from my mother's room. And then, as she moved to my sibling's room, I'd hear them cry out in terror before being forced silent. It was different. She was never more than a presence. Never violent. Never. My door crept open as it always did. Only, I didn't hide. I stood up and shouted at her to get away. And when I didn't see her emerge, I felt for a second victorious. Then I heard a crashing as my lava lamp was knocked off my nightstand. The glass shattered, sending the waxy liquid spilling onto my carpet. I turned around to see the cold, decayed smile of the wretched woman. Chills ran down my spine. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. Fear paralyzed me. And in her dead eyes, I could make out something I'd never noticed before. Anger. I didn't wake up like I normally did. It was my first time experiencing sleep paralysis. I laid there, facing my nightstand for what felt like an eternity. It was confusing at first, until I realized I couldn't turn my head, that I couldn't blink or speak. There was an enormous sense of dread and panic coursing through me. I was stuck with the woman, and now she was forcing me to stay with her, even as I was trying to wake up. I felt tears forming in my eyes. I finally was able to wake up. I'm not sure what did it, but I immediately got up to run to my mom's room. But the second I swung my feet off my bed, I felt the piercing pain of a shard of glass in my foot. I looked down with wide eyes to see my lava lamp had fallen over in the night. What's happening to me? I asked my mom as she tended to my foot. This might sting. She interrupted, pouring hydrogen peroxide on the flesh wound. I winced, but prided myself on not crying. My mother sighed heavily as she mauled over how to explain it to me. Sweetheart, you have sleep terrors. I used to get them when I was your age, too. They're like nightmares, only worse. I'm sorry I didn't take you seriously before. I'll schedule an appointment and see if we can't get you some help, okay? But what about my lava lamp? I asked her, trying my best not to remember the face of the wicked woman from the night before. You must have knocked it over when you were shaking. It's okay. We'll get you another. She paused for a second. We'll just keep it out of arm's reach this time. She smiled at me, and that was reassuring enough for me. At first, the doctors didn't think it would be a good idea to give me a medication at such a young age. My mom tried her best to help me get better sleep by changing my diet, uh, putting up Christmas lights in my room for me. She even bought me those whale and rain sound CDs. It worked, but not for very long. The nightmares were changing. I didn't see the woman as often, but now it was someone else. He would only show up when I was awake. A man made up of shadows, wearing only a half-face mask that reminded me of the Phantom of the Opera. He would jump on my chest. I was a teenager by the time I had gotten used to my inability to sleep peacefully. I had taken up smoking weed and avoiding falling asleep like I was a character in Nightmare on Elm Street. Anything I could do to calm my nerves and maybe not have to wake up drenched in sweat and screaming. It became so routine that it was just another part of life. And that, in a way, helped. Normal kids would get yelled at by their parents for staying awake until 3 a.m. playing video games, but not me. Not that it was ever something I ever really liked bragging about, even though my friends acted like it was. Then there was the night I got accepted into university. My mom was thrilled and threw me a party. It was a good night. I was happy about my future. I had finally done it. All my hard work paying off. I'd finally get to move on and grow up like my siblings had before me. Nothing could bring me down. Until, of course, I went into my bedroom. I was exhausted and thought I'd just lay down and maybe, since I felt so good, I would actually be able to have one of those dreamless nights where nothing happened. I was wrong. 
The knocking started. It sounded so foreign to me at the time, like listening to a song you haven't heard in years, familiar, but forgotten. The wet, slopping bare footsteps slithered down the hallways, echoing louder off the raised ceiling of our stairwell, methodically creaking the floorboards beneath them with deliberate pace. I felt the air escape my room, the vacuum of the dark corners thrumming, tearing away at my walls like claws rasping down a chalkboard. I was falling into a place far away, unknown and unseen. And as I fell, I took everything but the sound of rusted hinges creeping my bedroom door open. Congratulations. The voice echoed through the abysmal cathedral of all that was not. It bounced around me, the sound waves dancing along invisible walls, turning the words inside out. Kazoos went off, and balloons floated up from under my feet and in front of me. It was the only color to be seen in the black. They hung there in front of my face, mocking me. I stuck my finger out and pushed the balloon, only for it to pop. And out of the explosion, I watched a lava lamp fall to my feet and shatter. The glass shards spun out like they were on ice across the nothing. It shifted in an amoebic physicality, dripping onto itself and spreading incoherently. I couldn't look away. I can't look away. My hair stood up. There was something cold behind me. Something terrible. I tried to steady my breathing, tried to calm my nerves. I thought I'd escaped this. I thought... Her smile was a mile wide, each tooth splitting and cracked. The inky black muck hung and spilled from her gums, resembling spider webs. Her face was scabbing. Pieces of flesh missing and relaxed with maggot-infested gapes and bubbling wounds. I was disturbed to my core, my blood turning to a thick sludge of ice. But this time was different. This time, I was angry. Why are you doing this? Why me? I screamed through gritted teeth. My mouth didn't move, but my words bellowed out into the void. They carried deep into the distance, stretching out into forever. But no answer came. The woman turned and started walking away. I wanted to ask where she was going, but I was mainly just glad she was gone. I sat down and looked around at the blackness. I felt abandoned, the fullness of the empty. I laid back and let myself sink and sail, fall and land. When I finally woke up, My room was just as dark. It took my eyes some time to distinguish the ridges of the shadows on my dresser and window from that of the endless emptiness. As I scanned down the blankets of my bed, I saw the masked man crouched by my feet, watching me. The shadow man bent over into an animalistic pounce and began his steady crawl up my leg. I could feel the stark cold of his palms as he lifted their mask to my face. Staring at me with eyeless and translucent chill of it turned into pressure. You can't hurt me. You're not real. I thought I was just thinking it to myself, but the phantom was listening. And through the blackness of its absent presence, it may as well have laughed in my face. Every neuron in my brain began firing off, sending panic signals to my amygdala and back. I forced my eyes closed as my blood became tea on a kettle, steaming out a high-pitched scream. And when I opened them, I popped. My nose let out a splat and began to gush with sticky red blood. The masked shadow was no longer above me, but the pressure was still there. I got up quickly, covering my face with my hand as I made my way out my room and to the bathroom, only for me to hear the faint sound of gazoos from behind me as I swung my door open. I took no time switching the lights on and stuffing my nose with tissue paper. I held my head back and felt the blood sliding down my throat. The pressure persisted and my head was beginning to ache. I was so tired and shocked, I began to sway as I held my nose, just as impatient as I was afraid to go back to my room. 
the blood started collecting. It was thick with mucus, and the sluggish congelation began sticking to my neck. I went to cough, but it clung. I felt the gagging sensation of being choked by my own bodily fluid. My coughs turned to dry heaves before I finally puked up the red wastes. Looking down into the toilet, I watched as my blood swirled and floated in the water, thin red lines billowing like smoke away from thicker black clots. It reminded me of the lava lamp. When I finally looked up into the mirror, I half expected the phantom to be behind me, maybe hiding just out of sight or behind the shower curtain. And even though I didn't see him, it didn't make me feel any better, as if he was just waiting for me to let my guard down. Yet still, I thought with my nose stuffy and head spinning, as bad as my night terrors had been my whole life, they'd never been like this. My therapist would later say it was all in my head, as they usually did, just with different words. That the mind is a powerful muscle, and how we can trick ourselves into believing and even feeling things that aren't there. They ended up prescribing me benzodiazepines, saying that the stress of moving out and going to school may have been intensifying my condition. My doctor even suggested looking into a CAT scan or EKG, whatever the hell that was. It was two weeks before I was to move into my dorm, a state school only an hour's drive from home. My mom pushed it hard, saying that state schools are cheaper for residents, and that my scholarships would only work in state. One of my scholarships would only work in states, but regardless, I think I got what she was trying to say. That she didn't want me too far. Funny how I was dealt this hand. My brother was off studying in Colorado, having the time of his life, skiing and working part-time in a cultivation farm. My sister, on the other hand, abroad in Rome, and here I was, being prescribed downers, because moving an hour away was too much stress. Needless to say, if I did have anxiety, it was being replaced with depression, or at the very least, irritation. Is this going to take long? I asked my mom as she drove me to the hospital. No, I don't think so. We'll probably spend more time in the waiting room than anything else. Great. I couldn't help but be frustrated about the whole event. Instead of going to the beach with my friends, I was going to some lab to lay on the cold metal slab, while some guys in lab suits and masks pointed lasers at my brain and stuck me with wires. It sounded cool in theory, almost sci-fi-esque, but in reality, it was a boring and pointless inconvenience. I knew just as well as my mom and everyone else that they wouldn't find anything. And even if they did, it's not like they would really be able to offer us any help. But with my medicine working overtime, it was what my psychiatrist had to recommend before increasing my dosage. We pulled into the empty parking lot. It wasn't outright vacant, but for a hospital, even one as small as this lab wing, it seemed strange for there to only be one other car. Are you sure this is the right place? Yes. And we're on time? Yep. It's the right day, right? The 21st? Yes. My mom snapped, clearly as displeased by the whole affair as myself. She had taken off work for this, but in my defense, I hadn't eaten or drank anything but water for the past twelve hours. We both got out of the sedan and made our way up towards the big, puke-green doors leading in. They looked automatic, but weren't moving for us when we got close. Looks like they're closed, I was beginning to say, when they finally budged and slid for us. We were met with a long hallway, tilted and offset by white paint and fluorescent light. It tinged and had the distinct hospital smell, like cheap soap covering up a pheromone of sickness or old. We made our way to the reception desk, to a woman probably about thirty, wearing blue scrubs and a dangling face mask. She raised an eyebrow and continued to type on her computer as myself and my mother stood there. Ahem, my mom said, clearing her throat, but the woman didn't budge from her work. Have a seat. The technician will be ready to see you in a moment, she said without looking up. 
My mom was clearly taken aback by the inhumanity of it all. Don't you need to check us in? At my insurance? After. The woman snapped quickly, darting her eyes up before brandishing a fake smile. She then returns to typing, leaving the awkward pattering of fingers on keys hanging in the air between us. My mom and I walked over to the cheap plastic seats. They were low to the ground and rigid on my back. I felt like a helpless toddler looking up at the elevated receptionist in all her inconsideration. My mom shook her head and took her phone out as I looked up and down the hallways. The lab didn't seem right. It was too cold, too alien to be a place people would willingly work or go to. I'd always heard of people having a fear of hospitals, but I'd never had that. The lights were less unnatural there, the temperature a little warmer. There wasn't the buzz of electronics or the callousness of hallways lined in tile. Hell, they didn't even have a lobby. A door creaked open, a distinctly familiar sound that caught me by surprise. Before I could jump, I heard the soft voice of an elderly woman coming from emergence. We're ready to see you now. I stood up and started walking towards the nurse, looking back to see my mom lifting her head. She began to stand up when the nurse spoke up. We can't allow you inside the lab. It can affect the reading. Bewildered, my mother nodded and sat back down. After a dry swallow, I continued into the more lively part of the lab. There were low-light plants lining a sill in front of a mural of birds, butterflies, bees, and rabbits, frolicking in an open field. The nurse guided me down past the arts to two metallic doors painted with red polka dots the size of basketballs. It felt less cold and overly sanitized, more like the hospital I usually went to. If you'd step in here, please. The nurse motioned me into a side room. It was lined with monitors and strange instruments, filling cabinets and a man in glasses who turns to smile as I entered. Standing, he reached for my hand. Hello, I'm Dr. Webb. I'll be conducting your scan today. Are you excited? He asked in a way a tired teacher trying to express liveliness might. It was a courtesy to cut the tension, which I'd be lying if I said I didn't appreciate. If you wouldn't mind putting these on. He handed me a gown with balloons on it. The bathrooms are right there. I suggest you use it, as we won't be able to interrupt the scan for you to go. Do you have a different gown I could wear? Oh, uh, yes. Sarah. Webb motioned, and the nurse turned and opened a file cabinet, revealing a blue baby apron for me. Thanks. When I returned to the observation room, the nurse, Sarah, led me through the door and into the other room with the machine. I'd imagined something like a coffin that would close around me, but the machine resembled a giant donut that I'd be placing my head into. Now make sure you stay as still as possible, and movement can interfere with the scan. We may ask you some questions while you're there, and you'll be able to answer us then. She then had me lay down on the thin table, adjusting my hands to place them by my sides. She then instructed me to hold my breath for five seconds and release heavily. Then again for ten, and again for twenty. Once that was done, the scan was ready to begin. Also, she said as she was about to exit the testing room, try not to fall asleep. Once she exited the room, I heard a mechanical sound, and the table I was on began to move my head into the donut. There was a radio static sound, and I heard the typing of keys. Webb asked if I could hear him okay, and I affirmed. Then there was a buzzing, and they started the process. I was left staring at a metallic surface as the machine did its work. The doctor occasionally buzzed in to ask me if I was comfortable and feeling okay. Things were going along normally when I started to notice it. Black dots were forming in the corners of my eyes, and it felt like someone was watching me. Only not the doctors through their computers or window, but as if someone was in the room. 
Just then, there was the crackling of the calm as I expected the doctor to ask me how I was doing. Only the cracking of the incoming signal didn't stop. It wasn't interrupted by words or even the tapping of keys. It was just static at my eardrums. I knew they had told me not to talk, but I was worried now. Hello? Is everything okay? I asked, hearing the resonance of my voice bounce around the donut. But no answer came. Just the white noise of displaced radio waves. Hello? The blood-curdling scream didn't come through the radio, but from behind the glass of the viewing window, and even then they were loud enough for me to hear. In a panic, I began to reach up around the donut to push myself out of the machine. No sooner had I begun than I felt the grip of a hand on my ankle, long nails biting into my flesh like dog's teeth. I was yanked like a rag doll and flung out of the machine and across the room, hitting my head on the opposite wall before collapsing in a crumple. I tried to stand, but before I could, I felt the foot behind me, kicking me down and into place. I felt the heel dig into my back and crack up my spine, keeping me from turning my head or fighting back in any way. With my face pressed against the cold linoleum of the lab floor, I wanted to see who or what was doing this to me. I wanted to look out the window, see Dr. Webb and Nurse Sarah. I wanted to wake up. I felt the hand again grab me by the mane of my neck and lift me with supernatural ease. I had a chance now to turn to see the glass of the viewing room, but all I saw was splashes of shining red. I turned away quickly to see my feet elevated above the ground more than a foot. This... this isn't real. You're not real. I was dropped, released from the grasp of whatever was holding me, landing with a small thud to the floor, almost letting myself collapse. It would have been easier to go into a fetal position, but I knew better. I had to face this. I had to wake up. I slowly began to turn, but before I made the full rotation, the light's power stopped, and the light went out, leaving me and whatever was still here in the pitch black of a room the sunlight had never seen. It didn't stop turning, though. The dark wouldn't be enough to keep my horrors from making themselves clear to me. I knew that well enough. But by the time I finally faced where I was, where whatever had thrown me was, I felt the presence of nothing. The door to the observing room slowly crept open. I ran for it. I had to find my mom. I felt the squish of what could only be the body of Sarah or Webb under my foot as I made my way through the observing room. There was a scent of sulfur and iron in the air. It took me a moment to navigate to the door leading back to the hallway, but once there, I saw the plants. They were colorful and vibrant, as if emitting their own light. I didn't have time to consider how it could be, as I began striding down the hallway, but as I passed each plant that fell behind me, knocked to the floor with the crunch of smashed pottery, and as I ran, it felt like the hallway was getting longer. More plants materialized in front of me with every step. Finally, I turned and grabbed one of the plants before it ejected itself from the sill and threw the aloe down the hallway. Like dropping a penny down a well, I found depth, and I knew I wasn't far. I hadn't stopped running, and I wasn't going to. The whole time I was too concerned about getting back to my mom to even consider the fact that something might have been following me. My foot crunched the broken pottery as I raised my hands to feel the red polka-dotted door. I had to scan to find the handle, but once I did, I wish I hadn't. There was a burst of light, an arctic cold that blasted me off my feet. The hallway was gone. The lab was gone. In its place was a suburban street, overrun with glaciers and ice. It was my hometown, but it was foreign to me. I'd never dreamed something like this before. I stood up, slowly now. There wasn't danger. There couldn't be. When there is no reality, no true secure worlds to grasp onto, nothing can really harm you. 
I stepped out with my bloodied bare feet and hospital gown into the white. Mom? I shouted down the street. My voice carried like a horn echoing off the homes and abandoned vehicles impenetrably trapped in ice. No answer came as I began to walk down the street, aware yet unfazed by the cold temperatures. And then I saw her. She was standing at the edge of the driveway leading to what appeared to be my house, only it was twisted. The world shifted in geometrical patterns, climbing itself and bending upwards into the absence that should have been the sky. I watched as the chimney stampeded over itself in the form of a million beetles, and my mailbox aged from tin to rust to dust before my eyes. She turned and smiled at me, waving me to come closer. I followed her, down the driveway and into my house. The door opened like a deck of cards being shuffled, but before I could step inside, my mom placed her hand on my chest. She pointed to the grounds to reveal jagged, knife-like bones sticking out of the ground. We had to step carefully around them, slowly and methodically. She led me to the stairs, and we began our slow ascension. What's happening? I asked my mom as she continued to step in silence. The stairs beneath us twisting into a spiral, the walls falling away like paper in the wind. When we finally approached the bedroom hallway, the distortions started to fade away. The walls began to piece themselves together back into a form that made sense. The bones began to sink into the ground, and warmth began to return. It felt wrong. Not incorrect or unnerving. It felt wrong to be in such a mundane place again. My mom looked at me and smiled as she opened her bedroom door, inclining me without words to do the same to my own. Parting from her, I did. The walls were lined with all my old posters, my old toys and clothes that I hadn't worn in years, and there in my bedroom I saw a small boy, a younger version of myself staring at me, he was as curious about me as I was terrified of him. It's going to sting. I turned around to see my mom behind me, smiling. Only she had a tear in her eye. Why? Why does it always have to hurt? She looked at me, wiping away the tears, my younger self watching from our bed, unable to look away. Because it's not nothing. She took my hand and looked sadly at my younger self. And as I looked, the memory started to dawn on me. I hadn't gone to the hospital with my mom. I wasn't going to college. I went to college. I went with my granddaughter. As the bedroom began to slip away, replacing itself with the whiteness of the frosted, incomprehensible world that projected it before me, I could hear a faint kazoo singing out like a bird early in the morning. <laughs>